lots of unsure okays. Okay. Another misleading thing about the word prayer is the connotation that you may or may not get what you're asking for. This ties in with worthiness, like you'll only get what you pray for if you deserve it, like Big Daddy has to be pleased with you before rewarding you, as if there's a judging agent or agency to whom one's prayer is really a plea or a plea bargain. This is what's behind sacrifices and tithing and all the other things we do to try to get into Big Daddy's good graces. I see recognition in their faces. I would also say that prayer is an underperforming proposition, I continue, meaning that when prayers do seem to be answered, the answer probably won't measure up to what we prayed for. Contrast this to eyes open manifestation, which will, as a rule, exceed our highest hopes and expectations. That gets a muffled response of nods and grins, as if they're all familiar with the ask and ye shall receive routine where you really, really ask and only sorta, kinda, maybe, receive. Another thing about prayer is that it seems like a last resort, like conventional methods have failed. So we're turning in desperation to prayer. Like with a pimple on prom night, maybe we try diet changes and skin cleansers and makeup first, and when all else fails, we turn to prayer. Ask, jokes Jeff, and the good Lord shall provide. Very good, I say. And that raises another problem with the word prayer. It's inextricably tied in with all our religious baggage. All you want is a pimple to disappear before prom night. And now there's Jesus, the Son of God, who died a crappy death for your crappy sins, who you haven't spoken to in years. And now you're going to call him up to bitch about a zit? They laugh. Unlike prayer, manifestation is a first and only resort. Once we understand what it really is and how it really works, it naturally becomes our sole mode of operating in the world, not just in getting what we want, but in knowing how to want and what to want, in knowing what to do and why to do it. Instead of a desperate plea for something we want, manifestation becomes our way of moving through life, of interfacing with the universe. I pace in the sand and let the words come. Which brings us to the most important difference between prayer and manifestation. Prayer is specific. You want something, so you ask for it a zit to disappear, good news from the doctor, your child to have ten fingers and toes. But manifestation isn't specific. It's not just about getting what you want. It's about everything you do, and how you do it, and who you are, and how you move through the world. It's about shaping the dream state and moving within it, in this seamless confluence of self and not-self. It's the erasing of the line between dreamer and dream. You're not just manifesting a car or new shoes. You're manifesting yourself. And all the rest follows naturally and effortlessly from that. You can see why prayer is a pretty skimpy little concept next to that. Is manifestation anything like synchronicity? asks Karen. Sort of, I say, but synchronicity is another ambiguous term, like prayer, that we use to describe a phenomenon we dimly perceive and don't understand. I think Dr. Jung coined the term synchronicity. The commonly cited example is that Jung was discussing scarab beetles with a patient 
in a New York high-rise when a very unlikely beetle appeared outside his window. That's actually a pretty good example for our purposes because it shows how starkly brazen synchronicity has to be before we are able to detect it. We might think of synchronicity as this kind of outlandish coincidence. But if our eyes were open, we'd see that synchronicity is not a rare occurrence at all. It's the basic organizing principle of energy. If you need an Egyptian beetle to tap on your Manhattan window to teach you about synchronicity, then the real lesson isn't that you've seen something very unusual, but that you're too blind to see what's very normal. But how is it possible for everyone to be as blind as you're saying? asks Jeff, who is sitting with Karen. For that very reason, I reply, because it's everyone. And how would we actually go about opening our eyes? asks Jan, a fifty-ish female with close-cropped gray hair, who has made several remarks on this and previous evenings, which seemed more intended to convey her skepticism than to get answers. It is a metaphor, I take it. Maybe, I say. Or maybe that's the real seeing, and what we do with our physical eyes is the metaphor. We begin seeing clearly by first seeing that we are asleep, locked in the constricting coils of our own emotional energy. Once we truly understand that we are asleep within the dream state, then we can begin in earnest to awaken ourselves which is done by hacking away at these constricting coils. This is the transition that, in a healthy society, we would all undergo naturally and with relative ease in our early teens. In the world as we know it, though, very few ever make the transition, and of those who do, far fewer manage to continue developing beyond it to any significant degree. There's always a spiritual inertia at work, resisting motion or change. It's built in, way deep. That's why a word like further is so important. But you have? Jan asks. You've continued developing beyond the transition to adulthood? I have, yes. I would probably be the equivalent of a young adult. Well... Young adult with an asterisk, I believe, due to the enlightenment thing. So you'd be a young adult, Jan asks defensively. And the rest of us are what? Just children? Not really children, I say. More like unborn. Yet to emerge from the womb. Life begins when we are born of the Spirit. There's no possibility of development prior to this emergence. When I say I'd probably be like a young adult, I mean a young adult in a world where we developed in a healthy, normal manner, where life was a continuous journey of growth and expansion and understanding, where a 35-year-old was a significantly more developed being than a 33-year-old, not just more solidified. Such a world wouldn't even have words like luck or prayer or manifestation or synchronicity. Those words are appropriate in an eye-closed world where our best thinking is quasi-mystical guesswork based on flimsy evidence like bugs on windows, but not for an eyes-opened world where everything is visible and plain to behold. Jan has been making skeptical but non-productive comments throughout the evening. Nothing of any particular merit, just doubtful remarks made in dubious tones, as if she's too smart to be buying what I'm selling. Her brand of snootiness is a type of spiritual shielding that is not unusual in these forums. From her perspective, I'm the used car salesman trying to sell her a lemon. 
I'm the sleazy politician trying to swindle her out of her precious vote. I'm the greedy corporation dispensing sugar-coated cancer. I'm the proselytizing TV preacher trying to wrangle her into the fold. I'm the smooth-talking guy on the next bar stool trying to turn her heart against her head. We are surrounded by this buyer-seller dynamic in all areas of our lives, and spirituality is no different. To someone like Jan, I'm just one of many suitors vying for her spiritual heart and, she may well assume, her purse. She thinks she has something I want, and she's right, though she doesn't know what it is and wouldn't be reluctant to provide it if she did. I don't want her heart or mind or money. I don't want to save her or enlighten her. I don't want her to believe in the spiritually elevated character I'm portraying so I can believe in it too. All I want is thoughtful dialogue, insightful feedback, challenging conversation. But she can't give me that because she's too wrapped up in her defensive role of discerning spiritual consumer to come out and play. We take a 15-minute break, during which Brat and I go for a walk and talk about small things. When we return, everyone is already back in their seats and quiet. I look at Brat, and she scoots me out back in front. So how would manifestation deal with a pimple on prom night? asks Brad, getting a laugh. That's a good question, I say. But it's not an apples and oranges comparison, because at the heart of this conversation, we're not talking about two methods, prayer and manifestation. We're talking about two paradigms, segregated and integrated. Okay, says Brad. So how would you personally deal with a zit on prom night? His question gets a lot of crowd approval. I look over and see Brett grinning at me. I grin back. To start with, I reply, instead of making it wrong, I'd know without question that it was right and wonder why. So right away, there's a divergence away from segregated wrongness toward integrated rightness. I might spend a minute wondering if I'd committed an error of some sort, if I had lapsed into unconsciousness, resulting in this untimely blemish. But that's just habit, and I wouldn't find any such error. Then I'd spend another moment wondering if there was anything to be understood, clearly understood, not make-believe or guesswork, from this curious pimple. I doubt I'd see anything at this stage, but it's always good to check. I would remain alert, however, since the appearance of this pimple in these circumstances would strike me as so unlikely as to certainly have ulterior, though as yet unseen, workings. You wouldn't try to heal it or hide it? asks Brad. Oh, I probably would, sure. If I was in a situation where I wanted to look my best, I wouldn't be any happier to have a zit than anyone else would. I wouldn't pretend I was okay with it. I'm not in the habit of trying to act other than as I'm inclined. I play my role faithfully, whether or not I understand every detail. And in these circumstances, my character would wish to heal or hide the blemish. What did you mean by unseen workings? asks Karen. I'm not new to all this. I've been doing this for a long time, prior to my awakening, even, and it's a built-in function of my waking consciousness now, not something I have to stop and think about and perform. In this scenario, where I'm going to a special event, a prom, which entails dressing up, personal grooming, planning, and special arrangements, the appearance of a pimple would be about as subtle, as they say, as a fart and a bathosphere. I may not understand the purpose of it right away, 
But something this unlikely would not remain a mystery for long. An explanation would surely be forthcoming. Forthcoming like how? I can't stretch this scenario out that far. Within a few hours, certainly within a few days, what seemed like a minor nuisance would be revealed as a perfect piece in a larger, elegant whole. It would all make perfect sense. But sometimes a zit is just a zit, says Brad philosophically. Maybe in your world, I say, not in mine. That would be like if a walrus crawled in here right now and you asked me about it and I said sometimes a walrus is just a walrus. Well, says Brad, if a walrus crawled in here right now, I think there'd be some sort of rational explanation for it. That's exactly what I'm saying, I agree. We'd be sure there was some explanation, even though we had no idea what it might be yet, and even if we never found out for sure. Saying a walrus is just a walrus would be a totally unacceptable way of explaining such a bizarre event. Likewise, I wouldn't dismiss this zit we're talking about as just a bizarre event or assume it wasn't understandable, just because I had yet to understand it. That sort of insistence and distrust is wholly segregated and egoistic. Even if I never understood in fullness, I would never make the assumption that it had been, how do I even say it, a random event, chaotic, an element of disorder. There is no disorder. Nothing is random or chaotic, only fully perceived or not. This isn't what I believe, as you must assume. This is what I see. You wouldn't pray or manifest for the zit to disappear? No. That would be making it wrong, which wouldn't even occur to me. I may not like having a zit, and I may try to hide it or heal it, but I wouldn't think of it as wrong. They don't look like they believe me. In this prom scenario, I say, my wishes would already be in place. At some earlier point, I would have spent a few seconds expressing the desire that the evening went well, that everything happened for the best, whatever that might be, and I would have released that desire. I would have let it go and forgotten about it. There would be no panicky revising of my desires based on the appearance of a pimple. That sort of fearful distrust could not occur in me. Nothing of this is vague to me. It's all very specific and constant. If the universe wants me to have this pimple, then obviously that's what I want too. I may not like it or understand it at the time, but I know it's part of something I don't fully see yet, and I know that the reasoning will become clear soon enough. Something this peculiar wouldn't remain a mystery for long. Now they're quiet. I can see the next question coming before anyone thinks to ask it. Let's not leave this at the trivial level of a facial blemish, I say. If I get trapped in a burning car tonight, I would still not think to ascribe wrongness to the situation. Being trapped in a burning car and having a pimple on prom night are only different in scale. I may not like burning to death, and I may not understand it at the time, and I would certainly fight against it, but I wouldn't assume that the universe had made an error, or that me being trapped in a burning car was somehow not the way it was supposed to be. So you'd be okay with it? asked Brad. I don't understand what it would mean not to be okay with what it is. I can't process it. It doesn't translate into anything I can make sense of. It has no counterpart in my paradigm. Being in a burning car would cause me to feel a profound degree of discontent which I would seek to remedy, probably by escaping from the car and extinguishing the flames. 
but I wouldn't think of it as somehow other than right. They don't look like they believe me. The thing I'm not explaining well, I tell them, is that this is not a different system of belief. It's a different paradigm of being. It's not something you can plug into your worldview. My surrender to the perfect and unerring will of the universe, which I do not perceive as a thing apart from myself, is absolute. This is not like a belief that can bend or break under pressure. No crisis of faith is possible because there is no faith involved. This is a different state of being I'm talking about, as distinctly different as awake and asleep, as adulthood and childhood, as sanity and insanity. We approach spirituality under the false assumption that we need more knowledge or deeper understanding or stronger beliefs or special experiences, but it's none of those things. It's an entirely different state of being. I have seen this relationship work with unerring perfection for more than two decades. I am not an outside observer of it. I am a co-creative partner with it. It's not a relationship between two entities. It's a new and different type of entity. This is what it means to be in a different paradigm. This is what it means to say that my reality is different from your reality. And as long as you're all staring at me like I'm a head case anyway, I might as well put the cherry on top. If I get a pimple on prom night or find myself trapped in a burning car, my response is never fear or anger or disappointment or doubt. My response is always the same. It's thank you. It's always thank you. They don't look like they believe me. Chapter 22 The Best of All Possible Worlds Do you believe, said Candide, that men have always massacred each other as they do today? That they have always been Liars, cheats, traitors, ingrates, brigands, idiots, thieves, scoundrels, gluttons, drunkards, misers, envious, ambitious, bloody-minded, calumniators, debauchees, fanatics, hypocrites, and fools. Do you believe, said Martin, that hawks have always eaten pigeons when they have found them? Yes. Without doubt, said Kendi. Well then, said Martin, if hawks have always had the same character, why should you imagine that men may have changed theirs? Voltaire, Kendi. There are two literary observations that would be fun and illuminating to make at this point. The first is Kendi which was Voltaire's satiric response to the optimistic assertion by Gottfried Leibniz that all is for the best in this, the best of all possible worlds. This assertion actually comes as a solution in the pseudo-philosophical line of inquiry called theodicy, which seeks to ease our spiritual dissonance by reconciling our inner belief in God's love with the outer reality of suffering and evil. Theodicy is not a valid philosophical inquiry because it presupposes an omnipotent, omniscient, beneficent God and seeks to reconcile evil within those preset terms. In this same sense, all philosophy is pseudo-philosophy and all science is pseudo-science because as a precondition of their very existence, they accept the make-believe reality of the dream state as real reality and erect their systems of knowledge on this baseless basis. Candide, like Buddha, 
was raised in privileged isolation, shielded from the ugliness of the world, and, like Buddha, goes out and discovers it for himself in a way that is devastating to his cultivated world view. Both Candide and Buddha then undergo suffering and hardship owing to wrong thinking, and both eventually end up finding their respective middle ways. Candide is raised to believe that everything is part of God's plan, and that, whether we see it or not, everything is for the best. To interpret any horror or evil or suffering as anything other than for the best is simply to display an ignorance of the fact that God has a grand design which we are not fit to judge. The main theme of Candide is the satirization of this absolute optimism by taking it out of the theory of the classroom and subjecting it to the practical rigors of a gruesomely unbest world. The story subjects its characters to every natural and man-made horror and every sort of suffering to put this optimism to the test, and their philosophy fails miserably. In the end, even Dr. Pangloss, the optimistic philosopher, admits that, though he still maintains that all is for the best, he doesn't believe it. In the words of the yet untested Dr. Pangloss, professor of metaphysico theologico cosmolo negology it is demonstrable, said he, that things cannot be otherwise than as they are. For all being created for an end, all is necessarily for the best end. Observe that the nose has been formed to bear spectacles. Thus we have spectacles. Legs are visibly designed for stockings, and we have stockings. Stones were made to be hewn and to construct castles. Therefore my lord has a magnificent castle. For the greatest baron in the province ought to be the best lodged. Pigs were made to be eaten. Therefore we eat pork all the year round. Consequently, they who assert that all is well have said a foolish thing. They should have said all is for the best. Overlooking the intellectual horishness of it, and despite the faultiness of the reasoning by which the result was arrived at, the philosophy of Candide's instructor, Dr. Pangloss, is ultimately and knowably correct. If we algebraically reduce the equation by canceling out equal and opposite judgments, taking good from one side and evil from the other, for instance, we are left with an egoless and spiritually palate-cleansing observation. Whatever happens must be the best thing that could happen, because it is the thing that does happen. Ultimately, the only criteria we have by which to determine what is best is what occurs. Or, as Alexander Pope succinctly put it, whatever is, is right. The ocean cannot violate the idea of an ocean. If there is conflict between the idea and actual, then the idea is an error. The ocean can't be an error because what it does is what it is. The tsunami that wipes out villages isn't good or bad, or right or wrong. It simply is. The destination isn't where we're going. It's where we are. This is the clear and natural egoless perspective. Where is the part of the ocean that feels bad about the tsunami that wipes out entire villages? Where is the thinking part of the ocean where actions are interpreted and future behaviors adapted or modified accordingly? Where is the planning and scheduling done? Where does it store its memories and knowledge and opinions and beliefs? Where is the feeling part where the ocean senses its own majesty and power and beauty? Where does it feel pride and shame? Where does it fear the time when it will no longer be? 
Where does the ocean keep its hopes and ambitions, its regrets and misgivings? Which part conspires against one human enterprise in favor of another? How does the ocean judge? How does it know right from wrong? Finding no answers to these questions, are we to assume that the ocean is an inanimate, lifeless thing with no intelligence? Obviously not. The ocean is a living, vital, dynamic system of pure intelligence. It performs an operation of incalculable complexity every second of every day, around the world, from one end of earth time to the other, with never the slightest deviation from perfection. This pure intelligence is found everywhere, from galaxies to subatomic particles, and everywhere beyond and in between. Every insect, every person, every thought, every breeze, every planetary body, every dust moat and doorknob, every drop of dew and speck of time. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars, wrote Whitman. I discovered the secret of the sea in meditation upon the dewdrop wrote Gibran. The ocean is just one infinitesimal part of an infinite system in which we, too, are infinitesimal parts, yet no part is greater or lesser. No part is a part. Every part contains the totality. The ocean is a single thing. To be a part of the ocean is to be the ocean. Tat Vam Asi, that thou art. This, too, is the egoless perspective of the integrated state. The universe is pure intelligence, absolute, unerring, perfect. So what's the difference between the ocean and the stars and the subatomic world and you? Ego. Ego-clad beings alone are capable of imperfection. We alone, in our segregated condition, are capable of all the things the universe isn't. Error, folly, emotionality, stupidity, appreciation, love, hate, exploration, awe, self-importance, meaning, art, genocide and a very long list of other qualities, including, most importantly for our purposes, aspiration. We can aspire beyond ourselves, beyond segregated selfhood. We can transcend our own natures. We can aspire to divest ourselves of our self-limiting programming and merge back into the integrated condition from which ego artificially segregates us. Ultimately, of course, an ego-bound humanity is a subsystem, just like the ocean and the stars and the grass, and what looks like error from within is perfection from without. We are perfect in our imperfection, flawed by design. When we divest ourselves of our egoic insistence on judging actions, intentions, thoughts and feelings as right or wrong, good or bad, positive or negative, we see that the only criteria by which anything might be judged is by whether or not it occurs. The heretic is correct in committing his heresy, if he does, and the angry mob is correct in burning him to death, if they do. There is no right or wrong or good or evil, only is and isn't. Whatever is, is right. All is for the best in this, the best of all possible worlds. The other literary observation to make here is from 1984 where the difference between a belief and a paradigm 
is highlighted by protagonist Winston Smith's axiom. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. If that is granted, all else follows. What Winston learns later, during the course of his D reprogramming in the Ministry of Love, is that what can be granted can also be ungranted, and that two plus two actually equals five, or three, or whatever the party says it equals. Making that minor adjustment to Winston's belief set, however, is not enough for his benefactors, malefactors. Even his last shred of selfhood, that truest truth in his heart of hearts, which he is most certain can never be taken from him, his love for Julia, can, and as he will learn in room 101, be stripped away in a minute or two, just like any other belief. Thus is Winston Smith's Buddha killed. With the exception of the subjective I am, all knowledge is just belief, and all beliefs are just costume jewelry that can be torn off and tossed in the gutter like the cheap egoic adornments they are. We don't have beliefs. They have us. Two plus two makes four is exactly as true as two plus two makes five. The truest truth we keep in our heart of hearts is no more true than the truths we tell children and traffic cops. Two plus two makes whatever we say it makes. This is what O'Brien, Winston Smith's savior, persecutor, refers to as collective solipsism, or its opposite. But how can you control matter? Winston burst out. You don't even control the climate or the law of gravity, and there are disease, pain, death. O'Brien silenced him by a movement of his hand. We control matter because we control the mind. Reality is inside the skull. You will learn by degrees, Winston. There is nothing that we could not do. Invisibility, levitation, anything. I could float off this floor like a soap bubble if I wished to. I do not wish to, because the party does not wish it. You must get rid of those 19th century ideas about the laws of nature. We make the laws of nature. The truth is that no belief is true, and to say that any belief is true is to open the floodgates and say that all beliefs are true. No untruth is more or less true than any other untruth. When we are lucid within the dream state, we see that two plus two equals four. But when we are non-lucid within the dream state, no such restrictions apply. And even two plus two equals four is just another belief. Anything plus anything equals anything. Two plus two equals whatever we say it equals. It can equal different things to different people at different times for different reasons. In the sleeping dream state, your two twos can be seven and mine can be one. Maybe the two plus two equal fives and the two plus two equal threes hate each other and have been warring for centuries. Maybe they're barely aware of each other. Or maybe they're uneasily allied against the two plus two equals sevens. The world belongs to the two plus two equals fours at the moment. But as 1984 helps us see, that can change. That's life in the non-lucid dream state, where truth is arbitrary and reality is only an hopeless fancy. Chapter 23 The Three-Legged Stool of Delusion His mind slid away into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness 
while telling carefully constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them, to use logic against logic, to forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again, and above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety, consciously to induce unconsciousness, and then once again to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. George Orwell, 1984 It's Bob's last day in Mexico. He appears at my table and eyes the advanced reading copy of his book sitting in one of the piles, but doesn't ask me if I've looked at it yet. In fact, I have, but not for long. It doesn't take me long to detect and assess ego, whether in people or in their works. I could easily and confidently separate a hundred new thought books into a reject pile and a further look pile in ten minutes, eight if I didn't have to neatly stack the rejects, and then winnow the small further look pile down in another couple of minutes, leaving me with, probably, two or three books I'd want to spend another minute with, of which maybe one, but probably none, would prove a rewarding find. I mentioned in damnedest that I could meet a person and know very quickly, within a few words, where they were currently located in the spiritual terrain. This is that, this ability to make fast, accurate judgments, especially about printed material, is something I developed early in my own process, which is why I mention it here. Anyone with a strong grasp of Enlightenment theory could do it. I found it to be a very valuable tool. It saved me from wasting time and energy treating books and their authors with respect based on the respect in which they were held by those whose respect I didn't respect. Also useful was manifestation, the ability to ask for and receive and recognize what I needed when I needed it. Between these two budding talents, I was able to get what I needed and not get lost in the mountains of books and teachings and groups and philosophies competing for my attention. With Bob's book, I made a greater than usual effort to be appreciative and constructively critical. I went through it with a highlighter at first, marking phrases and claims that seemed particularly underwhelming that he might wish to revise or reconsider or rephrase. But I only got a few pages before the futility of the task sank in. I spent another few minutes scanning through the rest of the book and set it aside. It was essentially a rehash of the same old gurus and teachings, the same old ideals and platitudes. Plenty of heart and soul and equanimity and serenity, Plenty of peace and compassion, love and beauty, but not a sharp or pointed thought to be found. Just the standard New Age prattle, a soft, sweet marshmallow of a book. In other words, I realized, Bob just wants to be a teacher. He's put in his time, he's learned the talk, and now he wants to move to the next level. Bob's book will probably be popular and catapult him up into the ranks of successful and respected spiritual authors, teachers. It has all the right elements. It's nice and fuzzy and warm. It demands nothing of the reader except to recommend that they perform the usual techniques and practices, meditation, journaling, witnessing, etc., it assures the reader that they can achieve profound liberation in a moment, just by realizing something or 
releasing something, or something like that. No real change is necessary. No renunciation or sacrifice is called for. Nothing difficult or demanding or even inconvenient is required. It promises the world, and it has a pretty moral. We are love. In short, standard have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too boilerplate. Of course, market forces are at work, and you have to give the people what they want if you want them to want you. It didn't used to be this way. With all this unseemly pandering to opinion and competition, with all manner of contenders and wannabes. Blame it on Gutenberg with his printing press and Al Gore with his internet. Catholics, as one example, held a monopoly for centuries in parts of the world, and so firm was their grip that they could, in the name of suppressing heresy, torture and kill their own adherents. Nowadays, in our climate of informed alternatives, they can barely get away with suppressing heresy by sodomizing young boys. How the mighty have fallen. Bob has asked me to discuss his book with him on a point-by-point -point basis, to address the particulars of what I consider its merits and shortcomings. He sounds reasonable when he says it, but there's no getting around the fact that the transition Bob writes about is one that he himself has not undergone. Lisa has undergone it, or is undergoing it, and that's what it looks like. Not the pretty picture Bob paints about how love is our true nature and all we have to do is go into the silence and let go of our negative whatever and embrace our positive whatever so our inner whatever can whatever. Bob wants to give enlightenment back to the people. <sighs> yes, enlightenment is the word he uses, although quiet reverie or mild trance or grinning stupor is usually what he describes, and a shallow, undeveloped human adulthood is, at the very most, what he means. He feels enlightenment has been unfairly taken from the people and made the exclusive province of, well, the enlightened. He sees an injustice in that, and seeks remedy by acting as the self-appointed spiritual Robin Hood who steals it back from the elite and returns it to the unfairly deprived. He wants to bring enlightenment down from the mountaintop to the valley, where everyone can enjoy it. Spiritual Socialism the Enlightenment, of which Bob speaks and writes, is of an ordinary, everyday quality. He provides a list of myths and misconceptions about Enlightenment, which serve to rule out anything that would make it seem other than a minor, garden-variety epiphany. His book is a who's who of spiritual authors and teachers who hold the same or similar views about how being awake and being enlightened and being happy are all the same thing, and how the reason no one can ever find any of these things is because they're looking for them, and how the great paradox is that in order to find what we're searching for, we have to stop searching for it, that kind of thing. And it's probably true. If what someone is searching for is contentment, then it seems like a good idea at least on the face of it, to tell them to stop being discontent, that their problem isn't that they lack something they want, but that they want something they lack, and that as soon as they stop wanting it, they'll stop lacking it. That would be fine if they were just talking about contentment and happiness. And by they, I mean the roster of authors and teachers who make their livings and their reputations espousing this line of jailhouse orthodoxy, keep making it about enlightenment, awakening, Buddhahood, and truth. There's nothing new or surprising in all this. This is the standard operating procedure of protective ignorance. Just another day at the office for Maya. 
How do you keep people in jail without locks? By keeping them from becoming discontent. Easily done. The problem, as they see it, is that spiritual seekers think they must climb to the mountaintop where, they assume, such peak individuals as Buddha and Jesus reside. But the seekers aren't making a very good job of it, which is a pretty safe way to interpret total failure. Rather than revising their ideas about Jesus, Buddha, and mountaintops, Bob's breed of spiritual solution provider seeks to fix the problem by switching labels. Now the valley is the mountaintop, and everyone is enlightened, if they go along with the switch. The new goal is right here, right now, and need only be recognized as such. Voila! Total failure is now total success. Peace is war. Captivity is freedom. Ignorance is knowledge. Asleep is awake. This is so Orwellian, so brazen yet subtle, so elegantly representative of the self-deceit of which the fear-based mind is capable, that it arouses in me powerful feelings of admiration and respect for Maya. I say this without any trace of irony. I can't think of anything more fascinating or lovely or worthy of appreciation than Maya, the architect of delusion, the intelligence of fear our beloved big brother. Bob wants to talk, but it's time to take Maya for a walk, so I invite him to come along. My knee still needs help on these hilly excursions, so I grab a hiking staff and the ball flinger and a bottle of water, and we head out. Early in Orwell's 1984, Protagonist Winston Smith is sitting in a cafeteria contemplating the various personality types around him. They're different, but what they have in common is that they're all managing to believe what is, to Winston, unbelievable. One manages to believe through sheer stupidity, another through zealotry, and a third, the most intelligent, through the mental complexities of doublethink. And sitting in their midst is poor, hopelessly sane Winston, who knows that two plus two makes four, but who is surrounded by people who know with greater certainty that two plus two makes five. All of them living in a world where you get tortured and killed for believing, even in your most secret heart, that two plus two makes four. Believing the lie is absolutely necessary to their survival, and Winston's fatal flaw is that he can't do it. Bob is a unique blend of all three types. Stupid, as in protectively ignorant. Zealous, as in the emotional reinforcement of ignorance. And intelligent as incapable of the strenuous mental contortions necessary to believe the obviously untrue. That is the three-legged stool of delusion, and Bob, like everyone, sits squarely upon it. Unlike everyone, however, Bob has declared himself an authority on truth and has written a book on the subject. Regardless of what comes from it, his hope when writing it, was that it would be well received and that he would rise from the swollen ranks of students to the less puffy ranks of teachers, from sheep to shepherd, from common inmate to respected trustee. We exit through the north gate and follow roads and trails up into the hills toward an old chapel. For the first ten minutes it's all uphill and not conducive to talk. Maya is off prowling around, sniffing every third rock. There are perils for a dog out here, and I'm only semi-ready for an emergency. But she's a smart girl and hasn't come close to getting into trouble yet. Once leveled off, we walk and talk for a few minutes, 
circling around the edges of tricky subjects. The problem with talking to Bob has been that we don't have a workable dynamic. If we were a student teacher, that would be fine because I could muscle him around a bit and he would know not to resist too much. As it is, he wants to think we're having a peer-to-peer dialogue, which leaves me in a bit of confusion as to what to say and why to say it. The world is full of false and artificial authority. To my casual observation, true authority comes from knowledge, and false authority comes from might. Badges and guns, titles and offices, money and rank, these are a few of the things that bestow upon people a power and privilege to which they have no independent claim. They are the outward sources of a power for which there is no inner source. In spirituality, titles and garb and fancy names serve a similar purpose. With Bob, even though we've had a few hours together every day for almost a week, there is still this slight friction in our conversation because he wants his authority recognized, and I have no capacity to do so. He has written a book. That's his badge, the tangible symbol of his authority. He has found that most people respect the badge and grant the authority. But this is a place of sharp blades, where skill and mastery are everything, and costume and showmanship are nothing. I like Bob, and he is very useful to me. So I have to remember when I talk with him that he has consigned himself to a sort of gray area where he can neither speak nor listen. Do you have a question? I ask when the terrain permits. What should my question be, he says. What do I need to know? Not a bad question on the face of it, but actually a strategic evasion. The short answer is human adulthood, I tell him. What's the long answer, he asks. The books, I say. Read the books. Okay, he says. I plan to read them. But while I have you here, while we're walking along together, anything you say, regardless of my feelings, I'd be very receptive. I sigh. He's learned to play me over the last few days. That's very commendable, Bob. I understand that you're a person of deep learning and uncommon spiritual refinement. I've known a lot of people who were very spiritually refined, but they were all still ego-bound. So, I shrug. You mean, like me? I scoop up a tennis ball in the ball-flinger gizmo and give it a long toss. Maya ignores it. Okay, like me. I get it, he says. Sorry. Please go on. You want me to tell you what I think you need to hear, I say. So, I will. Spirituality is the most insidious form of self-delusion. And it's got you. Spirituality is Maya at her most cunningly self-preserving. Ego at its most deeply entrenched. That's what you're up against. That's what has you trapped. Spirituality hangs over the world like a pall, like an oily black smoke being pumped into the atmosphere by smokestacks sticking up from millions of churches and universities and monasteries and temples, from bookstands and magazine racks and websites. I look at you and I see a lifelong consumer of this smoke who now wants to get into the manufacturing and distribution end of the business. He's silent for a minute. I just have a really hard time believing all that, he says. Yes, I say. I think that's my point. But it doesn't seem like an oily black smoke, he persists. It seems like people trying to find meaning and happiness, trying to live life in accord with higher laws, trying to live in harmony with the earth and their fellow man, trying to raise children to be better people, better custodians of the planet. 
I don't know how you can compare the kind of evolved, life-positive, non-denominational sort of spirituality I'm describing with an oily black smoke. I just don't see it. That's my perception from the outside looking in, I say. From within, I know, it seems sweet and pleasant and good, something desirable and comforting. Naturally so. Nature of the beast. He ponders. I limp. Maya sniffs. So, Bob continues, I'm saying there are all these people who are living these harmonious, spiritually elevated lives, and you're saying they're living in some sort of smoke? I don't mean it in a bad way, I say. This is what Maya does. This is how she holds the whole thing together. This is the critical service she performs. You endow Maya with a great deal of power and intelligence. Actually, you do. I cut her off years ago. I was speaking figuratively, he says. I wasn't. He doesn't reply. Maya is inside you, animating you, right now, I continue. If I seem impatient with you at times, it's because you think I'm talking to you, and I know I'm talking to her. You believe you're awake, and I see that you're asleep. What's the point of us having this conversation? I don't know, but it's what I do. And you asked, so here we are. So I'm standing in this oily... It's not just that you're standing in the oily black smoke. It's that you've been breathing it in deeply for years, and now it suffuses your entire system from the inside out, in through your lungs and your pores, so that now you radiate it back out in the form of your words and your writings. It has seeped into every cell of your being so completely that you have no awareness of it, like the air, like water to a fish. It's the medium in which you exist. You don't know anything else. Well, says Bob with an uncomfortable laugh, I must be in here somewhere. Must you? Then maybe that's what you want to be looking for, this alleged self of yours that must be in there somewhere. Well, maybe that's what I'm trying to do, find this inner self. Or maybe that's what you're trying not to do. I keep throwing balls for Maya, but she's more interested in sense, so I have to chase them down myself. We take a break on a hilltop with some nice views. I pour some water in a folding bowl for Maya. Then Bob and I drink. You know, he says, there are a lot of myths about enlightenment. They say that anyone who claims to be enlightened automatically isn't, or that there's no such thing as enlightenment. I agree with that, I say. You do? Sure. Enlightenment is untruth unrealization, and self is an untruth. You can't have both. It's one or the other. So who does that leave to be enlightened? No self is true self. Despite the apparent paradox, being enlightened means that there's no one left to be enlightened. But you claim to be enlightened? Within the context of our current metaphor, I claim that I'm not in the blinding smoke. The thing to remember is that, regardless of any and all claims to the contrary, there is no visibility in the smoke. No one can see anything, and the most significant thing no one can see is that no one can see anything. Some people say they can see, and if they tell a good story, and if they believe it themselves, then they can get others to believe it as well. That suits Maya's purposes, and there are rewards for doing it. Nearly all spiritual teachers fall into that category, the blind leading the blind. Once you can see, you can easily see who else can 
and who can't. There's no room for debate. Me? he asks. You what? I'm in the smoke, pretending I can see? Of course, I reply. But not you. I'm not a teacher. I have no students. I have no teaching. But what's the difference, then? You're here with the rest of us. You see what everyone else sees. I'm not, and I don't. But we're here together, right now, he says. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. You see me. You're a mirage, Bob. I see through you. I'm a mirage. I see through me. I gesture to indicate the lovely view. It's all a mirage. I see through everything. Just to clarify, this oily black smoke isn't just the medium in which the spiritually benighted ego resides. It is the ego itself, the stuff of which ego is made. There is no distinction to be drawn between deceiver, deceit, and deceived. Until we understand the egoic condition, there's really no chance of making any actual progress. You know, he says, there are quite a few highly respected teachers who say there is no progress to make, that that's the illusion, that we're already fully awake, already enlightened, and that we just have to stop struggling and searching. What we seek is what we already are, and it's only our searching that blinds us to that truth. I can't find the heart to respond to that. Everything Bob is saying about modern spirituality dovetails with my own views, only with a reverse spin. Where he sees tranquility and equanimity, I see docility and unconsciousness. Where he sees advancement, I see entrenchment. Whenever I venture to take a look at what's current and popular in New Age and spiritual thought, all I find is the same dumbed-down, watered-down, sickly, sweet slop. It's as if everyone was dining from a common trough and the special of the day is just a matter of who regurgitated last. I try to tough it out, but the experience is ill-making, like radiation exposure, and only tolerable in small doses. When I get over my sour reaction, I remind myself that if I can't stand the smell, I shouldn't stick my head in the sewer. There are exceptions, of course, which is why I go back and check once in a while, always looking for someone with true authority and direct knowledge and the power of expression. I put the water away and we continue walking. I pay silent tribute to the supreme and subtle mastery of Maya, the goddess of delusion, not the dog. This is her show. She has it locked down tight, and nowhere is her influence stronger than where you'd expect it to be weakest. Chapter 24 Alternative People There seem to be two kinds of searchers, those who seek to make their ego something other than it is, for example, holy, happy, unselfish, as though you could make a fish unfish, and those who understand that all such attempts are just gesticulation and play acting, and that there is only one thing that can be done, which is to disidentify themselves with the ego by realizing its unreality and by becoming aware of their eternal identity with pure being. We, woo, we. Bob picks up some stones and tosses them off into the brush as we walk. To me, this is just idle gab. To Bob, it's an assault on the foundation of his carefully crafted and heavily fortified egoic structure, his Bobness. After a few minutes, he tries another tack. Jed, seriously, 
I think you've got it wrong about the present spiritual climate in the world. You're being very contemptuous of something you don't really seem to understand. Human spirituality isn't this dinosaur trapped in the past. It's an evolutionary process, and it's happening right now, all over the world. We can change the world, make it a better place for everyone. Maybe I'm not talking about people who are fully enlightened the way you think of it, but people who are awake in their own right. All sorts of very inspired people, artists and musicians, teachers and parents, people full of loving kindness and open hearts and fundamental decency who have seen that the path of the heart has its own riches and rewards. Intelligent, successful, thoughtful people. I try to cut him off but he cuts me off. Let me continue, he continues. I'm talking about deeply, authentically spiritual people who live life in the moment while adapting to a changing future, who create art and green businesses and wholesome, happy families, people who aren't part of the great herd of humanity mindlessly squandering their lives and our planetary resources, people who have escaped the rat race and found a better way, these are people of awareness and vision who understand the predicament in which humanity finds itself socially, politically, environmentally, and are leading this revolution, Jed. They are leading the way into a, a new world order. Yes, oh, okay, a new world order, a new kind of humanity, of human community. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I understand what you're saying about the old ways. But what you're not seeing is that it's already happening, I say. Yes, that this revolution is taking place right now. And it's not about Buddhist or Hindu or New Age ideology or any particular school or doctrine. It's not limited to any one viewpoint, but embraces all ideologies in the sense and to the degree that they respect the individual and the family and the rights of people to follow their own path and pursue their happiness. It's about a new approach to life based on deeply held universal values and principles common to all. There's a global spiritual renaissance. Exactly, a global spiritual renaissance taking place. I stop walking and scowl at him but he has some weird glow of righteousness that makes him immune. The theme he's expounding is prominent in his book and seems to call for the uniting of many different fringe belief systems, those falling into the gray zone between major religions and wacko cults into a cohesive movement which could lead mankind into a better tomorrow. As far as I can make out, the common trait shared by these people and groups is their tolerance for all points of view. Two plus two equals whatever anyone says it does. Everyone is right. All beliefs are true. In any event, what he's talking about, even if it were true or likely, has nothing to do with me and what I talk and write about except that both our subjects fall under the broad rubric of human spirituality, they are unrelated. I am completely indifferent to all of his stated ideals, and he is completely unacquainted with my views. I've made several attempts to impress this upon him, but people seem to have a special place in their framework for things that are outside their framework, and that seems to be where he has put me. We continue walking. He continues talking. I'm talking about an approach to life that is open and receptive, he goes on, an approach that encourages the processes of, of growth and creation and heart expansion. It's all about living lives of love and peace in a way that no society before has been able to accomplish. Do you know how most people live in society today? Like slaves, like mindless automatons going through the motions of life, but not really alive. 
We enjoy this wonderful level of abundance and prosperity that allows us to realize the dream of a new dawn for mankind, a transformation of consciousness. All of the great wisdom teachings point to this. That's why I think of it as a revolution, Jed, an ideological realignment. Together, we can bring about real change, an evolutionary shift. Have you ever heard of the hundredth monkey? This is a radical awakening of the species, and it's happening right now. Many thousands of people throughout the world are taking part in this transformation. Millions, probably. This is a very exciting time, Jed, and I don't think you fully realize, but I do. Bob is talking about alternative people, alternative beliefs and outlooks, alternative business and politics, alternative lifestyles and health care, alternative child-rearing and schooling, alternative fuels and energies, alternative everything, basically, but not very alternative. These are alternatives within the established paradigm, not alternatives to it, a subherd running in parallel to the main body. Rather than detaching from their ego structures, Alternative people merely reshape them along more heartfelt and self-centric lines, their multivarious goals and ideals reducing to personal happiness via the removal, avoidance, and denial of unhappiness. In short, they make the minor course adjustment from orthodox to somewhat less orthodox beliefs. And the one reason underlying the many apparent reasons for this change is always the same. Survival of ego. A chameleon-like adaptability is one of Maya's most effective maneuvers. Paint some trees on the walls of your cell and some clouds on the ceiling and you're free as a bird. This is the status of the would-be spiritual aspirant in the world today. Spirituality is merely an alternative religion, the same lines filled in with similar colors from a slightly different palette. It fulfills the same needs as religion, makes the same undemanding demands, and offers the same vague promises and rewards. It also enjoys the same curious immunity from accountability enjoyed by the religions and wacko cults it falls between, such that users blame failure on themselves and not the belief package they bought or the people who sold it to them. In the end, all three groups, major religions, wacko cults, and the gooey middle, are just minor variations of the one true religion of man, agnosticism without knowledgeism. Bob's alternative people have convinced themselves that they have escaped from incarceration when they have merely burrowed from one cell into another and labeled the new one freedom. In this prison of ego, worldview and cell decor are synonymous. Many live in perpetual dissatisfaction with their cell and seek remedy by introducing new and exciting decorative touches, a swatch of Buddhism here, a dab of Sufism there, a little mystic poetry to brighten a drab corner, and maybe a little Native American splash to give it some local color. Always shopping, always looking for that perfect thing to fill that empty space, finding it and then growing tired of it and returning to the search. This chronic urge to spruce up one's surroundings provides the lifeblood of the spiritual marketplace, which is, at all levels, nothing more than a prison cell design boutique. Whether you're in the market for Christian Gothic, New Age Eclectic, or apocalyptic chic, they've got what you're looking for. Being an alternative person is a luxury not available to everyone. It takes disposable time and 
disposable money. Welfare moms and migrant workers aren't the ones buying organic tofu or chakra tuning forks or hemp luggage sets or, frankly, my books. Peasants only do Tai Chi where it's mainstream. Not everyone can afford to take off for a month of energy healing at Esalen or a week of swimming with dolphins, or even a day to skinny dip in the Dalai Lama's vast ocean of wisdom. Of course, anyone can meditate for free. Even if you're poor, you can sit down and close your eyes and repeat a mantra or count your breaths for a few minutes, but realistically, without a dedicated sacred space stocked with imported incense, hand-tufted cushions, authentic replica temple bells, and an alabaster Quan Yin statue on a museum-quality mahogany altar where, clad in loose-fitting, vegetable-dyed, organic cotton yoga robes, you can work toward your spiritual salvation in a manner befitting so austere a pursuit. Oh, what chance do you really have? Sure, you can put on flannel jammies, lock yourself in the bathroom, light up that old boysenberry delight candle that's been in there since the fan broke, scrunch some towels under your butt, and place the Snoopy bath toy reverently upon the porcelain altar. But seriously, who's that going to fool? Not you. And that brings us to the golden rule of all spiritual practices. If you're not fooling yourself, what's the point? The true goal of all spiritual practices is to keep yourself fooled, to maintain the self-deception, to see what's not and not see what is. That's why the stated goals are always unverifiable and ill-defined. It's not about attaining them. It's about pursuing them. Who wants to wake up? When we have a little itch that threatens to awaken us in the night, we want to scratch the itch and make it go away, not let it evict us from our slumbers. Same thing here. In this sense, spiritual practice, meditation, for instance, is 100% effective. If a spiritual practice satisfies your urge to do something spiritual, if it makes you think you are making progress, if it scratches your itch without disturbing your slumber, then it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. What to say and why to say it? I ponder these questions as Bob and I begin the downhill return leg of our walk. He keeps pushing his ideas of a spiritually elevated humanity, and I keep pushing back, more from habit, I suppose, than from any hope or belief that I'll get through to him. I know our discussion will probably make it into the book, so I have that in mind. Otherwise, I'd be at a total loss as to what to say and why to say it. You and your alternative people seem married to this idea that we're playing by some sort of point system, I tell Bob when it's my turn again, as if you're working toward a karmic degree or prizes in a cosmic gift catalog, like some glorious eternal vacation package in a place where the rules you don't like don't apply. You're tinkering around on the surface with the petty cosmetic issues. But the real stuff you have to deal with is inside you, in as deep as you go, which is a lot deeper than you know until you do go. You asked me to tell you, Bob, so I'm telling you. I know these spiritual people you're talking about. I've known many spiritual people from many paths and systems. I see them with eyes you possess but have never used. They're dilettantes, dabblers, hobbyists, deserters from their own lives. 
This isn't measured in opinion, but in progress. Their spirituality is on the surface only, an egoic embellishment, an evasive tactic. It's better to look different, they think, than to be different. Spirituality is something that's supposed to improve our lives, they suppose, not derail them. He's shaking his head as if I'm still not getting it. He starts to protest, but I press on. You disagree with me, I continue, because you've never seen where real spiritual battles are waged, where spiritual progress is like slowly and methodically skinning yourself with a straight razor, one layer at a time, each more painful than the last. You've convinced yourself that ego is something small and trite, like it's a habit you can kick. Imagine having your head cut off. Then imagine it not in a single chop, but in small pieces. Then imagine doing it yourself. He grimaces. You don't even know about such things. The money and the crowds flow toward pretty fairy tales where everything is beautiful and everyone lives happily ever after. A fairy tale is what everyone wants. So that's what everyone gets and it's ego that lives happily ever after. All the while, we're walking and I'm throwing balls for Maya, who gives joyous pursuit before being lured back to all the strange and exciting scents along the path, leaving me to hobble around collecting the balls and throw them again. Your assessment seems unduly pessimistic, he says half-heartedly. I wouldn't characterize it that way, I say, because I don't see anything as wrong. But... Yes, ultimately, my assessment is that people exist in such a marginal state that it's more like coma than life. So I guess that sounds pessimistic. I'd be happy to stop talking. Go on, please, says Bob in a quiet voice. We're getting into a curvy area of the path with limited visibility. Do you see Maya? I ask. Not the way you do, he says, but from what I understand, my dog, Bob, do you see my dog? I let out a short whistle, and after a few seconds, she comes bounding around a corner behind us and straight into hot tennis ball pursuit. For many sincere people like yourself, I continue, spirituality is a walk in the park on a sunny day, bubbling with pretty notions of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It's softcore spirituality, full of soft focus and soft lighting and soft music, everything soft and fluffy, all moving towards some earth-shaking climax that never seems to materialize. Anyone involved in the actual process of awakening would view such frivolity the way men on a bloody battlefield view children playing war in backyards. You talk about a revolution, but revolutions aren't like afternoon tea parties with fine china and extended pinkies. They're hellish nightmares from which you can't wake up. Real spirituality is a savage insurrection the oppressed rising up in a do-or-die bid for freedom. It's not something people do to improve themselves or earn merit or impress friends or to find greater joy and meaning in life. It's a suicidal assault on a foe of unimaginable superiority. Like David and Goliath, he suggests. Actually, yes, good parable. Our Goliath is large and powerful and cunning and all-seeing. Our David is puny and weak and stupid and blind. He has no advantage in this fight whatsoever, except the heart to fight 
and his rock. We can think of the rock as truth, and truth is the giant killer. Truth destroys everything. Goliath has every power and advantage except truth. And that's why we can fight and win. We have truth and Maya doesn't. Still, it's not a one-shot deal where David throws the rock and Goliath tips over dead. It's a long, ugly struggle because we are both friend and foe. Both David and Goliath reside within. Every inch of ground takes everything we have. Lessons aren't delivered as quaint little parables and allegories, but as irreparable losses, lesson after lesson, loss after loss. Every step is a loss, and as long as there's more to lose, there are more steps to take. Everything is lost. Nothing is gained. So you're saying I should... Not at all, Bob. I'm not inciting you to revolt or to launch an insurrection. The dream state is a big amusement park, and I would never encourage anyone to try to escape. That would be as absurd as suggesting that you commit suicide for your own good. Bob is silent for a few moments. Gosh, he says. Chapter 25 Carnivalesque A childlike man is not a man whose development has been arrested. On the contrary, he is a man who has given himself a chance of continuing to develop long after most adults have muffled themselves in the cocoon of middle-aged habit and convention. Aldous Huxley Death was in the air. I've had two people in my life who were critical in helping me handle my modest financial concerns. Neither actually did anything or charge anything as far as I could tell. Yet between them, they got everything done and got themselves paid for doing it. Clark was a lunch man and Norman was a phone man. Both were from a different area of New York City. Both were already in semi-retirement and practically like family when I was a kid. Clark died a few years ago, and Norman, the winking, brandy-drinking, cravat-wearing, gin-rummy chap, died shortly before I was to travel to Virginia with Lisa's help and eulogize Brett. It was Norman I called when I wanted to buy the Ahihis house and needed to convert my few assets to cash with the most speed and least loss and tax consequence. I gave him legal power to act for me, and he devised and implemented a solution that gave me what I needed in the time frame I needed it. But Norman's passing left some loose ends, so I had to make a trip to New York and New Canaan to finalize things. I was staying in a bed and breakfast in Connecticut when my newly acquired and much despised disposable phone started chirping. It was Lisa, calling to let me know her dad, Frank, had passed away. A heart attack in his sleep, she said. She had to get the body back to the States for services and burial in the family plot alongside her mother, who had died the previous year. Naturally, I excused her from any obligations she felt regarding our trip to Virginia, but she assured me she wanted more than ever to make that trip, and that, since we were both already in the States, maybe we could get together a few days early and make a more relaxed trip of it. We managed to hook up at Reagan National just outside D.C., I had asked her to rent a comfortable sedan, but she upgraded us to a very stately black Lincoln Navigator, explaining that she wanted this trip to be special 
and that she'd pay the difference. It's only a few hundred miles, and we could make it a straight shot, but we decided to stretch it out to over five hundred miles and two days by heading east first, then leisurely southward and westward, stopping and taking side trips as we felt like it, avoiding larger towns and highways and Civil War tourist hot spots as much as possible. Due to time constraints, our drive back to D.C. will be a straight shot up through the Blue Ridge Highlands and the Shenandoah Valley, driving at night the whole way, which I much prefer. Not only are Lisa and I saying goodbye to other people in our lives at this time, we're saying goodbye to each other as well. Once we get back to the airport, I'll be getting on a plane, and that's probably the last we'll see of each other. We drive most of the morning, not in any hurry. We stop for a late lunch and wash down Chesapeake oysters with cold beer on a veranda overlooking the docks of a quaintly run-down marina. I can't say it to her, but I am aware that Lisa has become, over the course of the few months I've known her, a very attractive person. That doesn't come as a surprise to me. I've seen many artificially attractive people become authentically attractive as they underwent the early stages of the transition from artificial to authentic personhood. When we met, Lisa was very pretty in the professional woman, urban, suburban, always-on-the-go soccer mom sense, everything just so, makeup subtle but ever-present, hair in a low-maintenance cut and always done, outfit always carefully selected and accessorized. Now she has left all that behind, and at the same time it has all become unnecessary. She has come into herself, and now her attractiveness radiates from within rather than from department stores and health clubs and from a morning hair and makeup routine. She looks great in jeans and tennis shoes and a t-shirt, hair pulled back or loose, She's happier and healthier, and she looks it. During the first few weeks of her stay with me in Mexico, she underwent a profound physical transformation as her body saw a rare opportunity and seized it. She was initially distraught to find herself battling a whole slew of low-grade symptoms, her discomfort worsened by overall anxiety. It was all quite normal in my experience, and I reassured her and encouraged her to relax into the process and trust it. Her body was taking advantage of this opportunity to bring itself back into alignment after years of being overstretched in all directions. She was releasing a lot of stored-up toxins and dealing with the compounding effect of processing them all at once. For someone who has been eating and sleeping poorly, who has had their nerves frazzled by ever-present electromagnetic fields, who's been bombarded from all directions by deranging images and messages in all forms of media, who has been constantly suffocated under the pressures of work and family and the clock, for whom even vacations are structured madness, and who, above all, considers this state normal and healthy, for someone like this, true relaxation can be like its own rebirth. The most noticeable thing is sleep. The first thing the body wants to do is shut down, and people who haven't slept more than five or six straight hours in years or decades are shocked to find themselves sleeping deeply and untroubled for ten or twelve hours at a stretch, night after night, in addition to long naps during the day. They assume it's something mystical or spiritual, and it is, but not the way they think, just in the ordinary mystical and spiritual way of things. They're not just sleeping. 
but sleeping well, and waking up deeply rested and content in a way that feels new and wonderful and surprising to them. They are revitalized and rejuvenated. It's something they may not have experienced since their childhood and may not have thought possible. This seems to be mainly a matter of how severely bent out of shape they've gotten themselves. Once the body is allowed to repair and heal itself back into its natural state, a whole host of dramatic changes begin taking place. Tastes change and bad habits naturally fall away. Years fall away from the appearance. Pounds fall away too, and healthy skin tone and muscle tone return. Not all on the first day, of course, but surprisingly quickly. It's amazing how resilient and forgiving the body can be. In Lisa's case, there were also some chemical challenges to overcome. Her body had developed an over-fondness for coffee and diet soda and a few prescription medications, and it took about a month for her to be comfortably weaned off of them to the point where she could have a cup of regular octane coffee with me in the morning and leave it at that. I don't know what her alcohol habits were, but I got that sense that a couple of glasses of wine a couple of times a week represented a reduction. This, quite naturally, can also be a very challenging time emotionally, and Lisa looked to me for answers. So I gave her a mantra. Rest. Breathe. Water. Walk. Rest. Breathe. Water. Walk. Rest. Breathe. Water. Walk. The mind is much slower to rid itself of toxic thoughts than the body is to reclaim its health. Lisa underwent an inner conflict stemming from her deeply ingrained attitudes about productivity and time management. Sleeping half the day was lazy and unconscionable. Naps were an affront to her work ethic. Not doing something at all times was a major challenge for her. Just getting to the place where she could see that it might not be necessary to be in a constant state of busyness was a struggle. In the first week I knew her, just to actually sit still for five minutes would have made her crazy. Simply agreeing that doing nothing now and then might not be too horrible was a major concession. She's much better now but the productivity bug still infects her system. This just gives a small idea of the transformation people undergo when they stop subjecting themselves to the endless barrage of assaults and stresses so many people find normal. I'm sure there are plenty of good books about the benefits of getting the hell out of that mess and back into one's natural element. So I won't pound on it here except to say that it has been particularly good to Lisa. She is, in virtually every respect, a different, healthier, and more youthful and poised and radiantly attractive person than she was when we met. Still a work in progress, but coming along very nicely. I still don't see why you need a travel assistant she says. Not that I'm not grateful for this opportunity. You just seem perfectly capable of handling all the arrangements for yourself. During this journey with Lisa, I make an effort to be more talkative than I usually am. I share things about myself, little anecdotes, stories from my life, not biographical in content so much as process-related. I'm trying to show her something, to give her a glimpse of how the world really works and how we work in it and with it. There are a few books she'll find useful in the early stages, but she'll quickly move beyond those, and then she'll be alone. For me, this process of discovery was and is 
a very delightful thing, but our circumstances are very different. I want to leave her with a sense of the spaces she herself can be moving into so that when we part ways, she'll have a sense of her new self and her new place in things and what she is and where she is. It's mostly the dealing with people part. I realized years ago that my contact with, oh, you know, normal people should be kept at a minimum. It was indicated, she asks in a playful tone. Actually, it was, I say. She smiles and nods to encourage me to explain. Okay, I say. Let's see. Well, it was in Mexico, actually, in some little dirt town an hour from the border. I don't remember where. I was at the counter in a hotel trying to arrange a replacement for a broken-down rental car, and the woman behind the counter said something about the terrible heat. Anyway, I was trying to dial a call, and without really thinking about it, I said, No daria eso si era muerto. Lisa barks out a loud, shocked laugh. You wouldn't say that if you were dead? Uh, yep. Jesus, you said that? Uh, yep. Oh, my goodness, Jed. You shouldn't say things like that. People might not be real thrilled to be told something like that. I wasn't thinking. I was just saying what I'd say to any student back then who complained about trivialities. The point being that every day is the best day. That this isn't a dress rehearsal and all that. I happen to know the phrase in Spanish. I thought it was amusing. I bet that's not how she took it, she says. I didn't mean anything by it, I say, feeling a need to explain the blunder. I never try to be witty or sagely or insightful with strangers. It just popped out like a standard response you don't even think about. Even to this day, I don't really understand why she was offended, which is why I need a travel assistant, I guess. I can't speak honestly, and I hate talking bullshit, so I'd just rather avoid dealing with people whenever possible. Sonia saw that I'd rather drive non-stop, cross-country, than deal with ticket agents and hotel clerks and make phone reservations and stand in lines and all that. So she just started sending someone with me, and traveling got ten times better. This is just one small example. This disconnect between me and normal people comes up all the time in many ways, always stemming from the fact that I am no one thinly disguised as someone in order to be out and about, interfacing, I have to impersonate myself. I'm very uncomfortable doing that and not very good at it. The disguise is unconvincing, the deception easily detected. People don't know what it is they're detecting, but they know something's not right. They sense it in some way, even if they don't understand it, that I'm an imposter bit of irony there, I suppose. Was she offended? Sonia? La Mexicana. Oh, yeah, she freaked out. She thought I was threatening to kill her. Within five minutes, the whole town was involved. This was just some impoverished little crossroads town, and here's this gringo threatening to kill a local abuelita. A bar next door emptied out to see what was going on. Her boss comes out of the office carrying a steel pipe. The local police chief shows up, and it turns out he's the woman's brother. They're all yelling at each other, gesturing, consoling the woman. It was quite a scene. Emotions were running remarkably high. Carnivalesque. Oh, my God. Did you explain? I laugh. I couldn't have gotten a word in. The whole scene was crazy. This went on for half an hour. The whole thing had the feel of a Hollywood backlot. All the people seemed straight out of central casting. 
That's pretty much how I see everyone anyway. But here it was quite pronounced. I just relaxed and tried to enjoy the spectacle. Are you crazy? They thought you were threatening to kill her. I'm surprised they didn't gut you and dump you in the desert. We are in God's hands, brother, not theirs. Brother? Excuse me? Oh, it's just one of those nice cultural references. In Henry V, the Duke of Gloucester is worried that the French will attack when the English are at their weakest. And that's what Harry replies. We are in God's hands, brother, not theirs. Harry was an adult, a king, in a state of surrender, threatening to rape daughters and smash old people's heads and spit babies on pikes while marching his ragtag little army against an overwhelming force because to do so was clearly indicated. You don't see that represented in books or plays very often. And what does that have to do with you getting gutted by an angry mob? You're subscribing to the belief that they had the power, that the choice was theirs. The idea that someone with a knife or a gun or money or a nuclear arsenal has some sort of power is beyond my powers of make-believe. I couldn't pretend that was true even hypothetically. You're saying you weren't in any danger? I'm never in any danger. Whether an angry mob, what is it, guts me? Whether an angry mob guts me or not. Whether I break my neck in a motorcycle accident or not. Whether all the peoples and nations of the world rise up against me or not. If the universe wants me gutted and dumped in the desert, I'm all for it. And if it doesn't, no mob or government or law of physics is going to make it happen. Those are the fixed and absolute terms of my existence. It's not what I believe. It's just what is. I don't know how to say it any better. She shakes her head in dismay. And this is normal to you? This is life to me, and to you too now. I set my plate aside and push back a few inches from the table. As you've probably noticed, I'm not a gabby guy. These stories I'm telling you are your new stories. I'm a grown-up in a world where you're just a kid, and I'm telling you these things to help you grow up and make your own stories. The world isn't set up for you now. Wherever you go, you'll be an outsider. There are no families or clans or tribes out there waiting to welcome you and show you around and explain how everything works. There's no apparatus in place to receive you and teach you and protect you. You're going to move beyond the point where anyone can help you because you're an adult now and this is a children's world. You won't have me and you probably won't have anyone older than yourself, not even in books. I'm telling you things, making an effort to be a little open and conversational, because you're going to be alone in the world, and it will be very easy for you to just find a rut and stagnate. That could happen? That's practically the only thing that does happen. Everything is set up for that. The world is full of warm, dark holes for you to fall into. I won't have anyone? She asks in a forlorn tone. I won't have you? You'll have yourself. That's all you need. Am I going to do that? Asks Lisa. Go crawling back? Find a hole to hide in? Despite the statistical near certainty of it, I'd guess you won't. I could be wrong. It's not really my thing. But from what I can tell, you're being groomed for something more. You have to try to understand what fear is, or it will get you, and you'll never even know it. 
we leave the restaurant and go for a stroll along the shoreline. So what ended up happening? she asks. When? With the mob. In Mexico. Oh, nothing. The police chief drove me up to the border and told me never to return to his country. They kicked you out of Mexico? Well, I shrug. It seemed pretty informal. You seem to get into a lot of trouble with the law. I shrug again. No trouble at all. And what did you do after? After he dumped me at the border? Canceled my credit cards. Reported my passport and traveler's checks stolen. Had money wired. They stole your wallet? Sure. Everything I had on me and the knapsack I left in the car. She shakes her head, fed up with petty corruptions. Bastards, she says. Everybody's just playing their role, I say. No reason to take any of it personally. She gives me a long, sideways look. We get back in the navigator and get back on the road. We drive for an hour in silence, though I sense that it's quite loud inside Lisa's head. I don't think I'll ever look at people the same way again, she says at last. I don't think I'll ever be able to trust anyone again. I watch the changing scenery in silence for a few minutes, happy to be here, happy to be with Lisa, happy to be heading toward Brett's farewell, happy to be. Is this my last day? Are these my last moments? Is death's ever hovering finger about to come down? The thought fills me with a gentle rush of joy and bathes the world in beauty. People are dust bunnies, I finally respond. Little bundles of lint and cobwebs that collect in shadows and dark corners, held together and drawn together by fear. Once you see them clearly, trusting them becomes very easy. I trust everybody, and I'm never disappointed. It can be the same for you. That's very hard to believe. You don't have to trust people not to betray you or break your heart or steal your purse. You just trust them to be who they are. Once you understand fear, get a little distance from it and see what it really is and how it operates in the world, then you can understand everything about people. In an eyes-closed being, everything flows from fear, good and bad, courage and cowardice, love and hate, all flow from the same well. How can you trust someone who you know will betray you? You answered your own question. Because you know. Everything that's so mysterious and unknowable with eyes closed becomes clear and obvious once we open them. It takes time and experience and effort, just like it took you time and experience and effort to become the adult you are. That's what life is, a process of constant becoming and renewal, a motion toward clearer seeing and greater simplicity and reduction in the perceived division between I and not I. This is the world. This is the way it will be for you if you continue forward. It's a whole different thing. If I continue she says flatly. When you begin gaining some altitude and see the larger picture, people's personal traits will become a blur and you start to categorize people by what hole they're hiding in. That sounds a little cynical. Try this on for size. Life has no meaning and no belief is true. That sounds a lot cynical. My point is that cynical is an eyes-closed word. You don't need it anymore. Your buffered, 
thought-based relationship to your environment is outmoded and much of your vocabulary is obsolete. You've made this enormous transition, a true paradigm shift, but your infrastructure hasn't caught up with you yet. You've had your revolution. You've overthrown the oppressive regime, and now it's time to govern, to rule wisely and to lead this newly emerged island nation into a future of growth and prosperity. You have others to think about, Maggie and DJ, and maybe Dennis, maybe others as well. You were a wife and a mother before. What are you now? Maggie's at a critical age, and she's had quite an unusual ride already, watching your meltdown, working with her grandfather, interrogating me. What are you going to do with her? Maybe I should find a hole, she says glumly. Go find Jesus. Maybe that would be best for everyone. I nod. Maybe so. Thank you for talking, she says. Thank you for telling me things. De nada. I can't believe how my life has changed. Look at me, here with you, off on this bizarre adventure, whatever it is. It's completely surreal. I feel like I'm going to wake up in my old bed next to Dennis, turning off the alarm and starting a new day and forgetting all about this crazy dream of a new life. She gets a little shaky. What am I doing here? Why do you think you're here? I ask her. Step back from events and ask yourself impartially what's going on. A few months ago, you were a lawyer and a wife and a suburban mom and all that. And now here you are driving this big black hearse across Virginia with Jed McKenna she supplies, with one awakened being on the way to eulogizing another. This would be a very good time for you to reflect on what's going on and why. She's quiet for a few moments. Do you know? She asks. I know for me. Do you know what you're going to say at the eulogy? In the broad strokes, Maggie gave me the idea of show and tell, so that's what I'm going to do. Really? What are you going to show? Two things. One, as you know, we're hoping to find waiting for us in the hotel safe. And the other, what else are you going to show? I reach into my pack on the floor behind her seat. I pull out her day planner, and I set it on the console between us. You. Chapter 26 Post-Uterine Gestation Magnifying and applying come I, outbidding at the start the old cautious hucksters, taking myself the exact dimensions of Jehovah, lithographing Kronos, Zeus, his son, and Hercules, his grandson, buying drafts of Osiris, Isis, Belus, Brahma, Buddha. In my portfolio, placing Manito loose, Allah on a leaf, the crucifix engraved with Odin and the hideous-faced Mehitli, and every idol and image, taking them for what they are worth, and not a cent more, admitting they were alive, and did the work of their days. They bore mites as for unfledged birds, who have now to rise and fly, and sing for themselves. Walt Whitman. Lisa gets us pleasantly lost. We're in no hurry, so she maintains the correct general heading, and whenever there's a choice, she takes the road less traveled. 
We've meandered along this way for nearly two hundred miles. Now it's getting late in the day, and we're both a little tired of driving. So we stop in a small river town to find a place for dinner and a hotel with a couple of rooms. Lisa wasn't happy to be told that she'd be speaking to the group at Brett's place. She actually refused on the basis that she had no knowledge or understanding of spiritual matters and was, therefore, an inappropriate choice to address a group of dedicated spiritual aspirants. I pointed out that, in her short journey, she had already gone far beyond them all. But she was still adamant that she would not address the group. I understand that you won't do it, I tell her, but I'm pretty sure you will. It's simply the pattern, there to be seen. She finds a nice old hotel and we park, but neither of us is very hungry, so we decide to stretch our legs and check out the town. How does it feel to be an orphan? I ask her. God, I hadn't thought of it that way, she laughs. I'm an orphan. What a strange thing to say, like I'm married or I'm not a virgin anymore. Maybe it's not so much a new status as a non-status. Hmm, I'm not sure it feels that way. I'm not sure how it feels. Not to be insensitive, but you might want to take a moment to appreciate the way the universe is accommodating this transition of yours. It's pretty impressive. I don't know if it's very clear to you right now, but the way your past is being picked up and your future is being laid down? You're right, she says abruptly. It's not very clear to me. I guess it's more clear to you. I take that as a grudging invitation to continue. All forces are being steadily employed to complete and delight you, to borrow from Whitman. It's you who set all this in motion. You demonstrated clear intent, not merely through words or ideas, but through actions. When we do this, the universe naturally becomes more pliable than our usual experience of it. It starts reshaping itself to us and we to it. This is what happens as the perceived division between self and non-self begins to erode. That's what's happening with you. And this much more responsive, pliable universe is your new reality. It sounds like you're saying my parents are dead because of the situation I'm in. Are you saying that if you weren't in this situation, your parents wouldn't have died? I don't know, she answers after a pause. I don't know either. I just know what I can see from the outside looking in. And that's that here in your first stages of life as an integrated being, you're getting the star treatment. Massive quantities of biographical baggage whisked away, having me around. Your future life of ease and comfort and continued growth being laid out for you like a royal banquet. A royal banquet? She asks with a trace of bitterness. No waitressing in Corpus Christi with big hair and a fat ass, I explain. No damage to your credit rating, should you still care. You're in for a nice little inheritance, from what your father said. We walk in silence for a while. I feel an unusual urge to meddle. Lisa's not going to have me around much longer, and it would be nice to scoot her through this uncomfortable teething stage and get her to a point where she can fend for herself a bit. It's hard to believe. But most people who go as far as she's gone dig in and refuse to go further. They curl up in a fetal pose, scrunch their eyes closed, and live in the world as if they were still in the womb. It sounds too weird to be true, but among those who make the death-rebirth transition, 
it's so common as to be the norm. I wouldn't like to see Lisa stop before she starts. I usually don't invest myself, not because I have a rule about it, but because I feel no urge. But now I do, so I do. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, even though you didn't ask. You've had your death and birth, and you've experienced major changes and losses. But now that part is over, and it's time for you to open your eyes and start getting things figured out. It's a whole new world, and you're a whole new being. This is what it's all been about since that picture first stabbed you in the heart. All this pain and suffering and loss. The wrenching decisions, the personal betrayals, it was all leading to this. That part is over now. You're not that person anymore. Now you have to let it all go and move forward, or else it was all for nothing. She stops abruptly, pissed, I imagine. I keep walking. I head off into the surrounding neighborhoods, wishing I had my dog with me. Think of a man who loses his job and sinks into despair because he personally identified with his work to such a degree that loss of job means loss of self or loss of manhood. Think of a woman who undergoes a similar crisis of identity due to divorce with the attendant loss of her primary identity structure. Think of parents whose lives lose all meaning due to the loss of a child, or someone who's lost all hope and joy due to some bad news from the doctor. Losses like these can make us feel like we've lost our core. We might feel we can't recover from them, and maybe we can't. When we believe in the world outside of ourselves, gain is often perceived as good and loss as bad. When we stop believing in a world external to self, that reverses. Gain becomes bad and loss becomes good. Nothing we can lose was ever ours in the first place. All we can ever lose is illusion. Using the movie Joe vs. the Volcano as our parallel, Lisa has managed to make the transition from a mindless drone shuffling through a life of programmed drudgery to a vibrant and aware being charting a course away from the things of man. As in Joe, the universe has gone to seemingly supernatural lengths to accommodate her transition. She could never have wished for such cataclysmic upheaval in her life any more than Joe Banks could have wished for a prognosis of a brain cloud with a life expectancy of a few months. Looking back, however, neither would change a thing. Emerson said a man is what he thinks about all day long. Buddha supposedly said something similar, but any time you see the words Buddha said, your bullshit alarm should start screeching, so we'll stick with Emerson. I don't seem to think about anything anymore. I can't even think of anything that needs thinking about. Sometimes I try to think about something, latch on to something and give it some thought, but it just fades after a moment or two. Thought for me is a tool, a weapon. The only reason to lug it out is if something needs to be killed. It's a sword, but I have nothing left to swing it at. I pick it up desultorily and cleave the air, but it's just the empty reminiscences of an old soldier. What would I think about? Religion? Politics? Business? The arts? 
I am blank. I am, by Emerson's reckoning, nothing. My general state most closely resembles a kind of bittersweet gladness. I don't dwell in my memories. I'm not even sure if I really have any. It seems like I have a box of old Super 8 footage somewhere in my mental space, but the idea of hauling it out and reminiscing over the clumsily spliced scenes of a life with which I feel no connection holds no appeal. I know that I was once a warrior, but it's not the memory of that state of being, just the recollection of a fact. There's no pleasure or displeasure in it. It's like something you know about someone else. Once in a while I climb up into the belfry and look around for bats. I head into my head to make sure that there are no messes anywhere, no pockets of darkness, no tracks in the dust, no piles of droppings. Like an old unarmed night watchman making his rounds, I do a quick tour of the joint. I don't do it in a very alert or cautious manner. I'm not too concerned that there would be anything to find, or, if there was, that removal would pose any great challenge. Death especially is an area where I want to remain a bit vigilant. I don't feel any fear or concern about my death. I don't attach any importance to it but it seems like the kind of thing that could sneak something past me. So I keep an eye out. I've been in a dozen situations in the last decade where I figured it was all over, and never were there any unpleasant surprises about my reaction. In every situation I felt intrigued, ready, grateful. I didn't panic or react fearfully so I'm reasonably sure that I don't have much in the way of death demons lurking about. It would be interesting if I did, but I don't think I do. Refusing the fat sergeant's invitation is something I find curious in this regard. It's not that I'm sorry I didn't turn around and yell, Boo! It's that I'm not sure why I didn't. I'm not concerned about it. Just curious. You don't get an offer like that every day, so it seems appropriate to review your response. My day-to-day -day persona is another thing I keep a lazy sort of awareness about. I interact. I have a presence in the lives of other people, and I have my own life to navigate through, my dream state existence. That's something I pay attention to, but again, not much. It doesn't take much thought or effort. I have this teacher-author thing going, but there's no real danger of that pulling me back down into the perinatal states commonly mistaken for waking life. I don't think anything could pull me back down. But there's no harm in this minimal sort of mindfulness. A lot of it comes down to the books. I have a very enjoyable interest right now in Orwell's 1984, for instance. But if it weren't for the context provided by the writing of the third book, I wouldn't have a care for it. It's of no interest to me personally because there is no personal me to be interested. The time I spent in Frank's library and listening to his encyclopedic knowledge on the methods of transcendence used by various cultures through the ages, and his views on a dystopian corporate world state, is the same way. It was interesting insofar as it served the book, but beyond that, nothing. I have no genuine, independent interest in anything except going for walks, preferably with my dog. This is what it is to be fully awake, enlightened, truth realized. That is what it would be for anyone. A Buddha of compassion, for example, is an oxymoron, an irreconcilable contradiction. It sounds nice, 
but it's a complete absurdity, as anyone who has worked through the theory part of this subject can easily see for themselves. It amuses me to think that there are people in the world who consider the truth-realized state something to be devoutly wished for and fought for. The contradictions start piling up immediately. It can't be wished for because there's no it, nor an I to inhabit it. And yet I, who reside in this state, wouldn't trade it for any amount of wealth or power or beauty or kids or grandkids or anything else. I want to shy away from marketing buzzwords like bliss or love because I don't feel they accurately describe this state, at least not as these terms are understood by those not in it. I am happy, content, usually either amused or cheerfully engaged, and yet if I were to receive a message informing me that my death would occur in exactly five minutes, I would have no reaction except to clear my mind and shift my attention to what a nice time I've had here and allow my gratitude to well up and engulf me. Maybe that was the missing piece when the sergeant made his offer. I wouldn't have had the chance to say thank you and goodbye to this fun, lovely, challenging existence. Slipping out the back door like that might have had an irresistible comic charm, but it would have left this large reservoir of gratitude unreleased. That would have made for a poor death, and that twinge of regret would have been the second-to-last thing to go through my mind. That's what I decide as I stroll around the little town in Virginia. When it's time to go, I'd like a minute or two to say goodbye first. I set my desire on that wish and release it, confident that it will, when the time comes, be granted. Lisa and I get back together an hour later and make our way to the hotel restaurant's outdoor dining area. We settle in and order iced teas and look out over the water. I don't think people can simply make their past go away as if it wasn't there, she says, picking up from our last exchange, as if it wasn't a part of them. The drinks come, and we order. You don't make your past go away, I tell her. It just fades away. Like when you wake up in the morning, the dream world in which you were just immersed fades away and is forgotten. When this happens, we know directly, see for ourselves, without intermediary people or processes. For the rest of your life, you'll look at the person you were and virtually everyone else as inferior and defective. Inferior and defective, she repeats with distaste. Inferior in the developmental sense, that a child is inferior to an adult, and defective in the sense that developmental stagnation is abnormal. What else would you say about a creature that grows and develops into physical adulthood without ever exiting the womb. She makes an expression of distaste. That's gross, she says. That's another thing you can expect to change, I say. That egoic need to judge and categorize and label everything. That will fade as otherness gives way to isness. It's a much more relaxed, low-maintenance perspective. Isn't that what intelligence is for? She asks. Judging? Weighing? Determining value and worth? Am I supposed to just relinquish my powers of discrimination? That doesn't sound right to me. What you call intelligence is the intelligence of rats in a maze, of chimps stacking blocks to get to the higher bananas. 
Once you see the real intelligence at work in all things, at all times, you'll never think of it in human terms again. Thought, as you understand it, as a tool of navigation and understanding, is just another non-necessity that gets dropped and forgotten. All of our opinions are just mini-beliefs, rubbish we haul around with us at the expense of our life energy. Your tendency to judge things as good or bad, right or wrong, and so forth, just naturally falls away, and that energy is freed up. You'll soon begin to find all opinions and beliefs rather noxious, and you'll naturally tend away from their source, which is ego. I can't imagine, she says, sipping her iced tea while I dig around in my Caesar salad, looking for signs of Caesar. Iceberg lettuce, tomato wedges, orange cheese, and mystery dressing from a can. The only ingredients that belongs on this plate are the croutons, and they're chewy. You seem to be judging your salad, she observes wryly. Are you not content with its isness? I laugh. I have likes and dislikes, personal preferences, things that please me and displease me. No one's talking about acting a certain way or trying to adapt to some preconceived notions of how you should be. That's a trap, and a very effective one, judging from the number of people in it. I don't see you falling into many traps, she says. We're not talking about me, I say. She sighs heavily. Why are we having this conversation, may I ask? Because I want to make you uncomfortable, I say. I want to irritate and annoy you. You're succeeding. What's the context in which this conversation is taking place? Meaning? What are we doing, I ask. What are you doing? I'm delivering you so you can deliver Brett's eulogy, I thought. No. My context is the book. I'm writing a book. What's yours? She shakes her head. I don't know. I guess I haven't thought about it. You don't have to think, I say. You just have to look. We eat an uninspired meal, and they take away our plates. We turn our chairs to the view and sip our iced teas. It's a few minutes before she speaks again. I don't know how not to distinguish good from bad and right from wrong, she says after the long interval. How do you not judge? It's like I'd be forfeiting my intellect, my personal sovereignty, my moral compass. How can you do that? This is a tricky question to answer because it would be so easy to over-answer. I like to help people take their next step and to gently discourage them from looking beyond it. And damnedest, there was a brief dialogue between me and Maya, the architect of delusion, not the dog. I had remarked on her beauty, and she asked if I would prefer her other face, and I said either was fine. That playful exchange concealed all the horror and evil and suffering in the world. Maya's other face. I am awake from the dream state, so I can no longer be fooled by either face, not good or evil, not beauty or horror. I know it all for what it is, that it's all one thing. It's not necessary or even possible to show Lisa at this stage that there's no difference between any two extremes. But it is time she started to rethink her deep-rooted belief that there is. She doesn't have to see Maya's other face to take the next step, but she does have to start questioning her practice of sorting the world into piles like laundry. Yes, we're going to deliver Brett's eulogy, but that's not our context. 
My context is this book, and Lisa's context is that of a crawling infant. To start moving around and interacting with her environment, to figure out where she is and how things work, and how she fits into it all. Trees grow weak in biospheres because there's no wind for them to contend against. Artificial wind is generated to let the trees develop their strength, not to be cruel, not to bully them. Spare the wind, spoil the tree. I watched a young girl on television. I tell Lisa as we stroll a wooded bike trail a little later. She's undergone this horrendous tragedy. She's been trapped in a burning car, I think, and sustained more damage than you'd imagine a body could. She's been through many surgeries, but her disfiguration was virtually total. At one point during the interview, she looked at the nubs where her fingers had been and said, I used to cry when I broke a nail. It's a moment before Lisa responds, her voice a whisper. My God! That's so horrible. Is it? I reply. I thought it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard. What poem could compare? What art? War and disaster photography is the only thing I know that comes close. But that doesn't compare with the image of a real live girl, once a pretty little high school kid full of hopes and dreams. But now, as physically ruined as it's possible to be, looking at her ravaged hands and saying, I used to cry when I broke a nail. You have a very peculiar idea of beauty, says Lisa sourly. That poor girl, her poor family. To me, it wasn't about the girl, it was about me, about life, about being. This is where we are. These are the rules. That dead body receiving a Y incision on a stainless steel table tomorrow morning is me. That woman plummeting from the World Trade Center is you. That burned girl is Maggie. Lisa stops and turns to face me. I stop too. She has a very level, and steady gaze that's hard to read, but I don't have to read it. I speak my next words slowly and clearly. Do you know where you are? Nothing. Miras, abrace los ojos. Please don't, Jed, she says. I know you're trying to help me somehow, but it's such a nice evening. Can't we just relax and enjoy it? Too much? Am I pushing Lisa too hard? I could go into any library or bookstore and fill boxes with books from the poetry, religious, spirituality, self-help, and philosophy sections written by people who made it as far as Lisa is now and never an inch further. People who have undergone the death-rebirth transition, but stayed in their eyes closed, imagined reality instead of opening their eyes to the new world into which they've emerged. I wouldn't have thought it possible, but I see it all the time. It seems that once we were set in motion, we would stay in motion, but this is plainly not so. The same fierce determination to stay rooted in place we exhibit while in the womb, we continue to exhibit after we emerge. When we cross-reference the metaphors against each other and index the observable cases, we discover an intermediary stage between two worlds, a sort of hypnagogic, purgatorial state in which a person has left the womb but still calls it home, in which they have entered the world but not yet opened their eyes. This is not the same thing as the faux rebirth so common in pop Christianity and 12-step programs. 
These are people who have truly made the transition out of the womb, but not beyond the grip of fear. Nor is it simply the removal of one's chains in Plato's cave. It's undeniably more than that, but undeniably less than lucid. It seems almost unnatural, but as people who go in for freaky sex assure us, the only unnatural act is the one you can't perform. So we have to look at these in-between states as rungs on the evolutionary ladder out of the subterranean levels of dark consciousness in which mankind crouches in self-imposed damnation. And that's where Lisa is now, emerged from the darkness, but eyes still closed. And that's how she could stay, between two worlds, an alien in both. It would be easy for her to mistake this starting point as a final destination and put down stakes, maybe even put out a shingle once she figures out how she got here. Write a book, give talks, make a career of aiding others through an incomplete transition. The temptation to rest must be great after the struggle it takes to get this far, but I'm eager that Lisa should keep going. Maybe that's what that delivery room slap on the ass is for. Maybe that's what I'm trying to do for Lisa. The next thing she has to do isn't easy, but it's not that hard either. And if she can do it, then she can go and keep going. I feel like it would be quite a shame for Lisa to have made it this far and to go no further. This is where it starts getting good. I don't have a lot of experience of working with people at this stage, but what I do know is that I should be encouraging Lisa not to get too comfortable just yet, even if it means pissing her off a bit. We walk in silence for ten minutes before I start in on her again. You lived thirty-some-odd years in your life in the womb, born of the flesh, but unborn of the spirit, I say. Who wants to leave the womb? No one. Regardless of what they say, no one wants out. You can't. It's warm and comfortable and safe in there, and to leave means the end of the world, the end of the only life you've ever known. The only way anyone gets out of there is if some sort of disaster or toxicity drives them screaming out into the world. Which is what I went through, she muses, like a gradual toxification that eventually became unbearable. Yes, and now here you are. But you still want to deny and reject all that's not pleasing and nice. That's the old way the eyes closed way. Now it's time to look, to see everything, to behold the creation of which you are a part. That's what honesty is. That's what living with eyes open is. Acceptance of what is. Acknowledging where you are and what the rules are. Seeing how it works, how to participate, how to live without fear. This is all so dark and depressing, she says. It's not that it's dark, I continue. It's that you're squinting. It's okay to look. It only seems dark because you don't look at it, don't go into it. But we can. You can. We wall off all the bad, scary stuff because that's what children do. They shut their eyes real tight so they don't have to see the monsters. This is a children's world, and it's full of reward and punishment religions and pick-and-choose spiritual systems that embrace the pleasant and pretty while excluding the dark and ugly. But the only reason for that is fear. When you open your eyes and see where you are, you see everything, and only then is fear vanquished. 
right now. You're still living in your imagined realm. You're not a part of that anymore, but you haven't moved on yet either. It's time to open your eyes to see where you are. She lowers her head. So much for a nice evening, she says. Long enough have you dreamed contemptible dreams, I quote Whitman again. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. You must habit yourself to the dazzle of the light and of every moment of your life. I'm getting a lot of Whitman today, she observes. Whitman, at his best, is all about where you are now, all about this transition, this rebirth. She looks over at me. Really? You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, I recite, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. That's Whitman. Most mystical poetry, when it's not just flowery gibberish, is about the two elements of the death-rebirth process, leaving the segregated state and entering the integrated state. Not enlightenment? I chuckle at the thought of it. No, there's no art depicting non-dual awareness or poetry celebrating the truth-realized state or anything like that. It's not that kind of thing. Well, Whitman sounds nicer than the story of that poor little girl. But it's not a time for nice. Here's something from my own experience, a little aha event. I was in school in New York, in the early 80s. One day, a news radio station was on. Standard news items, the kind of stuff you only half hear, and then after something about the mayor, and before something about the Yankees, in the same mechanical tone, the announcer says, A man broke into a Upper West Side apartment today and threw a baby against the wall for no apparent reason. Oh, Jesus, she says hands over her mouth. Please, Shed, no more. Let's just walk. Please? I've always thought of that as the perfect haiku, despite its form violations. I call it Fuck Basho's Frog. A man broke in to a West Side apartment today and threw a baby against the wall for no apparent reason. Plop. Even much later, as I edit this chapter beside another pool, in another part of Mexico, I don't know whether this material will go into the book. Is it too dark? Fingerless girl? Baby thrown against a wall? Does it serve the book? Or detract? The answer, as I well know, is that it's not for me to decide. I am unclear, and clarity will come. I need only be patient, and the answer will appear. The universe will make itself known. I wasn't trying to shock Lisa for the sake of shocking her. If I just wanted to be shocking, I suppose I could have hit her with some truly high-voltage horror and really fried her circuits. My thought was to deliver a few light zaps to her heart. Just enough to make her aware of this whole area she kept dark and walled off. That's what I'm idly musing when this New York Times headline appears on my laptop. Man stabs baby girl in her stroller. The universe has made itself known. The material goes in. One final note. On the night of what would have been my final edit of this chapter, I was reading something unrelated to any of this, and I came across the term post-uterine gestation. 
I've been struggling with this whole concept of people getting just as stuck after their emergence as they were before it, and from the most unlikely of sources, an essay on Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. I was provided with this term, post-uterine gestation, and it seemed to capture this bizarre phenomenon we've been looking at in these pages. This term suggests, as my observations have found, that emergence into the world is not the clear, formative demarcation point one would naturally assume. The processes of growth and development that are at work before and during this emergence are still at work after. And if we abort these processes or fail to recognize and nurture them, we are likely to entomb ourselves outside the womb as effectively as those still in it. Weird. Chapter 27 Cassus Belli Yet now, forsooth, because Pierre began to see through the first superficiality of the world, he fondly wanes, he has come to the unlayered substance. But far as any geologist has yet gone down into the world, it is found to consist of nothing but surface stratified on surface. To its axis, the world being nothing but superinduced superficies. By vast pains we mine into the pyramid. By horrible gropings we come to the central room. With joy we espy the sarcophagus, but we lift the lid and no body is there. Appallingly vacant as vast is the soul of a man. Herman Melville, Pierre. As we drove, Lisa told me about her husband, Dennis. Dennis was a dentist. Dennis the dentist. She told me he secretly hated being a dentist, or maybe he just hated being Dennis. She wasn't sure. He became a dentist because that's what his father was. He was so desperate to please his parents, she said, that his life was a constant losing struggle to live up to their expectations and win their approval. Lisa said he hated a lot of things about his life, so he was never happy and often angry. He suffered from depression and alcoholism, though to outward appearances he seemed happy and successful. Projecting that image, especially to his parents, was the driving motivation of his life. Our relationship to our parents is a very important thing to look at, not because we want to heal the relationship and any wounds we may have suffered or inflicted, but because most of us are still stuck at that level. If our basic understanding of life is similar in the broad outlines to that of our parents, then we have not yet begun our own journey. We are the children of children, who are the children of children, who were the children of children, and so on, all the way back. Quite a chain to break. But breaking chains is what liberation is all about. Anyone who ever wants to do anything in life, to become a person in their own right, must begin by killing their parents. Metaphorically, when we kill our parents, what we're really doing is sloughing off the inmost layer of false context in which we are encased and by which we are defined. That's what we're doing any time we take a step, sloughing off the next layer of enshrouding delusion. We'll see another variation of this theme when we look at Brett's past 
and her relationship with her father and how she dealt with it. Dennis, according to Lisa, hasn't dealt with it. Maybe he will. Maybe he'll go into counseling and talk it out or have a primal scream or take some MDMA in a therapeutic setting and have a cathartic healing event that lets him finally move beyond this spiritual constipation that has rendered him a perpetual and chronically ill child. Cathartic means purgative, as in purge, as in evacuating a toxin or obstruction, as in taking a massive mental emotional dump and restoring free flow system-wide. All progress can be understood as a matter of flow and obstruction. Lisa, after suffering a prolonged illness, finally managed to have her own cathartic, purgative healing event. And we can see where that got her, so far anyway. She lost all of her primary definitions. Maybe she would have preferred to just take a pill and make the pain go away so she could remain in her life circumstances. There are many such pills, and they take many different forms. But she didn't take a pill. She took the pain. He has a morbid fixation on pleasing his parents, so they'll be proud of him, she told me of Dennis, but they're never pleased. Nothing he does is good enough, so he keeps trying to do more, and he just makes himself crazy. He's still just a little boy to them. I don't think I ever realized it before, but it's like a sickness with him, and a lot of his problems are like symptoms. Drinking, high achievement and low self-esteem, chronic unhappiness, always dissatisfied, always pretending he's happy and successful, and all because he's so eager to please his parents, which he'll never do, because they're never impressed by anything. No matter what he does, he's trapped. Even after they're dead, they'll still have this hold over him. There's no way out for him. The unexamined life, said Socrates, is not worth living. That's some serious shit. Most people wouldn't want to examine that statement, much less their own lives. If we take it to mean the stagnated, entrenched life is not worth living, then we are saying that most people's lives aren't worth the bother, which is pretty much how human childhood looks from the perspective of human adulthood. You can still make a case for human childhood, but it has that dissatisfying feel of winning on a technicality. Socrates makes quite a damning indictment. The unexamined life is not worth living. Who lives a conscious, examined life? Everyone probably thinks they do but virtually no one actually does. Who decides to spend the hours and days and weeks and months and years of their life as they do? Who, by conscious decision, with informed thought aforethought, decides to pair up and have kids and buy a house and work a job and spend the very coin of their life filling in the lines of a hand-me-down coloring book life. Where are the people living examined lives, lives worth living? Where are the people who made a choice, not just the secondary choices made within an unchosen framework, but the principal choices, the choice of the framework itself? Where are the people who chose their lives? Who consciously chooses to wrap themselves in chains? Who chooses marriage and children and career? Who chooses to join the ranks of debt-ridden consumers and spend the fruits of their lifelong labors as a slave to possessions and corporations? 
who chooses to spend their free time running errands and doing chores and watching television? Who chooses to eat toxic foods, to live in toxic environments, surrounded by toxic people? Who chooses to live a pre-programmed life from birth to death? Who dreams such sordid, vile, life-negative dreams? Sure, maybe a life of drudgery and carrot-chasing is exactly what we'd choose if we did choose. But we don't. That's what it means to be unconscious, to be asleep within the dream. We slip into the lives that are laid out for us, the way children slip into the clothes their mother lays out for them in the morning. No one decides. We don't live our lives by choice, but by default. We play the roles we are born to. We don't live our lives. We dispose of them. We throw them away because we don't know any better. And the reason we don't know any better is because we never asked. We never questioned or doubted, never stood up, never drew a line. We never walked up to our parents or our spiritual advisors or our teachers or any of the other formative presences in our early lives and asked one simple, honest, straightforward question. The one question that must be answered before any other question can be asked. What the hell is going on here? That's how you kill them. Not with guns and machetes, but with thought and honesty and directness. That's how you look, how you see. That's how you draw a line. This isn't a peppy little halftime speech meant to whip us all into a carpe diem frenzy and send us screaming out into the field with victory in our hearts and a life positive freedom-loving, first day of the rest of your life, bloodlust pumping through our veins until the alarm blares Monday morning and sends us shuffling back to prison routine. Seizing the day just ain't gonna cut it. That's like encouraging an inmate to pursue their lifelong dream of singing in the prison choir. If I had a son or daughter someone for whom I care deeply, I would encourage them instead with the words Carpe Vitae, seize your life. And if I knew the Latin word for fucking, I'd stick that in there too. I'd tattoo it on the backs of their hands so they had to look at it all the time and feel a healthy shame and self-loathing for every minute they pissed away as a spectator instead of a player. Speaking metaphorically, the first thing we must do in our bid for freedom is to kill our parents. We kill the Buddha, or equivalent, last on the way to truth realization, but we kill our parents first on the way to anywhere. There are a whole lot more people who need killing before freedom is achieved. But that's how it must begin. Until we kill our parents, metaphorically, we remain unborn. That's what the movie The Graduate is about. The death and rebirth of Benjamin Braddock as he smashes out of his life, killing his parents, their world, their hopes for him, their society the person they had molded him into and the future for which they were fitting him, and struggling through his own self-birth process. There are no good guys or bad guys in The Graduate. The parents aren't evil, just vapid. And there's no law against being vapid, or we'd all be locked up. Rather, there is, and we are. Elaine exhibits no will and is just a prize to be won or lost. At the end of the film, she has not been set free. 
She has merely had her pattern disrupted. Ultimately, the movie is about the time bombs among us. Ben didn't want to explode and ruin everything around him. He didn't do all that hard work at school while plotting his escape. He is as much a victim of his own spontaneous detonation as anyone. The Graduate is not about love. It's about breaking away. If they did a sequel to The Graduate, we'd probably find that Ben didn't get a whole lot farther than what we saw in the original. Like most of the few that make the transition, he would probably treat his new state as a destination rather than a departure point and be quickly repatriated with the herd. Never fully, but fully enough. That's what I'm trying to help Lisa get beyond. Ben's transition was relatively mild. He was still just a young sapling, his roots shallow and sparse and easily yanked from the ground. At 21, he had no family but parents, no kids, no mortgage and debt, no friends or extended family, no established career, none of the many complex roles he would have played had he been more established, more deeply rooted in his life. In short, he had his breakdown at the ideal time, when there was very little to cut away from, very few people to betray, very little to lose. But what happens when the same crisis occurs twenty years later, when the root system runs far deeper, when it's much stronger and much more intertwined with surrounding root systems? Then, instead of the graduate, we'd be watching the partner. At 41, Ben is no longer a sapling that can be easily ripped from the ground. Now he's a tree, and that same single step of progress at this more advanced stage of emotional arborization requires a tremendously greater amount of explosive energy and a far more powerful source of discontent to fuel such an explosion. It's not tidy, or surgical, or contained. It's not spiritual, or compassionate, or blissful. It's going to make a huge mess. It's going to do damage to all surrounding and intertwined growth. If Ben had continued on his trajectory for another two decades before his epiphany occurred, then instead of just rebelling against tragically unhip parents, he'd be cutting ties with wife and children, with friends and extended family, with work and community and church. His career and finances would be reduced to a shambles. Everything he'd worked so hard his entire life to build would be smashed to rubble. And all for what? You don't ride away from that in the back of a bus, grinning like you beat the house and stole the life-sized trophy. Who's the hero in the partner? Who's the good guy? How do we see an older Ben in that situation except as a psycho-spiritual terrorist? A guy who infiltrates people's lives, and when he gets in nice and deep, goes off like a bomb. A mole under such deep cover that he doesn't know it himself until the wake-up call comes and triggers his detonation. Who's he sitting with in the bus at the end of that movie? What would he have to smile about then? If the movie The Graduate continued for another fifteen minutes, we'd see where Ben and Elaine were really headed. They've smashed heroically out of the prison cell of parental constraint, and now we'd see them crawling through the sewer pipes on their way to... where? They have to find a place to settle, to be. They have to find another cell to crawl into. First they would go to a seedy motel. Then Ben would have to go out and 
buy Elaine some cheap street clothes. Then what? Ben has to get a job. They have to crawl back to their betrayed parents for their belongings and for help. Elaine gets a job or gets pregnant. Twenty years later, Ben and Elaine would be playing house, dealing with their own rebellious kids and bitter parents and jobs and bills and a crumbling marriage. Everything they thought they were breaking out of when they were only digging deeper in. No one lives happily ever after. What happens when that same awakening comes late in life? For that, we are fortunate to have the film about Schmidt. Warren Schmidt's Color by Numbers Life was in perfect order. He did everything right. Then it all comes undone as every layer of his carefully constructed identity is stripped away until even Ndugu, a starving Tanzanian child he sponsors and writes to, looks upon Schmidt as an object of pity. One by one, all his emotional attachments and layers of selfhood dissolve. Job, wife, home, friendship, family, alma mater, history, future, options, and with no happy ending tagged on because the clock has run out. The film ends honestly with a man who played by the rules and did everything right, sitting alone, weeping. Dear Ndugu, Relatively soon I will die, maybe in twenty years, maybe tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Once I am dead and everyone who knew me dies too, it will be as though I never existed. What difference has my life made to anyone? None that I can think of. None at all. Warren Schmidt That's a great realization for young Benjamin Braddock, a cataclysmic one for thirty-something Lisa, and a very sad one for old Warren Schmidt. Lisa had a much rougher go of it than Ben Braddock. What for a twenty-year-old kid is like plucking a daisy is, for her, like dynamiting a well-established tree from the ground. Not pretty, but effective. She was very fortunate to find so much unhappiness in her life for those three years, which is something she's starting to understand now. She killed her parents which is just another way of describing the transition from childhood to adulthood. There are no books in the self-help or parenting or New Age aisles called Kill Your Parents or Never Grow Up. But there should be such a book. And in a world where the inhabitants weren't all developmentally arrested, it would be handed to every child by their adult parents at the age of ten or twelve. But then again, in such a world, there'd be no need. After Lisa tells me about Dennis, I tell her my thoughts about the graduate, the partner, and about Schmidt, and use them to help her understand the developmental status of her husband, of Brett, of herself, and of virtually everyone she knows. We talk about vertical versus horizontal progress and the critical importance of the word further. We discuss some other movies as we cross the state, seeing how old stories function as new stories. She asks if there has ever been someone like me in a movie she might have seen, an awakened being. The Razor's Edge, she suggests. No. I say. That's about you, not me. Larry is going through this same transition to adulthood you're going through. Instead of a picture of a woman falling to her death, he had the war and the memory of a dead friend. 
The dead look so terribly dead when they're dead, he says. He's going through this process of self-birth, exiting one life and entering a new one. In the end, he has broken with all aspects of his former life, even cutting himself off from his own family money, as I recall, and starting a new life in New York as a humble taxi mechanic. But he doesn't end up enlightened? No, he ends up where you are now, at the beginning of his life. And if he's perceptive, he'll be thankful for all the forces that conspired on his behalf to get him there. Death, war, murder, blessings disguised as tragedies. You should read the book and see how it compares to your own experiences. You'll find some very interesting parallels. So you think there was a real guy? Had to be. It's too accurate. His initial break, his confused searching, his pattern and stages of progress, his final vanity, the way the universe facilitates his journey. Mom couldn't have made it up. So Larry only did what I did? There's no only about it, kiddo. Where you are now is where all the great sages and wise men and seers and mystics are. They're just a little further along. I could be one of them? She asks. A mystic? Or a sage or something? They're just roles. You can play whatever role you have an authentic desire to play. The recognized and respected wise folk are seldom very advanced in their development. You can go beyond them. You'll see. She seems pleased and says nothing for a few minutes. Then, what would be a movie about someone like you? She asks. I think about it. The character of tech support in Vanilla Sky is a close representation of me and my role as teacher. Someone who explains the option of either staying in the dream state or jumping off a high-rise roof to awaken from it and waiting patiently available but disinterested, while his client struggles with the decision to wake up or stay asleep. But that's just a minor character I play in other people's dramas. Cast away, I say after a few moments. Really? Tom Hanks? On the island? I don't get it, she pauses. This isn't going to make me sad, is it? Maybe. I don't know. I I'm feeling a bit raw today, I guess. You're saying that Tom Hanks' character became enlightened through his experiences on the island? No. He just found himself thrust into the unadorned paradigm of the awakened being. Being alone on a desert island is a good metaphor for the awakened state. By getting stranded on that island... He has effectively died to his life, but without physically dying. Prior to the crash, the Tom Hanks character, Chuck Nolan, had everything we think of as a life. Friends, career, family, fiancé, as well as the countless other big and little things we take for granted until they're gone. It's all about context. Chuck Nolan, at the beginning of the movie has a full, rich context. He fits in his world. He has a robust belief set. He is a part of things, and things are a part of him. And then, bam, his plane crashes, and it's all gone. Suddenly, simple survival is his only context. What does that leave? A man without a context. A man who is, in all respects except physically, dead. A man with 24 hours a day with nothing to do but sleep, eat, and stare at the waves. The differences between him and the man he buries and eulogizes with such zen-like succinctness are negligible. And that's what it's like to be enlightened? 
That's what the truth-realized state is, the absence of context. There's no artificial framework in which to say one thing is better or worse than another. He had his friend, she says, Wilson, the volleyball. I guess he had to go a little soft in the head to make that relationship work. Actually, that's a relationship I can understand. Yes, he had to go a little soft in the head to make it work. He had to bend or else he'd break. He had to play a life-or-death game of make-believe. He had to believe the untrue and disbelieve the true. He had to perform an act of Orwellian doublethink. The power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. Chuck Nolan knows Wilson is just a volleyball, but he must believe Wilson is a fellow being because he cannot not have a fellow being in his life. Wilson provides the context Chuck can't live without. Without Wilson, Chuck will snap. But with Wilson, Chuck can bend. Before the plane crash, Chuck's context was reflected back to him by virtually everyone and everything in his very meaning-rich and clock-centric environment. After the plane crash, all that's gone, and there's just one thing left to reflect it. A volleyball with a bloody handprint that kind of looks like a face. It's not much, but it's all he needs to pretend he's not completely alone on an island in the middle of nowhere. That's what context is, and that's what it does. It tells us that we're not completely alone on an island in the middle of nowhere. It provides the illusion of a populated environment in which meaning and values can be perceived and applied, where it matters what we do and what choices we make. All context is artificial. There is no true context. Cast away, reduced to its allegorical structure and stripped of everything after Chuck's rescue, provides us with a powerful vehicle of philosophical inquiry. Chuck Nolan had his attachments severed, but he never wanted that. He's been forcibly liberated from a prison where he was perfectly content. Someone slipped the red pill into his drink, and he woke up outside a matrix he never knew he was in. All he wants is to get back in, but he can't. He's locked out of his own life, not really dead and not really alive. Who wants to be cast permanently adrift on a shoreless sea? Who wants to spend the rest of their life tumbling through infinite space? No one, of course. What's the point of pointlessness? How can you want nothing? Words ascribed to the Buddha are often fraudulent, but there's one very clear exception, and it's the quotation at the beginning of this book. Truly, I have attained nothing from total enlightenment. That statement is like an optical illusion. It can be viewed two ways. The less obvious one, the more correct. It's not so much that he didn't gain anything as that he did gain nothing. I see, says Lisa, after we've discussed it for a while. But she doesn't. She doesn't see that what Chuck does to survive is what everyone does to survive. She doesn't see that she herself is alone on an island in the middle of nowhere, that she's gone a little soft in the head, and that her mind has reshaped itself to fit her needs, that her life is given shape and form and meaning only by her capacity for doublethink. She doesn't see that Chuck Nolan's soft-in-the-head relationship with a volleyball wasn't unique, that it's the same tactic employed 
by all people, all the time, in order to maintain the state of denial necessary to continue a meaningless existence in a fictional universe. But Lisa is feeling a bit raw today, so I don't bother her with all that. Writing the books has provided me with an artificial context within which there are things to do and reasons to do them, within which one thing can be better or worse than another. Once the book project is over, once I'm done scribbling words in the sand, then I'll turn around and face my desolate island of near-total contextlessness, really, for the first time. It's been nice to have something to do and a context within which to do it. When the teaching and writing thing is over and I've moved into the new house with my new dog, my last remaining layers of artificial context will have vanished. If I want them after that, I'll have to generate them, if I can. I pondered this in the first book, Idly, soggily, I wonder what comes after. The island is what comes after, as I've always known. A secluded oasis, devoid of contrivance and fabrication. Chuck Nolan didn't like his exile. He didn't want it, and he spent his time on the island wanting to get off and get back to his former world. That's a significant difference between his condition and the awakened state. I can't return to the world from which I am self-exiled, and I have no such desire. Maybe I'll continue with this curious act of writing words in the sand since I'm in the habit, but probably not as part of any agreement with the universe. So it will be a different sort of enterprise, a hobby, not a vocation. My dog will be my Wilson, and I'll have to go a little soft in the head to make it work. I have no problem with that. Chapter 28 Live Free or Die Alice came to a fork in the road. Which road do I take? she asked. Where do you want to go? responded the Cheshire cat. I don't know, Alice answered. Then, said the cat, it doesn't matter. Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. I pace back and forth in the sand where I've paced back and forth on a dozen previous visits, like I've paced back and forth in front of many other groups on many other nights. The difference this time is that this will be my last time. Lisa is seated with Dr. Kim in the front row, and another seventy or eighty people are seated in the sand and in the bleachers. They all appear interested to hear what I have to say. So am I. My threefold task, the way I see it, is to eulogize Brett while saying what these assembled people most need to hear in a way that best serves the book. I have a piece of paper with some quotations in my back pocket, but I haven't given much thought to what I'll be saying beyond that. Everyone was told to bring twenty dollars each tonight to go towards a memorial gift to be presented to Brett's daughter, Melissa, later in the evening. Some of them paid more, and Dr. Kim would later make a generous contribution. The gift itself will be a surprise to the group, but not to Melissa, who has known about it for several months, since the beginning of the planning for tonight. The gift was in the hotel safe, waiting for me, as hoped, and now sits in my pocket. We're going to sit in here and listen to me for a few minutes, I tell them, when they've settled down, 
Then I'm going to leave you in the hands of my designated guest speaker, Lisa. Later on, we're all going down to the lake, where we'll have a fire and say a proper goodbye to our, let's say, friend, to our friend Brett. I don't know how we're all going to squeeze in down there, but these things have a way of working out. When we go down there, we'll hook up with Brett's daughter, and maybe her granddaughter, and we'll have a little surprise that might knock your socks off, a gift for them that you've contributed to. Anyone have any questions at this point? Some do, and we end up killing half an hour with casual conversation that serves to get everyone settled and comfortable. It's a beautiful early autumn evening. The lights are on low, and there's a misty rain falling that creates a soft patter on the aluminum roof and lends a coziness to the riding arena. Tonight's activities will actually run, off and on, for more than four hours. After a period of pretty relaxed discussion, I start veering into the reason we're all here. I'm told the last time you all came here and met with Brett was about a year ago. Who was here for that? About twenty hands go up. What happened? What did she say? Nicole? Nicole is a professional woman about Lisa's age who worked with Lisa and Dr. Kim to organize tonight's meeting. Well, you know how she was. Pretty loud. Always cussing and getting in our faces. Yes, I reply, and everyone laughs at the memory of the fiery Brett. Well, she wasn't like that. It was the only time I ever saw her kind of as herself. She was very soft-spoken, not so much accent. She was very polite and a little sad. She just sat down with us and explained that the meetings weren't doing what she thought they would, that she felt like she was acting more as an enabler of our denial rather than an agent for positive change. She said maybe that was what we really wanted, but she didn't want to serve that purpose. It was pretty sad. Some of us were crying. I nod and pace back and forth in front of the bleachers and nod some more. How do we manage not to find the one thing that can never be lost? How do we manage not to see the only thing there is to be seen? Why do people who say they want to see refuse to open their eyes? These are the questions that must have been tormenting Brett. This is what she couldn't understand as she looked back at these eager, alert, intelligent faces from where I'm standing now. How do these people who say they want to escape from delusion, manage only to dig themselves deeper in. And how have I, someone who knows where they want to go, and how to get there, been turned into just another sleep aid? Brett couldn't answer these questions, so she shut it down. That's very understandable to me. What's not so understandable is why she opened it up in the first place. Dr. Kim is the answer, I suspect. Now these friends and students and admirers of Brett want to know something about her, something she didn't share. They want to know why she terminated this thing they had together. They want to know why, before she died, she turned her back on them. I start talking. I start delivering my final lesson, Brett's eulogy. Why are you here? I ask the group in a rhetorical sermon-like tone. What do you want? I hold out my hands as if to receive an answer, but none is forthcoming. 
I said right at the beginning of the first book, Damnedest, that you have to know what you want. You have to have a clear desire, a strong and specific intent. If you don't know where you're going, then there's no basis for judging one direction better or worse than another. I don't want to single anyone out, so just let me ask, can any of you stand up right now and say in a few words what it is you want? Why you came here to see Brett? No one stands up. I keep pacing and let the silence hang there so everyone can grasp its meaning. No one knows what they want. How would you have answered that question? One of the guys, Ronald, asks. I stop pacing. I face the group squarely and answer. It's not how I would have, I answer. It's how I did. I said that I want to stop being a lie. I want to stop not knowing who and what and where I am. I want to stop being confused and unclear. I want to stop pretending lies are true and that I understand things when I don't. I want to stop playing make-believe and find out what's real. I will give anything to do it. I will cut off my hands or pluck out my eyes or chop off my head. Nothing is too much, and no price is too high because a life of ignorance and self-deceit has no value to me. There is nothing I won't do or give because I would rather be dead than continue in this blighted, benighted condition. I set no terms or conditions. I relinquish all opinions and preferences. I just want to know what's true. Whatever it is, come what may. They stare back at me in silence. Live free or die, I say. That's the motto of escape. It's just that simple. I repeat the one simple question none of them have an answer for. What do you want? Why are you here? They continue to stare. Ronald stands up. I uh, think we're all intelligent people, he asserts, feeling some need to mount a defense. I guess you don't seem to think so. I wonder if he got uppity like that with Brett. No matter. I like uppity. Not true, I say. I know we're all intelligent people, but intelligence is a curious thing in the dream state. Can't live with it, can't live without it. It's like an ice pick in a balloon store. We have to push it into a cork or things are going to start popping. That's the real point of all spirituality and religion and philosophy. They are the safe corks into which we can bury the sharp points of our mind. This self-inflicted dulling of the wit is how we constantly cast our own sleep spell. No one else is doing it to us. There is no magic behind our delusion except the magic we conjure with our own emotional energy. If we stop weaving our enchantment, we start waking up. And that is the last thing we want to happen even though it may be our stated intent. Whatever we might say, we don't want things to start popping. I pause. I pace. I ponder. If I talk about food poisoning or stomach flu, does everyone know what I mean from personal experience? This is met with a chorus of groans, which I interpret as a yes. What? I ask in mock display. No one likes violent stomach flu? 
cramps, nausea, vomiting? No? Diarrhea, fever, chills? Nobody? Jeez, tough crowd. Curled up on the bathroom floor all night? Your body racked and heaving? No one? Wait a second. I haven't told you the good part. How about a violent stomach flu that lasts for a year and a half, maybe two years? Any takers? Nope. Come on. Seriously. What would it take? I prod them. What would make two years of violent stomach flu worthwhile for you? What would make that worth enduring? What would make you want it? I pass my gaze over the entire group. A million bucks? An extra twenty years of life? The return of a loved one who died? They sit in motionless silence. Oh, wait. I've got it. How about nothing? Anyone? Two years of gut-wrenching purging for absolutely nothing. Uh, the lion forms to the left. Who's first? They're unsure as to how amused they should be. Am I being funny or gratuitously gross? Am I dishonoring Brett's memory, or am I making a valid point? I think they're giving me the benefit of the doubt because they're used to Brett's wild, off-color orations. Brett could be an earthy woman. Stay with me, please. I say, this analogy is tight. Violent stomach flu is very much the physical counterpart of a spiritual awakening process, and it's one of those great metaphors that just gets better the more you play with it. I see how you're all looking at me, like even if it's a good metaphor, that doesn't mean you want to hear about it, especially when we're all here to commemorate Brett. Trust me, this is about Brett. And it's about all of you. It's about why she had these meetings and why she decided to stop having them. They settle into a more attentive mood. The main feature of both of these processes, spiritual awakening and physical stomach flu, is the violent and indiscriminate evacuation of all contents physical in one case, mental and emotional in the other. By indiscriminate, I mean no picking and choosing. If it can go, it does go. Upheaval, downheaval, every which way heaval, emergency purge, blow all tanks. I'm aware that this is all just talk to them. They haven't gone through this process I'm describing and I doubt any of them will in this life, but this is my last time addressing a group, and it's a great analogy, and I'm not going to let it, sorry, go to waste. Both processes come in waves, I continue, cycles of agony and relief. You finish one bout of violent retching, and for a little while you feel okay. You think maybe it's over, but then it starts again. You feel that first twinge of not-rightness, that first subtle rumbling that tells you all is not well, and you know what you're in for, and there's nothing you can do but write it out. It builds from bad to worse to unbearable, and then explodes out in all directions, leaving you weak and trembling, unable to endure any more. Then there's that brief period of respite and the glimmer of hope that it's finally over. Then you feel that twinge and the whole cycle starts again. On and on it goes, wave after wave, far past the point where you're sure there's nothing else to come out. But there is. I pace back and forth and study their faces. Didn't your other spiritual teachers explain about this part? The year or two of gut-wrenching expurgation? No response. I spend the next few minutes pacing back and forth and pronouncing the names of a few dozen well-known spiritual teachers, 
gurus and authors, living and dead, with a pause after each in case anyone wants to raise a hand and vouch for any of them, and so they can take note of the fact that no one does. I end the last with a single name. Brett? All hands go up. I really wanted to be clear about that. Now we can continue. Something else that's important to appreciate about this analogy, I say, is that when you have the stomach flu or food poisoning, it seems like your system is going totally haywire. But it's not. There's an intelligence at work. It's a process. The organism is putting itself through this terrible ordeal for a reason. These same things can be said about the awakening process. It looks like total mental and emotional chaos. But it's a process, and there's an intelligence at work. The process works a certain way, and there are reasons for it. And now, for the cherry. And the analogy is still incomplete, I say. I've said many times that no one really wants what this really is. The prize at the end of this two-year bout of violent illness isn't just nothing. It's nothingness. That's what it means to say that it's not just something we don't want. It's something we can't want. There's no it. No one looks in the least bit happy. How would someone make it happen if they wanted to? asks Nicole. How would someone uh, induce this process? Excellent question, I reply. Very close to the heart of the matter. Can you make it happen? What can you do? You can't just take an emetic like some spiritual ipecac to induce the vomiting of a lifetime. You can't just shove your mudra-shaped fingers down your throat. You could try sitting in Zazen for a few years, try to puke up that ball of molten lead they talk about. Let me know how that works out for you. To really make something happen, you have to become poisoned. You have to introduce some foreign agent into your system that's going to grow and spread like it has a life of its own. Maybe this foreign agent is already inside each of us. Maybe it's that little voice that urges us to come to meetings like this, some seed of discontent, and it just needs to be nurtured and encouraged. Maybe this foreign agent is the only thing in us that isn't foreign. I observe my thoughts to see where this goes next. Can you make it happen? I ask. Can you keep it from happening? I have no idea. My opinion is that it's not within your direct control. You have to pray for it and use spiritual autolysis to bring your desire and intent into sharp focus to find out what this little voice has to say and if you want to hear it. But what we keep coming back to is that if you don't want it, you don't want it. That brings us to the question at the very center of this entire subject. Why? Why make yourself want something you don't want? Why try to initiate a two-year bout of violent illness for nothing? That's a tough one because there is no sane reason to do it. You have to become insane. You have to go out of your mind. What it takes to get out of Maya's funhouse is so extreme and so counter-instinctual, so unwantable, that it can't happen within the mindset we think of as sanity. These books would never be complete if I didn't get this said. Within the context of living a long and happy life full of people and diversions, 
being stuck in a jail cell or a wheelchair or a hospital bed or an unresponsive body might seem like the very definition of hell. But that's a factor of the context, not the circumstances. Do I mean to say that terminal illness and physical disability and institutional incarceration are just minor nuisances? I mean exactly that. Within the context of growth, progress, development, motion, realization, liberation, the tables are turned and the physically constrained might actually enjoy a considerable advantage over the freely mobile. Focus, intent, vision, will, heart, clarity, maturity, seriousness, warrior spirit. That's what's needed. Not the ability to run out to the market when we want a snack. We may not be able to change our circumstances, but we can change our context. A prison cell can be a zendo. From a wheelchair, we can fight a war. If we are physically restricted, there may be many things we can't do. But if we can still possess the sword of mind and the heart of will, there is still one thing we can do. And within the context of this book, of these three books, it's the only thing worth doing. The only thing. This isn't physical warfare. It's spiritual warfare. And to fight it, you need spirit, not arms and legs, or a rosy future, or wide-open spaces. I can't pretend to understand the plight of someone who is addicted to crack, or sentenced to life imprisonment, or confined to a hospice, or an asylum, or a wheelchair. But I can, with certainty and conviction, say this. In my own process, my own struggle and journey of awakening, of dying to the false and being born to the new, no physical encumbrance would have been any match for my will and may, if anything, have proven quite advantageous. The very idea that my physical circumstances would have prevented my awakening, so long as my mental and emotional resources were reasonably intact, is, to my certain knowledge, absurd. To further support this point, I repeat the words of Melville Ahab that I included in Incorrect. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I'll do. They think me mad, but I'm demoniac. I am madness maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereupon my soul is grooved to run over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds, unerringly I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. What Brett did, I continue, was instead of finding a way out of life, she found a way in. Like a judo master, she turned this father demon's energy to her own advantage. She figured she was finished anyway, between the progressing cancer and this father presence poisoning her existence, so she realized she had nothing to lose. If I might digress for a moment, I'd like to say that I have nothing but good things to say about this particular realization. Nothing to lose. 
It's perfectly true of everyone, all the time. But it's the realizing part that's tricky. Once you get to that realization, though, not just conceptually, but fully absorbed throughout your awareness, then this whole thing just bursts wide open. Walls come down, and the universe opens up. Anyway, where was I? Who asked if there was a way to put a demon to good use? Shanti? She nods. Well, that's exactly what Brett did. As she explained it to me, everything was just coming apart. She had the cancer with gloomy prospects, and she still had this dumb father thing yapping in her head, blaming her for everything, blaming her for being sick. She sought help. She looked to religion and the self-help aisles of bookstores. But no matter what she did, no matter where she turned, no matter what book she read or what method or ideology she tried to embrace, there was still this voice in her head telling her that it was all just nonsense, that she was too scared to face facts, that she wasn't brave, that she was being an idiot, a fool, all sort of nasty, negative things on and on like that. And all the while, she's just getting sicker, and her time is getting shorter. Then one day, her search for answers and meaning having yielded no fruit, she realized that this voice in her head might not be totally wrong. It was very cynical and abrasive, but not necessarily incorrect. The more her illness drove her to seek answers the more she found herself agreeing with her father's voice. All the answers she was finding were nonsense. When it came to her search for answers, for meaning, for ways to cope with her disease and her mortality, this cynical voice in her head was saying things she not only couldn't deny, but with which she agreed. I wish she were here to explain this to you the way she explained it to me. But the main thrust is that this is how she processed herself into the truth-realized state. Instead of working through it with a tool like spiritual autolysis, she did it with the aid of this built-in, hypersensitive bullshit detector that had been plaguing her for so many years. She was operating under what she believed to be a sentence of imminent death. She thought she was in her final months, and she was intent on getting to the bottom of things, finding the meaning in things. She wanted to find something real, something true. I take a break to drink some water and let that last bit settle in. A bunch of private conversations spring up, but everyone quiets down when I return to center front. Why should such extreme measures be necessary? Why should we have to go through such an agonizing ordeal just to become who and what we really are? I don't expect an answer. I turn it up a notch. Flow and obstruction, I say, are the basic operating principles of life in the dream state. For most people, though, it's all obstruction and no flow. They say we are spiritual beings having a human experience, but really, we are mortally constipated spiritual beings having a subhuman experience. The pandemics of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer that ravage the Western world are merely the outer manifestations of a far-progressed inner condition. While only some of us are physically fat and diseased, virtually all of us are spiritually fat and diseased. Morbid spiritual obesity is a plague that has decimated the human race, leaving this lovely planet little more than a terminal care facility in which we sit glassy-eyed and slack-jawed, 
whiling away the hours of lives we didn't ask for and don't know what to do with. A world of moribund hospice patients mainlining on flavored morphine and running out the clock. That leaves a few moments of silence in its wake. But maybe that's all that people want to do, suggests an older fellow named Henry, rushing to smear some lipstick on this pig. To be spiritual couch potatoes, go to work, raise their families, zone out in front of the TV or whatever. It's not hell, it's just life. I agree, I agree. No one is kicking down doors and dragging people out of their beds. You all came here to see Brett. She didn't seek you out and lure you in, did she? You came to her asking for this, right? Henry nods in agreement, as do others. Did Brett ever talk about how great enlightenment was? How it would solve all your problems? Fill you with love and peace and happiness? Elevate your soul? Let you transcend the human plane and even death? Give you special powers? Anything enticing like that? No one responds. This is another important thing to make clear. Did she ever try to talk you into anything? Did she try to convince you of anything except to think for yourselves? To look and see for yourselves? Was she like some glad-handing salesman or baby-kissing politician, making promises about how much better life would be if you bought into her special brand of spirituality? Was she running some sort of get-bliss-quick scheme? Did she espouse any teaching? Did she irradiate you with her Shakti energy? There's a bit of laughter because everything I'm saying is so obviously un -brett. I wait and let the questions hang for a moment. I don't want anyone thinking we're here tonight to say goodbye to some beloved prison trustee, just another of Maya's legion of flunkies and toadies, a cheerleader for a message of niceness and passivity and contentment, a hypnagogue. Hypnagogue is defined as an agent that induces sleep. Maya has unleashed an army of hypnagogues into the world to induce and maintain the sleep state. All well and good. I have no issue with that. I just don't want people here tonight to think that's what Brett was. Most of you know that I have a pretty strong contempt for the spiritual marketplace, a pornographic mockery of man's desire to know the truth, I think I called it. Do you all understand who and what I meant by that? Nods and grunts of general assent. Do any of you think that applies to Brat? Was she someone who was pushing an agenda, trying to get rich, building an organization, publishing a newsletter or a blog, going on tour? Did she want to be popular? Did she need her self-image as a spiritually superior being reflected back to her? Did she ever even smile? Christ, was she ever even nice? They are alert and attentive. They know something important is being said, something near the scary edge of things. Did she ever ask for money? Try to sell you anything? Invite you on a cruise or a coastal retreat? Did she ever dress up or adopt a title or a spiritual name? Did she ever claim a teaching or a lineage? Did she ever utter a Sanskrit or Japanese term? At the meetings, did she turn down the lights, play music, light candles, begin with a prayer or meditation? Anything like that? The only response is some gentle laughter. This is an important point to make, like listing all the teachers and authors. We have a very nice show planned for this evening, but none of it means anything 
If these people come away from it lumping Brett in with the world of spiritual whoredom. Brett was the real deal, I say. And that's such a rare thing that it's very easy for us not to know it when we see it. That fiery temperament you saw wasn't her. That quiet, thoughtful person some of you saw in that last meeting was closer to how she was away from all this. This is a very challenging message to deliver, and she became the person she had to be to get it across. She stopped the meetings when she realized the truth of what I told her every time we talked, that there's a total disconnect in this teacher-student relationship, a total disconnect. We don't have what you want, and you don't want what we have. Brett didn't want to believe that, but finally she couldn't help but see it was true, and that's when she stopped having the meetings. I have other reasons for doing this teaching thing, but she didn't. So now, with the help of the Dalai Lama, I'll answer this question I've been asking. The question is, why are you here? What do you want? I take a piece of paper from my back pocket and unfold it and read one of the quotations I scribbled down. In the final analysis, said the Dalai Lama, the hope of every person is simply peace of mind. I refold the paper and put it away. Does anyone disagree? No one does. Me neither, I say. What do you want? Peace of mind. It's that simple. So you came here seeking this peace of mind from Brett. But she thought you were here for the exact opposite. She was a disruptor, an agitator, a metaphysical anarchist. She was all about smashing things up and burning them down. She was an iconoclast, a revolutionary. She thought you wanted war, and the whole time you wanted peace. I agree with the Dalai Lama. Peace of mind, spiritual consonance, is what virtually all seekers of all places and all times are really seeking. It all makes perfect sense when you look at it that way. Why is everyone seeking and no one finding? Because they're not seeking truth or growth or change. They're seeking peace of mind. The rest is just dressing. What's so bad about peace of mind? asks Justin. Nothing's wrong with it, I answer. It just doesn't register with someone like Brett. Or like you, he says. Or like me, right. Personally, I think about this idea of peace of mind, and I shudder in revulsion. To me, it's just a fancy way of saying that people just want to keep munching their cud and plodding along, head down, surrounded by herdmates, unconscious, unengaged, unalive. To someone like me or Brett, peace of mind is the enemy. It's the worst thing in the world. It's the cow. It's the inmate. It's the hairless, fetal thing that's still plugged into the matrix. I mean, peace of mind. I make a gun of my finger and blow my brains out. What's the point? That seems to get them a little agitated. Don't be insulted by any of this. It's certainly not your fault. This is the universal seeker dynamic. You can go to practically any spiritual teacher or clergy member, and they'll help you in your search for peace of mind. Brett was the one who didn't get it. It's not just that she didn't know you wanted peace of mind. It's that she would have found such a desire incomprehensible. 
even if you guys had said it straight out, it wouldn't have computed for her. She would have equated peace of mind with being asleep. So it would be like you were coming to her and asking her to put you to sleep. That's the disconnect. Just as it doesn't make sense to you that we think you come here to have your lives incinerated, it doesn't make sense to us that you come here asking for sleep. I signal a break and everyone gets up and stretches. After fifteen minutes, we all return to our places and speak casually back and forth for a few minutes. After a while, I introduce a reluctant Lisa. She comes out, holding her day planner. She is visibly uncomfortable and embarrassed. She doesn't really understand that she, a spiritual neophyte, has succeeded where legions of spiritual veterans have failed. She agreed to speak. I didn't try to convince her. She understood what I was trying to show her, that she still had a big thing to do, and she decided she wanted to do it, and that standing in front of these people and telling her story might help her do it. She opens her day planner to a photo, and hands it to someone in the front row to be passed around. She has a hard story to tell. She starts slowly, in the clipped fashion of a painful emotional confession, but then, eyes down, voice soft and wavering, she finds a quiet, heartfelt rhythm of expression, and the story begins to flow. I step out so my presence won't make things harder for her. Twenty minutes later, from out in an adjacent field, I hear loud and sustained applause. And I know she did good. Brett and I never got any damn applause. Chapter 29 Epitaph for a Friend as I lay with my head in your lap, camarado, the confession I made, I resume. What I said to you in the open air, I resume. I know I am restless and make others so. I know my words are weapons, full of danger, full of death. Indeed, I am myself the real soldier. It is not he there with his bayonet, and not the red-striped artilleryman. For I confront peace, security, and all the settled laws to unsettle them. I am more resolute because all have denied me than I could ever have been had all accepted me. I heed not, and have never heeded either experience, cautions, majorities, nor ridicule. And the threat of what is called hell is little or nothing to me. And the lure of what is called heaven is little or nothing to me. Dear camarado, I confess I have urged you onward with me and still urge you without the least idea what is our destination or whether we shall be victorious or utterly quelled and defeated. Walt Whitman Chapter 30 Duck Speak You remember when I said how I was going to explain about life, buddy? Well, the thing about life is, it gets weird. People are always talking about truth. Everybody always knows what the truth is, like it was toilet paper or something, and they got a supply in the closet. But what you learn as you get older is there ain't no truth. All there is is bullshit, pardon my vulgarity here, layers of it, one layer of bullshit on top of another. And what you do in life, like when you get older, is... You pick the layer of bullshit that you prefer 
And that's your bullshit, so to speak. Bernie LaPlante, hero. I return to the arena half an hour later and find everyone spread out in small groups, standing and seated, drinking and munching on treats from a well-stocked snack table that has mysteriously appeared, engaged in a variety of conversations. I exchange smiles with Lisa, who is in close conversation with the mysterious Dr. Kim. I stroll from group to group and listen in and hear talk of Brett, talk of the story Lisa just shared, talk of the critical differences between the Rinzai and Soto schools of Zen, talk of boyfriend shortcomings, talk of an exciting new spiritual teacher in Maryland who has her students roll their eyes up during meditation so they can see their third eye, and talk of local restaurants. I move on. I respond to questions when asked, but mostly listen. Lawrence, the fellow holding forth on Zen, I find out, has spent 20 years meditating his ass off under several different Zen masters in New York and out west, and is currently writing a book about his experiences. He informs me that my views on Zen are far too simplistic, that there is infinitely more to Zen than the hot and narrow pursuit of enlightenment. I thank him without irony and drift back over to the folks I heard talking about local restaurants, but they're talking about something else now. Zen, I have to admit, really grinds my nuts. It has been a subject of confusion and frustration for me since forever. When I think about Zen, I know there's something there, but when I look at Zen, I can't seem to find it. Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Similarly, I'd say that Zen is the worst path to enlightenment, except for all the others. It's not just that Zen has been westernized, bastardized, homogenized, and commercialized beyond all recognition. I've looked back over the centuries into the history of Zen and have found that it has long since drifted safely away from its dangerous center. I have looked at many highly revered Zen masters, East and West, and one thing is very clear. Zen master is not synonymous with awakened, truth-realized being. Frankly, I don't know what the hell a Zen master is if he's not awake or what the hell Zen is, if not the annihilation of the ego. But anyone who uses those criteria to refine their personal Zen search will instantly see their results plummet from millions of strong hits to a dubious handful, with very few of the big names surviving the purge. The sincere aspirant could spend the next decade in a Zen monastery, sit at the feet of a revered Zen master, perform Zazen with perfect discipline, endure the pain and the stick and the agonizing hours and the selfless toil, soak up every word, every parable, every drop of teaching, and ultimately know nothing more about Zen than the cabbie who picks him up when he finally calls it quits. And here's the funny thing. Even as he's leaving, knowing that the whole thing was a total waste of time, he'd also know that he wasn't wrong. He'd know he picked right, and that what he wanted was in there somewhere. He just never found it. All that other Zen got in the way. Zen is a race car without an engine. It looks very cool, but without an engine... It can't take us anywhere. We can slip in behind the wheel and make engine sounds and turn the wheel and shift gears and pretend we're rocketing across the spiritual landscape. But when we get tired of it in ten minutes or ten years, 
we'll get out of this sexy little hot rod exactly where we got into it. So why go on about it? I hadn't actually thought about Zen much since writing the first book, but over the summer and on the trip here, I have given a lot of thought to Lisa's experience, and it occurred to me that in her I was seeing the real Zen, a force so powerful and inexorable that it can reach into someone's life unbidden and hurl that person like a rag doll into the furnace of disillusionment. That's some crazy shit. I mean, there she was, a perfect housewife, super mom, career gal, and all-round high achiever. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam! Her perfect little connect-the-dots life gets nuked back to infancy. Not into enlightenment, but into and through the death-rebirth process that marks the beginning of the journey. Of any journey. What I was seeing in Lisa was the real Zen. Not the long-dead Zen of myth and marketplace. Not the sideshow corpse of Zen that still lurks in the rubes. Or the tap-dancing Zen zombie selling energy drinks and lawn ornaments at the bidding of the dollar-eyed Svengali's on Madison Avenue. But the inferno at the very core of Zen. Without training. Without middlemen. Without stated desire or specific intent, Lisa had somehow managed to plunge straight into the heart of things. Why Lisa? I wondered. Why was she different? Millions of people saw that picture of the falling woman, and many others like it. The world is full of seemingly senseless tragedy. We're all dangling by a thread and everyone gets a reminder of that now and then. Not everyone does what Lisa did, though. Most of us turn away from such an unsettling revelation, but Lisa didn't. She turned toward it. She wouldn't or couldn't let herself turn away. Was it destiny or free will or the timeless, spaceless other? I have no idea. But what I do know is that what she did is what virtually all spiritual aspirants, to all appearances, should be doing and aren't. Relinquishing the illusion of control. But appearances can be deceiving, and spiritual aspirants don't always know to what, if anything, they aspire. That's what Brett was figuring out when she stopped having these meetings. In Zen terms, what Lisa managed to do in three difficult years was empty her cup. An impressive and remarkably uncommon feat, especially for one so deeply rooted in life as Lisa was. She never asked for it. She never wanted it. But it came, and she dealt with it. Impermanence had become Lisa's own personal koan, and those thousands of minutes she spent staring at that blurry photo of the falling woman was her zazen practice. This is real zen, burning from the inside out of a real person. Who cares about one hand clapping or your face before you were born or any of those quaint little mind-benders. What's more mind-bending than your own looming death? What could be more devastating to ego than the contemplation of meaninglessness and insignificance, of nothingness, of no self? Here was Lawrence, a clever, dedicated man with twenty years of Zen study under his belt, writing the obligatory book, and already signed up for the next twenty years, and he's made as much real progress as anyone I might pick out of a crowd, or a lot less, 
depending on how you reckon anti-progress. And here was Lisa, with no interest, no motivation, deeply established in her well-worn circular path, and she had achieved a level of success a seasoned veteran like Lawrence wouldn't even recognize as such. We can use the opportunity afforded by Lisa's experience to take a closer look at Zen, I tell the group after calling them back to order. In spite of itself, Zen is what we're talking about when we talk about peeling away the many-layered fabric of false identity. If you take away all the trappings of Zen, the teachings and the ceremonies, the different schools, the postures and the koans, everything you think of as Zen, and throw it all into the fire, what survives? What is the true core of Zen after all the veils and vanities have burned away? I pause because I want them to think about it. The fire, I answer. The fire is what's left. The fire is Zen. Lawrence is shaking his head. You're free to speak, Lawrence, I say. He sighs in exasperation and stands up. He addresses not just me, but the entire group. He talks about the real Zen that I seem to be ignoring. He talks about patriarchs and ancient roots and Zen today. He pays homage to his own teachers and their teachers. He talks about heritage and philosophy, training and lifestyle, practice and dedication, personal struggle, tradition, commitment, sacrifice. He is intelligent, eloquent, and expert on his subject. I let him continue for a few minutes because I'm optimistic, on Brett's behalf, that some of the people here tonight are looking at Lawrence and seeing what I'm seeing, a little boy who is scared of the dark and has spent his life burrowing into the fortress of Zen, the grown-up version of huddling under blankets, hiding from some imagined boogeyman. Parents tell their children that there is no such thing as the boogeyman, but that's because they themselves have never thrown off the covers and turned on the lights. There is such a thing as the boogeyman. He is out to get you, and he will. The boogeyman is real. He is the most real thing in the dream state. And real Zen, if there is such a thing, is about turning toward him, not away. While he speaks, Lawrence tries several times to engage me to draw me in. But I know better and gesture for him to continue without me. The first rule in this business is never let them drag you down into their imagined realms. He wants to pull me down into the muck and mire of words and concepts and debate, into the warm ooze of perpetual stalemate. That is his element. That's where he and many like him are most comfortable making their engine sounds, busily going nowhere. I watch the group as Lawrence speaks. It's not always easy to remember that these people aren't like me. They look and sound awake, but they're not. They are asleep and dreaming, sleepwalking and sleep-talking. Their words make sense to them inside their dream world, but from my perspective it's mostly mumbling. They seldom express a lucid thought or formulate a coherent question. In several minutes of uninterrupted discourse on Zen, Lawrence has not said anything that I recognize as being related to the topic of awakening from delusion. As he watched the eyeless face with the jaw moving rapidly up and down, Winston had a curious feeling that this was not a real human being, but some kind of dummy. It was not the man's brain that was speaking. It was his larynx. 
The stuff that was coming out of him consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness, like the quacking of a duck. George Orwell, 1984 So how can we communicate across this great divide? Metaphors and well-known stories, like books and movies, provide a common ground where ideas can be expressed. But if we drift away from that shared territory in either direction, it's like a radio tuner drifting away from a clear channel into static. If you're standing out here in front of these people and you're attached to results, as Brett was, then it's only natural that you'd get a little aggravated and finally give up. The gulf that separates these states is very real, and all attempts to communicate across it are inherently quixotic. It's not until a student or aspirant or reader starts closing the consciousness gap from their side that any real communication can start taking place until someone understands what it really means that their eyes are closed and begins the process of unseeing what's not. Nothing Brett or I might say could really make much difference. The wall separating the awakened and unawakened states is not conceptual or theoretical or metaphorical. Intelligence can't pierce it. Piety can't melt it. Fervor can't smash it. It is a force field empowered by the emotional energy of fear. So everything we hurl against it is rechanneled into it. Only ego death defeats this barrier, because the barrier is ego itself. The segregated self must recede for the integrated being to emerge. The whole evening will last more than four hours, less than two hours of that time spent with me addressing the group. Mostly it's just easy conversation and quiet remembrance. We speak casually for another half hour. Together, we talk about the Bhagavad Gita to see if Krishna isn't actually Maya and if the song of the Lord isn't actually a lullaby. We talk about the matrix and lay it like a template over our own world to see how it fits and where everyone fits in it, including us here tonight in this horse arena. Are you Morpheus? One person asks me. Brett was more like Morpheus, says another. Jed's more like a program. No, he's the red pill, another answers, and everyone laughs. Many of them have brought their copies of Damnedest and Incorrect with them tonight, so a lot of their questions come from the books. We talk about 1984, with which they're somewhat familiar, about Moby Dick, which many own but few have read, and about Whitman and Thoreau and U.G. Krishnamurti. It's all very nice and pleasant in the arena, with only a few lights on and the soft rain falling outside and a gentle breeze passing through. As long as we stay on the subject of the books, or within the framework of metaphors and allegories, we are able to enjoy an interesting and instructive exchange. Of these seventy people, I know that maybe one, but probably none, will actually do anything. They're mostly just tourists, which is fine with me, but it was a tough realization for Brett. Of those I have observed, Dr. Kim seems the most sincere, and I know he's not going to blast out of his holy trinity, work, home, family, due to the minor technicality that he's playing a fictional character in a fictional world. Lawrence is so deep into his role of dedicated Zen adherent that he'll never get another glimpse of daylight. 
There are others who seem equally sincere or dedicated, but a closer look reveals that it's written into their character to seem sincere or dedicated, or that their spirituality has been clumsily retrofitted, like a pressure relief valve not specified in the original design. Of course, there's always the one that surprises you. Maybe there's a Lisa or a Brett up in those bleachers somewhere. If there is, it probably won't be any of the most likely candidates, but one of the quiet ones, sitting in the back, slowly building up some heat, starting to burn from the inside. I take a break and wander down to the lake. When I get there, I see that my concerns about fitting in all these people have already been addressed. More than an acre of lakeside field has been cleared and mowed. A medium-sized white canopy has been erected, and there are at least a hundred folding chairs set up in semicircle facing the fire pit and the lake. I had hoped to be able to scare up a dozen logs and a pint of gas for the fire, but that's been taken care of, too. A large, well-kindled bonfire is waiting to be touched off. The area around the fire pit, which was cramped with twenty people in the past, was now mown and groomed to handle a hundred. I knew all this lakeside tribute part would work itself out, that we could get a fire built and squeeze everybody in somehow, but I had no idea it would be taken care of like this. Dr. Kim. I'm sure right away that he put all this together, as Nicole would confirm for me later. Dr. Kim arranged landscapers and day laborers, got the chairs, tent, and a few tables from his temple, and had the whole thing ready in three days. I have the last cigar I got from Frank. This is a bit pre-planned. I wanted to create a pause in tonight's events in which I could come down to the lake alone, light a cigar, walk a quiet lap around the lake, and just think about things. I've done a lot of cool things in my life, more than just jumping out of planes and writing some books and escaping delusion, but I know no greater pleasure than taking a nice walk in a nice place on a nice night. I wish Maya was with me. I'm always with you, she says. I meant the dog, I reply. The rain has stopped. The clouds are parting, and a nearly full moon is peeking through. Perfect. I light the cigar and begin my walk. This little stroll around the lake is supposed to be quiet and reflective and soaked with meaning as I pay silent tribute to Frank and Brett and many others who have played important roles in my own journey. I know things are winding down for me, and this is supposed to be like my victory lap, where I look back over one life and perhaps forward to another. I should know better than to try to pull such a smaltzy stunt. The cigar tastes like crap. It needs the booze for counterpoint, and I have no booze. The lake path Brett walked so many thousands of times is now overgrown with brambles like razor wire. I get about fifty feet before chucking the whole thing is a bad idea. The cigar goes into the lake and I go back to the riding arena. Sentimental bullshit. Chapter 31 The Demon Tamer The only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of your life, your memories, your attachments. They burn them all away, but they're not punishing you. They're freeing your soul. If you're frightened of dying and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. If you've made your peace, 
then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. Lewis, Jacob's Ladder, attributed to Meister Eckhart. Most of you probably know that I managed to arrive at the truth-realized state through the writing process, spiritual autolysis. I talked about that in the first book. Anyone who manages to do it has a way they managed to do it. Does anyone know how Brett managed to do it? A few hands are tentatively raised. I point to a guy in front. Something to do with her father, he says. A lot to do with her father, I confirm, though it was a few years after he died. He was a military guy, an officer, so Brett was an army brat. She lived in a bunch of different places, different countries. Her father was an extremely critical person, found fault with everything, always very judgmental. That's what Brett told me about him. Even after he died, he was still a constant presence in her mind. You all know what it's like to have a critical voice in your head? Some person or thought or emotion that has taken up residence in your head and tends to be a bit on the obnoxious side? Everyone raises a hand and nods with grim familiarity. Well, those are demons. Demon is a useful way to describe anything in our heads that we don't want there, and which seems to have a mind of its own, something that haunts us or has power over us, has its hooks into us, memories, people, addictions. They torment us in a variety of ways, but the main thing demons do is hold us back restrict our progress. This is Brett's final lesson for you, by the way. This comes from her. She explained all this to me one night last year. We were sitting down at the lake after a meeting. The fire was dying down, and she told me about what a fierce presence her father had been in her mind. Always there always critiquing and belittling, a real cancer of the spirit. Normally, I'm not very tolerant of that sort of disclosure. If Brett had been a student of mine, I would have encouraged her to stop dawdling over childhood grievances and maladies, to leave it behind and move on. Sounds of disapproval rise from the bleachers. Maybe that sounds cruel, I continue. But problems of this nature are solved by transcending them, not by dealing with them. We are in the business of slaying demons, not feeding them. This is getting me a lot of scowls and dubious stares, so I have to say more. I'd planned to keep it simple by limiting my discussion to Brett's father, as extreme an example of demonhood as you're likely to find. But now I see that demonology is something we should take a few minutes to look at. Imagine you're climbing out of a dark sewer, and some beast has its teeth sunk into your leg, making a lot of noise and tearing at you and weighing you down. A demon. Are you going to jump back down into the sewer and fight it? A lot of people think that's the answer. But why do that? It's tough to slay demons, because they're symptoms, not causes. And even if you kill one, there are always more. What's next? A fight to the death with your obsessive neatness? Pistols at dawn with your love of chocolate? The only real result of these little battles is that you haven't gone anywhere. You're still in the sewer. All you've really killed is time, and time is all you really have. 
You haven't killed a demon. You've lost a piece of your life. And that means they've won. The part of you that's afraid to move forward has won. You have to ask yourself, what's your objective? To achieve mental equilibrium in a sewer? Or to climb out of it? To slay every little demon? Or to rise up out of the realms they inhabit? Don't laugh like it's obvious. Everyone seeks solutions within the sewer rather than escape from it. Battling demons is the ultimate form of shadow boxing. You're just punching at an empty projection of yourself. For our purposes, if demons aren't demonizing you, then they don't exist. It's as simple as that. Sounds like a cop-out, says Justin, like a way of not dealing with your issues. Who agrees with Justin? I ask the group, and many people nod or raise their hands. So do I, I agree. It does sound like a cop-out. But dealing with our issues is the real cop-out. It's our way of avoiding the real war by engaging ourselves at the level of minor skirmishes. Who wouldn't prefer to struggle against their addiction to caffeine instead of their addiction to mindless conformity? They laugh. As we develop a subtler and more refined understanding of what a demon is, identifying them by what they do, not how they look, we begin to see that demons aren't limited to addictions and critical voices. It's not just negative attachments that hold us captive within ego's sphere. It's all attachments. The approach to life and spirituality where we decrease bad things like sins and addictions and increase good things like love and compassion never has and never will move anyone a single step in the direction of awakening. They look half dubious, half confused. For example, I explain, if I were a gambling addict, then a large portion of my life energy, my time, my thoughts and emotions would be spent either gambling or fighting my urge to gamble. But for our purposes, feeding my addiction and fighting it are really the same thing. Whether my gambling demon is beating me or I'm beating it doesn't matter. All that matters is that I'm sitting in my prison cell fully engaged in processes that will never move me one inch closer to liberation. That's what demons do. They're like Maya's army of winged monkeys. They always fight a delaying action that expends our resources and prevents us from making forward progress. That's their objective to occupy us, not to defeat us. There's an interesting parallel in 1984. The country of Oceania has the power to create a high standard of living for everyone, but the ruling party wishes to keep everyone impoverished and thereby enslaved. The problem was how to keep the wheels of industry turning without increasing the real wealth of the world. Goods must be produced, but they must not be distributed. And in practice, the only way of achieving this was by continuous warfare. George Orwell, 1984 Continuous Warfare People toiling in factories, producing ships and tanks that are destroyed in a perpetual war that is never won or lost. People stay busy and production stays high while their standard of living stays low and their hope of overthrowing their oppressors stays non-existent. Demons are similar in that they don't exist to win or lose but only to keep us busy. Say, for instance, that after 20 years of fighting my gambling addiction, I finally manage to overcome it. 
what would I have to show for that victory? Twenty years gone. Demons keep us unfocused and distracted, I continue, which is something the spiritual autolysis is very effective at cutting through. The need to deal with tormenting demons comes up again and again as we progress, so you have to know what to do as a matter of policy. Keep climbing or jump down and fight. My advice? Fight when you have to. Climb when you can. Further is everything. Use the writing to keep yourself in tight focus and the demons will die from lack of attention. Isn't it possible that these demons could be used in a positive way? asks Shanti. You talk about how dark emotions can be useful. Is there any way demons might be useful too? Yes, I say. And that brings us right back to Brett. This father presence in her mind was much more serious than any of us can probably imagine. I'd never heard anything like it before Brett told me about it. I've looked into it since then, and I found out that for some people, these critical internal voices can be really shattering. No one moves or speaks. I don't think Brett ever got too touchy-feely in the meetings. She was as naturally indifferent to mundane emotional, psychological, and biographical content as I am. The point isn't to study and understand and cherish the bags of rocks we carry. The point is to drop them. This is all back when Brett was just a normal person, before any sort of awakening at all, no interest in any of it. The presence of this father demon in her mind was constant and highly toxic. Whatever she was doing or thinking, it was there. Loud, contemptuous, undermining. She spent an hour telling me what this was like for her, and I found myself intrigued because she wasn't sad or sobbing or self-pitying. She was smiling with that air of a warrior recounting tales of battles won and lost. Even when she was quiet and thoughtful, she could tell a good story. Everyone laughs and smiles. What she told me was that it just got to be too much. She couldn't stand the presence of this hypercritical asshole in her head anymore. She said life had no pleasure. Nothing she did was good enough. She couldn't enjoy anything. She was trying to find relief in alcohol and drugs. I assume this is a more severe case than most of you are familiar with. Eyes are wide. No one responds to the contrary. This was her whole life since she was a kid. Twenty years of this negative, nagging voice in her head. She was suicidal. Think about that. That's how bad it was. That's how serious this was for her. She knew it would never go away. She knew she couldn't fight it. She knew that no matter what she did in her life, this voice in her head would always be there sucking the joy out of it, ruining everything. And once her father died, there was no way she could even confront him in person and make a meaningful change in their relationship which left her even more hopeless. She was trapped. No way out. That's how she described it to me, through that hard smile. Did you all know she had cancer? That jolts them. I was pretty sure they didn't know. Dr. Kim knew, but not the rest. Not a big surprise, I suppose that a malignancy of the mind and spirit would eventually manifest as a malignancy of the body. This was in her late twenties, before any of us knew her. By the time they caught it, the prognosis was bleak, and it got her thinking more and more about the larger issues. 
I pause and pace and let my thoughts get out of the way. She told me that at her lowest point she was in terrible shape, low weight, her musculature was seized up, migraines, poor sleep, always tense and hunched, doped up on meds and sick from chemo. She lived here on the farm, but not as a going concern. No animals, no crop or gardens. She still had this critical voice in her head mocking every thought, and she had a pretty dire prognosis from the doctors. She beat it, though, right? asks Justin. I mean, that was more than ten years ago, right? She beat the cancer? I look at all the faces looking eagerly to me for this answer. She kicked its ass, I reply to Justin. You saw her. You knew her. Did she seem sickly? Seized up? Weak? Fatigued? No, he says. How did she beat it? How do you think? I ask back. I turn to the entire group. How do you think Brett beat cancer? Chemo? Alternative medicine? Power of prayer? Positive thinking? A Mexican clinic? A visualization technique? I pace back and forth and give it time. Anyone? How do you think Brett defeated what was diagnosed as advanced stage terminal cancer. Finally, I stop in front of Dr. Kim. Sir? He looks up at me and speaks in a choked whisper. She stopped fighting, he says. She stopped fighting, I say after an extended pause. She stopped resisting, Everything she'd been pushing against for so many years, she now began to allow. She knew she was defeated. She knew she had nothing to lose. She wasn't finding the support she needed in church or in medicine or anywhere else. So she just stopped fighting. I pause for a minute to let them get the wrong idea. I know this sounds counterintuitive, I continue, like giving up, like weakness. But when I say she stopped fighting, what I mean is that she stopped routing all her energy into her shields. This one simple act is the key to everything. It's the transition point from segregated to integrated, from childhood to adulthood. Ego is obstruction. Surrender is flow. Surrender is the basis and precursor of growth. It is of the essence. There is no shortcut or workaround, no substitute or alternate route. You can fake it, and many do, but you're only cheating yourself. There is no growth possible within egoic constraints, only the illusion of growth. Prior to surrender, there's ego, the puny, ignorant, segregated self. Once we free ourselves from that noxious and artificial puniness, we come into alignment. Bam! Just like that. It may take days or months or years for the various aspects of our lives to make the adjustment, but the initial impact is as dramatic and distinct as climbing out of a dark, fetid sewer into the clean air and dazzling sunlight. Before that, we're just silly, self-absorbed, rat-like little beings. But after that transition, after we have stopped asserting a false apartness, we are of the same dimension and magnitude as the ocean of being into which we merge. Virtually all of religion and spirituality is about being happy and ignorant in the sewer, because that's what people want. But this is about climbing out. If you're happy in the sewer, then it's not a sewer to you. If you don't think it stinks, then that's fine. But then, why are you here? 
The assumption when you stand in front of someone like me or Brett is that you know it's a sewer and you want out. I turn and walk away from the group. Nice to have so much space to move in. I turn and walk back. You're pretty hard on religion and all the spiritual and new age teachings, says a woman I don't recognize. There's a whole world of knowledge and wisdom out there. Do you really think it's fair to tar it all with the same brush? It doesn't matter what I think. I'm just telling you what I see and what you'll see if you open your eyes and look. If you disagree, open your eyes and tell me you see something else. I promise that if you do that, you'll be my new favorite person. I don't necessarily agree with your premise, she says, that my eyes are not open. I think I see the same things you see. Okay, then. Again, no offense, but you're here as a tourist with no vested interest, a spectator, not a participant. That's the case with most people, but most of you here tonight would probably be nursing some degree of healthy self-doubt. Anyway, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I just don't know why you're here. She looks sour. I return my attention to the full group. I'm working backward from the complete and total failure of the world's spiritual and religious teachings to facilitate awakening, even those that claim to be dedicated to that exact purpose, especially those. I see this failure, and I see Maya, and I understand everything clearly. The intellectual and emotional power of ignorance is fully visible to me, and I can tell you that all the compassion and meditation in the world won't drag you up out of that sewer. No breadth of knowledge or depth of understanding translates into a single rung of upward progress. No one can push you, pull you, or go with you. All thoughts, ideas, feelings, Concepts and systems of knowledge and belief boil down to this one unequivocal distinction. Sewer or sunshine, dungeon or daylight, ego or surrender, obstruction or flow, segregation or integration, vertical entrenchment or horizontal progress. This isn't about spirituality or enlightenment or anything lofty. It's just about living your life honestly or dishonestly. They sit quietly, attentively. Fear converts every inward thought and impulse right back outward. Maya turns everything to her purpose. That's what you're up against. It's a death match, and there's only one way to win, and Brett found it. She stopped fighting. She surrendered. It's ego that fights, that resists, that sucks all our energy. Brett dropped her armor and exposed her breastbone to her enemy. And in so doing, she destroyed the enemy. Maya is not outside of us. Ultimately, she's just another internal demon. Routing our power against her or to her are the same thing. And when we stop, we stop empowering her and she ceases to exist. These books would never be complete if I didn't get this said. Within the context of living a long and happy life full of people and diversions, being stuck in a jail cell or a wheelchair or a hospital bed or an unresponsive body might seem like the very definition of hell. But that's a factor of the context, not the circumstances. Do I mean to say that terminal illness and physical disability and institutional incarceration are just minor nuisances? I mean exactly 
that. Within the context of growth, progress, development, motion, realization, liberation, the tables are turned and the physically constrained might actually enjoy a considerable advantage over the freely mobile. Focus, intent, vision, will, heart, clarity, maturity, seriousness, warrior spirit. That's what's needed. Not the ability to run out to the market when we want a snack. We may not be able to change our circumstances, but we can change our context. A prison cell can be a zindu. From a wheelchair, we can fight a war. If we are physically restricted, there may be many things we can't do. But if we can still possess the sword of mind and the heart of will, there is still one thing we can do. And within the context of this book, of these three books, it's the only thing worth doing. The only thing. This isn't physical warfare. It's spiritual warfare. And to fight it, you need spirit, not arms and legs, or a rosy future, or wide open spaces. I can't pretend to understand the plight of someone who is addicted to crack, or sentenced to life imprisonment, or confined to a hospice, or an asylum, or a wheelchair. But I can, with certainty and conviction, say this. In my own process, my own struggle and journey of awakening, of dying to the false and being born to the new, no physical encumbrance would have been any match for my will and may, if anything, have proven quite advantageous. The very idea that my physical circumstances would have prevented my awakening, so long as my mental and emotional resources were reasonably intact, is, to my certain knowledge, absurd. To further support this point, I repeat the words of Melville Ahab that I included in Incorrect. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I'll do. They think me mad, but I'm demoniac. I am madness maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereupon my soul is grooved to run over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds, unerringly I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. What Brett did, I continue, was instead of finding a way out of life, she found a way in. Like a judo master, she turned this father demon's energy to her own advantage. She figured she was finished anyway, between the progressing cancer and this father presence poisoning her existence, so she realized she had nothing to lose. If I might digress for a moment, I'd like to say that I have nothing but good things to say about this particular realization. Nothing to lose. It's perfectly true of everyone all the time, but it's the realizing part that's tricky. Once you get to that realization, though, not just conceptually, but fully absorbed throughout your awareness, then this whole thing just bursts wide open. Walls come down, and the universe opens up. Anyway, 
Where was I? Who asked if there was a way to put a demon to good use? Shanti? She nods. Well, that's exactly what Brett did. As she explained it to me, everything was just coming apart. She had the cancer with gloomy prospects, and she still had this dumb father thing yapping in her head, blaming her for everything, blaming her for being sick. She sought help. She looked to religion and the self-help aisles of bookstores. But no matter what she did, no matter where she turned, no matter what book she read or what method or ideology she tried to embrace, there was still this voice in her head telling her that it was all just nonsense, that she was too scared to face facts, that she wasn't brave, that she was being an idiot, a fool, all sort of nasty, negative things, on and on like that. And all the while, she's just getting sicker, and her time is getting shorter. Then one day, her search for answers and meaning having yielded no fruit, she realized that this voice in her head might not be totally wrong. It was very cynical and abrasive, but not necessarily incorrect. The more her illness drove her to seek answers, the more she found herself agreeing with her father's voice. All the answers she was finding were nonsense. When it came to her search for answers, for meaning, for ways to cope with her disease and her mortality, this cynical voice in her head was saying things she not only couldn't deny, but with which she agreed. I wish she were here to explain this to you the way she explained it to me. But the main thrust is that this is how she processed herself into the truth-realized state. Instead of working through it with a tool like spiritual autolysis, she did it with the aid of this built-in, hypersensitive bullshit detector that had been plaguing her for so many years. She was operating under what she believed to be a sentence of imminent death. She thought she was in her final months, and she was intent on getting to the bottom of things, finding the meaning in things. She wanted to find something real, something true. Did she think she was possessed? asked Ronald. No, rationally, she knew she wasn't possessed by a demon. She knew that this voice wasn't really her father, but her own creation, some part of herself speaking, some buried or subconscious part of her trying to express itself. That was part of her decision to stop fighting it and start trying to make sense of it. She told me that during this period she walked around her lake thousands of times, sometimes twenty laps a day, and that's more than a mile around. I recognized that behavior right away. That level of intense, angry energy is common in the awakening process. And while she was doing that, walking lap after lap around the lake, she was arguing with this father voice in her head. They were debating, out loud. She was vocalizing both sides of the conversation. Imagine what a head case she must have looked like to the ducks and frogs. Everyone laughs. That's another common feature of the awakening process, the loss of regard for convention and normalcy. All thought for keeping up appearances falls away. Hours at a time, walking the path around the lake, lap after lap, hour after hour, day and night, month after month. It started with Brett screaming at her father, but at some point they came into alignment and started working together until, after more than a year of this feverish walking and ranting, Brett absorbed this harsh, critical voice, which was always, of course, a part of her. This father demon was that small voice of reason in her mind, screaming to be heard, 
and she pushed aside all her emotional resistance and let it speak. Think about her situation for a minute. She never had any desire for spiritual attainment of any kind, in any sense. She never went in for any sort of belief system. She wasn't following a path or a teacher. She wasn't trying to evolve or burn karma or raise her consciousness. Nothing like that. She was just trying to deal with her shit honestly. Her words. And that's what it looked like in her case. Like a very sick lady walking laps around a lake, carrying on this lunatic dialogue, processing herself out of her own bullshit. This wasn't just her bid for freedom. It was her healing process. Over time, she subdued this demon voice in her head, completely eradicated the cancer from her body, and found the answers for which she so desperately searched. Now, you're all being very nice and listening because you think that all this demon stuff was Brett's thing and doesn't really have much to do with you. But you're wrong. This is all about you. I've mentioned that I was going to share two techniques with you all tonight. One is what Brett did, demon taming, which is interesting and illuminating, but would only be useful for someone who has an unusually powerful and vocal demon raging in their head. The other, memento mori, is for everyone, everywhere. Every living human being, regardless of religion or nationality or whatever, should begin practicing memento mori right away and every day. What is it? asks Nicole. What does memento mori mean? It means we do have this powerful and vocal demon raging in our head, and not just any demon, the king of demons, the boogeyman. But we drown him out with every thought and feeling, every minute of our lives. We all have our own personal demon inside of us, and our lives are completely dedicated to denying it. But if we want to awaken, we have to stop hiding from this demon king that lives inside us. We have to turn around and face this big, bad boogeyman. That's what memento mori means. So, what do we have to do? asks Justin. Kill the boogeyman? Everyone laughs. I laugh too. Don't be silly, I say. You can't kill the boogeyman. The laughing dies down. Let's go down to the lake and light a big fire and tell some scary stories. Chapter 32 Memento Mori To begin depriving death of its greatest advantage over us, let us adopt a way clean contrary to that common one. Let us deprive death of its strangeness. Let us frequent it. Let us get used to it. Let us have nothing more often in mind than death. We do not know where death awaits us, so let us wait for it everywhere. To practice death is to practice freedom. A man who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. Michael de Montaigne What's the last thing I want to say? What does it all come down to? If I could only have ever delivered one lesson, what would it be? What is the single most important message I could share? What is the diamond at the core of all spiritual aspiration? What topic is befitting not just my own farewell to the teaching gig, but a farewell to Brett. 
These were the questions I put to myself when I decided to come meet Brett's group and say goodbye with them. And as soon as I asked the question, I knew the answer. Memento mori. Remember, you must die. How bad can all this spiritual stuff get? What's the worst case scenario? These can be very scary and paralyzing questions to leave open-ended, especially when we set out alone on a journey beyond the charted regions of the map. The answer to these questions, happily, is death. Death is as bad as it can get. Death is the worst-case scenario. That's where this whole thing ends up. That's the full extent of the downside. You are going to die. And, of course, you're going to die anyway, so it's really kind of a non-issue. I have always found this simple observation both comforting and empowering. My own journey was made possible by having that question, how bad can this really get, neatly tied off at the end. Death is absolute. Unlike anything else in the dream state, death is clearly seen and certainly known. It is where we are going, whether we take this journey or not. No matter what you do, no matter how horrible it gets, it doesn't just keep getting worse and worse forever. There's an end to it. And since I'm going to die anyway, and it's only a matter of when, the simple fact is that it really can't get bad at all. This casual treatment of death is not meant to minimize the agony of peeling off your skin in layers as you divest yourself of emotional content and connections. That's the gruesome part. But the fact is that these wounds heal instantly. Rather, no wound remains. Gone is gone. Done is done. With every step we leave behind that which we move beyond. No baggage is carried because... Releasing baggage is the essence of progress. The pain-giving thing is the thing removed. When it's gone, so is the pain. All that's left in its place is relief and a mild, short-lived curiosity. It's like pulling a bad tooth or ripping off a bandage. The tough part is the fear before and the pain during. There's no phantom limb syndrome haunting us after we've amputated a gangrenous piece of emotional meat. There's just a pleasant nothing until a new pain announces itself and the next cycle begins. It is later now, nearly ten o'clock. While everyone made their way down to the lake to have some more snacks, and get themselves situated for the shank of the evening, Lisa and I walked up to the house and talked to Melissa. We'd met with her earlier and given her the jewelry box containing the gift we'd be presenting her with later. She'd known about it for months, but I still didn't want her seeing it for the first time in front of a crowd. Best to let her spend some private time with it first. Now I get it back from her, and walk down to the lake to join the others. Lisa stays with Melissa. We have arrived at the heart of the evening. I will do some speaking. We will introduce Brett's daughter, Melissa, and make a small presentation. Then Lisa and I will make our exit so we can take a nice drive on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and I can catch a red eye for Denver. Behind me is the fire. Above me, a bright moon occasionally obscured by silvery wisps of clouds. The lake is to my left, a large fenced field to my right. And in front of me sit nearly a hundred people in orderly rows of folding chairs, a large white party tent behind them. The light rain will stop and start throughout the rest of the evening, but we'll never need to take shelter from it. 
The orderliness of the seating, I realize, is unpleasant to look at. It creates an invisible proscenium where I and the fire are on stage, and they in their chairs are in the audience. I tell everyone to pick up their chair and move closer, to form a semicircle around me and the fire. After a minute or two, it's done, and the whole thing is more intimate. I throw more logs on the fire while they settle in. I await their attention and soon have it. I pull the small box out of my pocket. It's made of black walnut with a glass window in the top so you can see what's inside without opening it. Inside, on a bed of black satin, is a single diamond, not small, on a thin gold necklace. Everyone who sees it oohs and ahs over it. I hold it up and watch it sparkle in the firelight. I hand the box and a small keychain flashlight to someone in the front row. This is what we're giving Melissa in remembrance of Brett, I say. I hope you'll all appreciate the symbology represented by the diamond. Pass it around. Here we go. You heard Lisa talk earlier, I begin. She showed you a picture, passed it around. She told you about a woman who got up one pretty September morning, got dressed, got her family's day started, and made the commute to work. Just another day. Nothing unusual to indicate that on this day she would have to stand in a blown-out window and choose between an inferno and a thousand-foot fall. I have their attention. Some look around for Lisa, but she's still up at the house with Melissa. What Lisa showed you was the real Zen, the unknown Zen, the Zen that doesn't sell. That photograph of a woman who had just jumped out of a burning skyscraper was Lisa's Cohen. Like a badass demon, it got its hooks into her and wouldn't let go. That time she spent staring at the picture and contemplating its meaning was her meditation, her zazen. Over the course of three years, her koan devoured her. It got in and metastasized through her system like a cancer. Eventually, despite her resistance, it killed her. I pause for a drink. Memento mori means remember your death. Remember you must die. That's what Lisa was doing. Her practice of communing with that picture for an hour or more every day is a perfect example of memento mori as a spiritual practice. Death awareness is a vehicle out of the state of death denial in which we reside. Lisa's experience. What happened to her? The profound reorganization her life underwent as a result is what happens when we make this transition. I pace and watch the flames for a moment. We live in fear of death. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to look at it. We don't even want to acknowledge that it exists. We just want to go about our lives and not be reminded of our mortality. So we try to minimize it in three ways. First, we push death off into the distant future, so it's not something we have to think about right now. We'll probably die when we're 80 or 90, and we'll probably be too soft in the head to know what's happening anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. They laugh, despite themselves. Another way we reduce death to something we can deal with is by stripping it of its finality through our afterlife beliefs, heaven and rebirth mainly. For most of us, these beliefs are just strong enough to serve the purpose of getting death out of our face, out of sight, 
out of mind, right? No one says wrong. A third tactic we use in our practice of death denial is constant distraction. We keep ourselves from thinking by keeping busy, by keeping our attention outwardly focused on the myriad trivialities of life. The Holy Trinity is home, work, and family. But then we have others as well to fill the gaps as needed. Sports, shopping, books and television, addictions, hobbies, and so on. I pause and pace, pace and consider. So one, death is not for a long time and will probably be too senile to care. Two, it's not an end like it seems. It's just a transition to something else. And three, we keep ourselves perpetually distracted. Between these three denial tactics, death is not an important presence in our lives. It's with us every moment, but never in front of us, where we have to look at it and think about it. This is how we keep death out of sight, behind us, instead of in front of us. This is how we maintain the state of death denial that allows us to go about our lives in a state of virtual unconsciousness. That was the establishing shot, an overview of our subject and our relationship to it. Now I'd like to provide everyone with a close-up. It's a well-worn cliché that we don't know how precious something is until we lose it. It's a cliché that when someone has a close brush with mortality, they develop a newfound appreciation for life. Suddenly, everything is beautiful and glorious. Each day is a gift. Everything takes on new meaning and all that. Very powerful and eye-opening and perspective-giving. We call this a wake-up call, and that's exactly what it is. Is everybody familiar with this? Hands? All hands go up. Maybe from TV and movies. Who's seen it up close? Most of the hands go down. And who's experienced it for themselves? Only two or three people keep their hands raised. I point to one, a young guy named Terry. What happened? I fell off a scaffold at work, he says. I heard the paramedics say I wouldn't make it. And then in the emergency room, too, I could tell they didn't think I'd survive. And? Well, I survived, obviously. And then it was like you described. I had this really sincere, profound appreciation for everything. I couldn't understand why everyone wasn't that way all the time. Like, how can everyone not see this? He chokes up a bit, but goes on. I mean, it just changed the way I saw everything. It changed my whole outlook. And how long did that last? Well, it's still with me, but not really, I say. That creates a hush. All eyes turn to Terry. No, he says with a sigh. I guess not. It's just a memory now. It's nothing like it was... But I wish it was. I felt really alive for, well, probably less than a week, I guess. But it was real. It was like the most real thing I've ever experienced. Like that was real life. And this is just sort of, well, like you say, I guess, like being asleep. I promised myself I wouldn't let it slip away, like Lisa talked about. But I did. And now everything is just pretty much regular again. So this wasn't a cliché for you? Oh, no. No way, he says with palpable sincerity. It's the most alive I've ever felt, just like you talk about, like I woke up for a little while, but I couldn't stay that way, like I just closed my eyes and drifted back to the way I was before the accident, or like life just dragged me back down. It's kind of sad to think about it now, that I'm like normal again and everything. 
I felt like I was finally born, like I really knew what life was for the first time. That's what I thought life should be like, all the time. I still do. That's why I started getting into spirituality and coming to see Brad in the first place. I was trying to recapture that sense of intense aliveness. I still am, I guess. And how's that going for you? He shakes his head. Not very good. Only that day dawns to which we are awake, I say. Thoreau said that. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. It sounds like just a pretty sentiment, but it's really a nanobomb, like Lisa's picture, like a virus, a tiny little bug that can slip in and spread and eventually topple a giant. Or so you'd think, anyway. The fact is that Maya's autoimmune system is quite robust and well able to fend off these pesky little microbes. You heard what Lisa did. She had the photo, and it got damaged, so she got another one and laminated it. That's the one she showed you. She developed a kind of an addiction to it. An unhealthy obsession is what I suppose the shrinks would call it. They'd try to put her in therapy and get her going on some meds. Fortunately, she didn't go to a shrink. I throw some more logs on the fire and rearrange it with a shovel. Sparks shoot up into the night and fade and disappear. No matter how we might try to deny it, death is the fact of life. We can turn away from it, but we can't push it away. It's always with us. Brat was just returning some movies, just another errand. For that woman in Lisa's picture, and thousands of others like her, that was just another day at the office. But what that woman found out was that there is no such thing as just another day. Every day is anything-can-happen day. There is no day or hour or moment so mundane that it cannot play host to death. How's that for a scary story? A few somewhat uncomfortable laughs. The diamond is making its way around. I pick up my water bottle and take a drink. I know this sounds simple, and it is. It's the simplest thing there is. The title of the first chapter of my first book was That Which Cannot Be Simpler. And that's what we always come back to. Simplicity. Burn it all and see what's left. When we do that here in the dream state, what we find out doesn't burn is death. That's what's left when everything else is gone. Death is what survives. I pull the sheet of paper out of my pocket and unfold it. Here's something Emerson wrote. One of the illusions is that the present hour is not the critical, decisive hour. Write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. No man has learned anything rightly until he knows that every day is doomsday. Write it on your heart, I repeat. Every day is the best day of your life. Death gives definition to life. Death awareness is life awareness. Death denial is life denial. Here's something Mozart wrote in a letter to his father. I have formed during the last few years such a close relationship with this best and truest friend of mankind that death's image is not only no longer terrifying to me, but is indeed very soothing and consoling. 
and I thank my God for graciously granting me the opportunity of learning that death is the key which unlocks the door to our true happiness. I put the paper away. What we're talking about here tonight is what you all heard Lisa describe, becoming conscious within the dream state, waking up in life. She didn't talk about her years as an apprentice shaman in the Amazon, or the time she spent researching ancient parchments and the catacombs beneath the Vatican or the Topala. She didn't talk about figuring this out like a puzzle, where you're always scrounging for the next piece. She talked about becoming death-aware, plain and simple. The reason we get bogged down in all the weird and exotic spiritual stuff is to avoid the up-close and personal stuff. We search the most distant places and times because we don't want to deal with the here and now. We eagerly subscribe to arcane, intelligence-insulting belief systems because they are, by their very design, conducive to the sleep state we wish to maintain. Religion and spirituality exist to serve our need for death denial. They serve as lullabies and drown out the ticking of the clock. We spend our lives and our life force running away from this monster we call death. This state of incessant denial takes all our time and energy. That's where our lives go. That's how we spend them. That's what it means to be asleep within the dream. I take a question. And that turns into another question, and we spend the next few minutes getting all this figured out together. I asked them what they thought we were so afraid of, why we were so desperate to deny the reality of our mortality. And they offered some suggestions, and we discussed them, but found them all unsatisfying. No one seemed to feel that we were afraid of the actual state of being dead, or that it was the actual dying part that was so scary. Everyone seemed to agree that death sucked and they didn't like the idea of it. But no one could really say why until a strangely, sagely teenage boy, sitting between his mom and dad, stated the answer like a pronouncement. Futility, he said, like music to my ears. Futility, I echo. No belief is true. Life has no meaning. Nothing we do matters. All is vanity and a striving after wind. We're going to die, and it will be as if we never lived. Everything we think is true is false. All our beliefs are delusions, and everything we know is a lie. There is no such thing as success. Nothing we do can make any possible difference. No matter how fast we go or how far ahead we are, we are not going anywhere. The best and the brightest are in a dead tie with the worst and the dimmest. These are the facts of life. Simple, obvious, plain to behold yet universally unrecognized and unacknowledged. This is what it means to see what's not and not see what is, to be in denial, to be asleep within the dream, to reside in the womb of the unborn. We are madly, desperately, insanely afraid of the truth, and it is that fear that walls us off from our unbounded nature. It is the emotional energy of fear that erects and maintains the egoic shell. Then this sort of death awareness you're talking about, says Shanti. Momentum, um... Memento mori, I interrupt. Remember, you must die. Death awareness. 
Okay, memento mori, she says, but that's not what you did. This wasn't your practice, was it? Yes and no, I say. I began my journey from the very first instant with the knowledge that my life was forfeit. That was a lock, and I was unspeakably happy to make that bargain. My fogged-in little nothing of a life in exchange for clarity? Of course, total no-brainer. There was never the slightest hesitation. Would you trade nothing for everything? By the time you understand the question, you've already answered it. But you're not dead, she says reasonably. The person to whom that happened no longer exists, I say. And what I am now lives in constant death awareness. It is suffused throughout my dream state being the way fear and death denial used to be. Death is always before my eyes. I never hide it or deny it or push it away. Death is the diamond heart of my dream state being. It is the defining feature that shows me the value of everything I see. I let them think about that while I kick at the fire. I turn back to them. I've said this before, I continue. I love the fact of my death. It has made my life possible. There could have been no awakening without it. It's how I know the value of things. It's how I know what beauty is. It's why I am gratitude-based instead of fear-based. It's also how I know child from adult, asleep from awake. It's how I can look at someone and know if death walks before them or behind. I turn it back on them. This isn't about death in the abstract. It's about death in the most personal, intimate sense. Your death. Death is the meaning in the dream. The dream state shadow of no self. Death is the boogeyman. You can't kill him, or hide from him, or get away from him. You can only turn toward him or away from him. If you turn toward him, befriend him, fully embrace him, not superficially, but as your own essential truth, then death is the demon you can ride into every battle the way Brett rode her father demon, the way Lisa rode that photo koan. What do you recommend we do? asks Justin with a touch of sarcasm. Hang out in graveyards? Hell yes, I say. Cemeteries are wonderful places to walk and think. Buy yourself a burial plot and have your lunch there every day. Order your headstone. A glimpse of your own mortality really puts things in perspective. Isn't that what people say? Well, that's what you want to do. See your own mortality. Put things in perspective. There are lots of ways you could raise your awareness. Study photos of people like yourself, now dead. Read books about death and suicide. Carry poison in your pocket and contemplate it often. Walk along high ledges. Lie down on railroad tracks and read poetry. Put a loaded gun in your mouth and cock it. I myself enjoy sitting on the ledges of tall buildings at night looking out over the city and down at the street below, my feet dangling over nothingness. I like walking in thunderstorms where lightning could strike me down at any instant. I guess all this sounds extreme, but I don't see how anything could be too extreme. The idea is right. Put yourself in close proximity to death. Every hour, every day, you want to be taking time to immerse yourself in the mindset of death awareness, of time awareness, of the fact that the clock is 
ticking, that every day is one day less, that every breath you take is one breath less. Measure your life in weeks or months instead of years, and take somber note of their passing. Take time every morning to understand what it means to have a new day. Etch the words, Only that day dawns to which I am awake, into your bathroom mirror. The contemplation of death, of one's own mortality, is a real and powerful meditation. Death awareness is true zazen. It's the universal spiritual practice, the only one anyone ever needs, and the one everyone should perform. So, yes, you'd want to do whatever you have to in order to bring this living awareness into your life. Develop the habit of thinking of death every time you look at a watch or clock, every time you sit down to a meal, every time you go to the bathroom. Take a walk alone every day and think about what it means to be alive, to walk, to see and hear, to breathe. It's not an exercise. It's not something you're trying to make yourself believe like an affirmation. It's something that's real and central to your every thought and act. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? And why the hell aren't you doing it? Chapter 33 To Be or Not to Be Awareness of death is the very bedrock of the entire path. Until you have developed this awareness, all practices are obstructed. His Holiness the Dalai Lama When you start preparing for death, you soon realize that you must look into your life now and come to face the truth of yourself. Death is like a mirror in which the true meaning of life is reflected. Sogyal Rinpoche For those who seek to understand it, death is a highly creative force. The highest spiritual values of life can originate from the thought and study of death. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Without being mindful of death, Whatever Dharma practices you take up will be merely superficial. Miller Rappa For any culture which is primarily concerned with meaning, the study of death, the only certainty that life holds for us, must be central. For an understanding of death is the key to liberation in life. Stanislav Grof I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Henry David Thoreau We say that the hour of death cannot be forecast, but when we say this, we imagine that hour as placed in an obscure and distant future. It never occurs to us that it has any connection with the day already begun, or that death could arrive this same afternoon, this afternoon which is so certain and which has every hour filled in advance. Marcel Proust to fear death, my friends, is only to think ourselves wise without being wise. For it is to think that we know what we do not know. For anything that men can tell, death may be the greatest good that can happen to them. But they fear it as if they knew quite well 
that it was the greatest of evils. And what is this but that shameful ignorance of thinking that we know what we do not know? Socrates It is not the end of the physical body that should worry us. Rather, our concern must be to live while we are alive, to release our inner selves from the spiritual death that comes with living behind a facade designed to conform to external definitions of who and what we are. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Someday I'll be a weather-beaten skull resting on a grass pillow, serenaded by a stray bird or two. Kings and commoners end up the same, no more enduring than last night's dream. Ryokan It's only when we truly know and understand that we have a limited time on earth and that we have no way of knowing when our time is up, we will then begin to live each day to the fullest, as if it was the only one we had. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross I said to life, I would hear death speak, and life raised her voice a little higher and said, You hear him now. Khalil Gibran Death twitches my ear. Live, he says, I am coming. Virgil They tell us that suicide is the greatest piece of cowardice, that suicide is wrong, when it is quite obvious that there is nothing in the world to which every man has a more unassailable title than to his own life and person. Author Schopenhauer Let death be daily before your eyes, and you will never entertain any abject thought, nor too eagerly covet anything. Epictetus The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Ecclesiastes By daily dying I have come to be. Theodore Rothke The world is so exquisite, with so much love and moral depth, that there is no reason to deceive ourselves with pretty stories for which there's little good evidence. Far better, it seems to me, in our vulnerability, is to look death in the eye and be grateful every day for the brief but magnificent opportunity that life provides. Carl Sagan Death is our eternal companion. It is always to our left, an arm's length behind us. Death is the only wise advisor that a warrior has. Whenever he feels that everything is going wrong and he's about to be annihilated, he can turn to his death and ask if that is so. His death will tell him that he is wrong, that nothing really matters outside its touch. His death will tell him I haven't touched you yet. Carlos Castaneda Tell your friends, Look, it's spring, the buds are sweet, the water sparkles, everyone is joyful, we are going to die. Krishna, Mahabharata, Jean-Claude Carrera All men live enveloped in the whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. Herman Melville 
In the last analysis, it is our conception of death which decides our answers to all the questions life puts to us. Dag Hammarskjöld Since the death instinct exists in the heart of everything that lives, since we suffer from trying to repress it, since everything that lives longs for rest, let us unfasten the ties that bind us to life. Let us cultivate our death wish. Let us develop it, water it like a plant. Let it grow unhindered. Suffering and fear are born from the repression of the death wish. Eugene Ionesco There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterward. These are games. One must first answer. Albert Camus Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Mahatma Gandhi Rehearse death. To say this is to tell a person to rehearse his freedom. A person who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. Lucius Aeneas Seneca You want to live, but do you know how to live? You are scared of dying. And tell me, is the kind of life you lead really any different from being dead? Lucius Aeneas Seneca is not philosophy the study of death? Plato Death is an endless night so awful to contemplate that it can make us love life and value it with such passion that it may be the ultimate cause of all joy and all art. Paul Thoreau there is no fundamental difference between the preparation for death and the practice of dying and spiritual practice leading to enlightenment. Stanislav Grof Chapter 34 The Ultimate Taboo Perhaps the whole root of our trouble, the human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all the beauty of our lives will imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood sacrifices, steeples, mosques, races, armies, flags, nations, in order to deny the fact of death, which is the only fact we have. James Baldwin Death is the key to life. Death defines life, gives it shape and meaning and context. Without a clear and honest relationship with our mortality, we live in a state of endless spiritual sprawl, a soupy gray fog that creates the hellish illusion of life stretching endlessly in all directions. We've homogenized our lives by hiding the parts we're afraid of, and in so doing, we've removed all sense of urgency from life. We have taken death out of life, and that allows us to live unconsciously. Death never left, of course. We've just turned away from it, pretended it wasn't there. If we wish to awaken, and that's a mighty big if, then we must welcome death back into our lives. Death is our personal Zen master, our source of power, our path to lucidity. But we have to stop running from it 
in a blind panic. We need only stop and turn around, and there it is, inches away, staring at us with unblinking gaze, finger poised every second of our lives. That finger is the one true thing in the dream state, and it will, for a fact, come down. Death awareness is the universal spiritual practice. What we have sought in books and magazines, in teachers and teachings, in ancient cultures and foreign lands, has been breathing down our neck the entire time. It's not just another mood-making spiritual technique that you dabble with for a few weeks and blame yourself when it doesn't deliver. Death always delivers. Death is your only true friend, the only friend that will never abandon you and that no one can take away. It slices through every lie, ridicules every belief, mocks every vanity, and reduces ego to absurdity. He's sitting with you right now. If you want to know something, ask him. Death doesn't lie. The inverse of death awareness is equally important, I continue, seeing both interest and wariness in their firelit faces. Learn to practice death denial awareness. Any time you find yourself sitting on the couch, watching TV, shopping in a mall, or trying to find amusement in some pointless book or idle pastime, Remind yourself that this is exactly the habit you want to break. Try to catch yourself in all the situations throughout the day when you are not awake, not aware, going through the motions of your life in a virtually somnambulistic state. Remind yourself constantly, this moment, right now, I am in the dream state. This is the mindlessness I am addicted to like a drug. I am an opium addict living in an opium dream. This is the coma, this slow oozing of my life down the drain. Right now, my life is slipping away. I grab my water bottle and take a long drink. Another powerful thing about the practice and cultivation of death awareness is that it provides an accurate barometer of your own spiritual sincerity, though you may not want one. Anyone can go sour on mainstream religion and adopt a less orthodox belief system to replace it. But how many people are really sincere in their spiritual aspirations? Probably all of you think you are, but are you really? Are you willing to go wherever this leads, to do whatever it takes? Thousands talk the talk for one who walks the walk. The practice of death awareness separates the walkers from the talkers. We can use this as a spiritual self-diagnostic to determine, once and for all, if spirituality is something we're serious about or if we're just tourists. Most of us are tourists, but which of us are sincere and which are dabblers? If you want to answer this question for yourself, here's your chance. Your relationship to your own mortality tells the tale. Everyone is either facing toward it or turned away from it. It's that simple. Toward or away. If you can't face the most fundamental fact of your own existence, what can you face? This is ground floor, entry level awakening. It doesn't get any closer or simpler than this. If, based on this discussion, your life does not undergo major restructuring over the next few months, then you have your answer. You're a tourist with no real desire or intent to wake up. What you do with that knowledge is up to you. Maybe you don't want to know the answer to this question, but if you don't want to know, 
then you know. I pace back and forth in front of the fire and wonder what Brett would think about what we're doing and saying here tonight. I think she'd be pretty amused by the whole thing. It's not easy to practice death awareness, but you can do it, because it's true. You're going to die. Vigilance is the key. We don't need one wake-up call in life. We need hundreds of wake-up calls every day, more and more, until we actually break the surface and come awake. It takes thought, desire, willful intent. The odds are heavily against you. I doubt even one of you will break this addiction. The sleep state is too comfortable, too hard to rip yourself out of. It's like swimming upward through a mile of mud. You just have to keep at it, keep going, constantly reminding yourself of what you're doing and why. Because as soon as you stop, you start to sink again. And the next thing you know, you'll be sitting in a nursing home, thinking back to that long-ago night when some crackpot stood in front of the dancing flames and shooting sparks and told you not to let it slip away. But you did, and now it's too late. There's a long stretch of silence while I mess with the fire. Are you talking about dying well? Like how we should meet death when it comes? Asks a woman in jeans and boots and a sheepskin vest. Something like that? Absolutely not, I reply, eager to make this distinction. The point is not to die well. The point is to live well. Who cares how you die? Die bravely or crying like a baby. Who cares? Death awareness is about life awareness, and life awareness is all about waking up. It really has nothing to do with dying. It seems like a very negative, pessimistic way to live, she says. My experience is just the opposite, I reply. Nothing really bothers me. Nothing gets me down. If I lost everything in some tragedy tomorrow, so what? I'm still alive, still here in the fun house. Who cares about the rest? It's all good. Where's the pessimism in that? Nothing gets you down? Well, that's too broad a statement, I reply. Life could certainly take a downturn I wouldn't wish to endure. The time might come when I would want to grab the bastard's bony finger and give myself the tap. Someone actually gasps. You're not talking about suicide, are you? asks the woman who looks like a rancher. Is that what you're saying we should think about? I'm not saying what anybody should do, but I'm saying that suicide would be a damn silly thing not to think about. If you can't even consider the topic of ending your life, then whose life is it? Suicide is one of the very few options we might actually have. It means we're not necessarily at death's mercy. It's scary enough to make you sick, but that's no reason not to think about it. Most people treat suicide as the ultimate taboo, as if it's not even on the table. But it is on the table. It's the centerpiece. And there's no reason not to give it the respect it deserves. You can still rule it out, I suppose. But at least it would be you ruling it out instead of having it ruled out for you. Some of them look a little shocked by this. Maybe all this sounds morbid or depressing to you. Maybe you think death is the opposite of life or that all this death awareness stuff translates into the end of happiness and good times. But this is not the case. Death isn't morbid. Fear is morbid. Death doesn't oppose life. Fear opposes life. To close your eyes to death is to close them to life. 
What could be more morbid than that? From your perspective, death and suicide are horrific and unthinkable. From my perspective, they are empowering and life-affirming. And I would look at any person that doesn't have an open, honest relationship with these subjects as themselves nine parts dead. It's clear that for most or all of them, this is a distinctly taboo subject, a roped-off area into which their thoughts seldom wander. They equate suicide with misery and failure and cowardice, the act of moody teenagers and the weak and the ill. They view self-termination as an absolutely, positively last resort, and maybe not even then, whereas I, an eyes open being, might view it as a third or fourth resort. I don't think I'd stick my head in the oven to get out of a speeding ticket, but I might do it to get out of a wheelchair, or a year in jail, or a bad case of the hiccups. It wouldn't, however, be based on a decision so much as an observation. Things come into a certain alignment. Patterns emerge. Rightness is perceived. And the clearly indicated course is followed. I've never not done something once I saw that it was the thing to do. And that includes much harder things than suicide. Despite not being a Bushido warrior kind of guy, I do have a clear and abiding awareness that today is a perfectly good day to die. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. If this seems like a light treatment of a heavy subject, it's because, from the integrated perspective, it's not so dark and dreary. There's no evil stink to death when it's out in the open where we can see it and hold it steadily in our sight. This is what it means to befriend death, to embrace it, that we acknowledge its importance in our lives. Not that we get to like it or look forward to it or develop some creepy resonance with it. The primary benefit of this honest relationship is the way in which it throws life open to us. But also important is the way it de-horrifies the specter of death. We're not talking about the commission of the act, but only the honest contemplation of it. The question of suicide, to be or not to be, is at the very heart of philosophical inquiry. But Maya has rendered it virtually unthinkable with a logjam of highly charged counterbeliefs. We have no right to terminate our own lives because life is sacred. It's an unpardonable sin and an abomination against God. It's a cowardly act and a cheat. Whatever life lessons we escape now, we'll just have to experience in the next life. And so on. Rather than being unthinkable, however, suicide should be supremely thinkable. It is the thing that most needs thinking about. At the very least, we would want to break the logjam and make some decisions about it for ourselves. If we want to have some fun with spiritual autolysis, begin with the question, why shouldn't I kill myself right now? When all is said and done, I summarize for the group, all this talk of demons and boogeymen is just a way to slap ourselves into stark, raving sanity, to sober ourselves up from the intoxicating effects of belief and wrong-knowing. The point is that wakeful lucidity is something we're all perfectly capable of achieving. If anything, it's seeing what's not, and not seeing what is that's so amazing. All we're talking about now is a way to stop performing this miraculous feat of self-deception, so we can see things as they really are. 
Spiritual autolysis focuses the mind, and memento mori gives it a known point to focus on. In combination with a sincere desire, they can set anyone on the road out of the segregated state of human childhood. So, if you want it, here it is. The only question is, do you want it? I've already decided I'm never going to die, jokes a young guy, but no one laughs. Get real, I almost reply, and I realize that this admonition is at the very heart of this whole crazy business. I could have just said that in the first place and saved myself the trouble of writing three books. That's what it all comes down to. Get Real. Chapter 35. That which cannot be simpler. Men fear thought more than they fear anything else on earth. More than ruin. More even than death. Thought is subversive and revolutionary. Destructive and terrible. Thought is merciless to privilege established institutions and comfortable habits. Thought is anarchic and lawless, indifferent to authority, careless of the well-tried wisdom of the ages. Thought looks into the pit of hell and is not afraid. It sees man, a feeble speck, surrounded by unfathomable depths of silence, yet bears itself proudly, as unmoved as if it were lord of the universe. Thought is great and swift and free, the light of the world and the chief glory of man. But if thought is to become the possession of the many, not the privilege of the few, we must have done with fear. It is fear that holds men back, fear lest their cherished beliefs should prove delusions, fear lest the institutions by which they live should prove harmful, fear lest they themselves should prove less worthy of respect than they have supposed themselves to be. Bertrand Russell We're all just killing time in death's waiting room, Distracting ourselves with some book or magazine, puzzle or game, waiting to be called and pretending we're not. We are, most of us, oblivious to where we are and what's going on, oblivious by the maternal grace and savage cunning of Maya. Every minute that we are unaware of our situation, of where we are and what's going on, is a minute of unconsciousness, a minute when we are asleep and dreaming of a life in a different place with different rules. Virtually everyone dwells in this imaginary state virtually all of the time. Whatever game we play, whatever diversion we occupy ourselves with, we are comforted to think that it leads somewhere moves us toward some desired goal, that there is meaning in it, but meaning is just a figment of the dream state, where everything is real, but nothing is true. The dream state is an absurd fiction, and to dwell within it we must, despite being possessed of reason, be able to maintain a healthy level of absurdity. This is the vital function that belief systems play in our lives. Beliefs provide us with the emotional ballast, the artificial gravity. We need to stay earthbound. But by cutting away the ballast of ignorance, wrong knowing, we can ascend to an altitude where we see the forest and not the trees, where the threads disappear and the tapestry is revealed, 
and where a universe previously thought to be composed of innumerable separate parts can be seen as one undifferentiated ocean of being. Wrong knowing is the egoic regulator that governs this rise and descent. As soon as we think we know something, that wrong knowledge acts to restrict our natural upward tendency. When we relinquish the illusion of knowledge, as right knowing suffuses our being throughout and displaces wrong knowing, then we come to reside at the loftiest of dreamscape altitudes. By transcending opposites, we awaken from the dream of many parts into the reality of the unified whole. Once seen, this vision of unity cannot be unseen. Thought, as a way of navigating through life, is rendered obsolete and is replaced by an immeasurably superior way, a direct knowing free of intermediary processes. From this integrated perspective, everything we once called dark or false or evil is unmistakably known to be of equal worth and importance as the things we once called light or true or good. Balance and wholeness are restored, and we are born to our rightful selves. That's what it is to be fully lucid within the dream state. That's what I tell the group. So there is knowledge, says Ronald, trying to trip me up. Not that I know of, I say, and everyone laughs. Scoop a jar of water out of the ocean and put a lid on it, I tell them. Study it in its segregated state. Where is the ocean in that jar? Where are the tides and the currents? Pour it back into the ocean, and it returns to its integrated state. The temporary entity no longer exists. Entity? Ronald asks. By scooping it into a jar, you've created a new entity, a sub-ocean. It's not possible to subdivide infinity, of course, but try telling that to your new entity. It has all the properties of the ocean from which you scooped it, in no way greater or lesser than any other sampling you might take, yet it bears little resemblance to its authentic oceanhood. It has an independent existence, yet as soon as you pour it back, it merges seamlessly back into the integrated whole. Where is that particular sub-ocean entity after you pour it back in? The same place it was before, everywhere and nowhere. It didn't exist before you scooped it up, but you didn't create it. It doesn't exist after you pour it back, but you didn't destroy it. So what was born when you segregated that jar full? What died when you reintegrated? I don't know where all this is coming from, but I'm enjoying it, and I seem to have more. Our perception of time makes some things look permanent and other things look temporary. But in this dynamic ocean of being, everything is constantly swirling in and out of existence, just like that jar of water, just like anything you can think of, a mosquito, a mountain, a galaxy, a man, all fluid, all forming and unforming. A spark is born and dies in a split second, while the sun seems to last forever. But if your time perception shifted in one direction, that spark might seem to last forever, like the sun. Shift the other way, and you could watch the sun flicker in and out of being like a spark. Which is correct? Both? Neither? You can make the same statement about Spatial perception. Shift one way, and the sun is the size of a spark. Go the other way, and the spark seems to fill the universe. 
I wasn't here a hundred years ago, and I won't be here a hundred years from now. I'm just flickering in and out of being. I was scooped up, and I'll soon be poured back. So what's the truth of me? No one answers. Who am I? That is the question. If you want to know, find out. Use death awareness with spiritual autolysis. Think as hard as you possibly can. Dare to be a fool. Unchain yourself from respectability. Take an oath. Declare war. I pace. Drink some water. Let them maul. Burn it all, I say. Burn everything. This is the answer to the question you're asking by coming here. That's what all this awakening stuff is about. That's what real Zen is about. Nuke your life. What gets destroyed was never yours in the first place. That hangs in the air for a few moments before anyone speaks. What does that actually mean? asks Nicole a bit timidly. Where does that level of energy come from? From you, I reply. It's your energy, the same energy you have now. But instead of spewing it outward in all directions, dumping it out as fast as you can, you harness it, focus it, bring it to bear on a single target. Yes, she says, but how? That's a good question. And prayer and spiritual autolysis and memento mori are my answers. You have to start by bringing yourself into focus. Nothing can happen before that, and no one else can do it for you. The fact is that no matter how you cut it, no matter what you believe, all you have is this tiny moment of being sandwiched between two eternities of non-being. If not now, when? Several hands go up. They want to assert their afterlife preferences, the broader than readily apparent dimensions of the dreamscape. But no talk of egoic immortality can survive two minutes of honest scrutiny. And I don't want to let Brett's farewell devolve into protestations of belief. So I press on. All you have is this moment of dream state being, which can slam shut at any moment. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Once you come to deeply appreciate that question, your life goes into a kind of cascade meltdown. Everything in your life gets dropped, except your life itself. Then the game is on, and all this stuff starts making sense. That's when you find out what it really means to think and why most people never do. That's when you begin to see what it means to be asleep and that virtually everyone is. That's when you begin to see what it means to say that people are all children and insane children at that. That's when you begin to see that all emotions are energetic attachments and that they all stem from fear. That's when you begin to see Maya and understand who and what she is and where she dwells and how she works. That's when you begin to see that nothing is wrong, that wrongness isn't possible, and that the wrongest thing you can think of is no less right than the rightest thing you can think of. That's when all these seemingly contradictory statements stop being paradoxical concepts and start being the most simple and obvious of observations. And that's when you're going to want to be able to focus yourself like a laser. And that requires processes like spiritual autolysis or memento mori. That's what it takes to succeed in an enterprise where failure 
and mediocrity are so celebrated that no one remembers what success looks like. I turn to watch the fire and take a drink. I turn back. No one's saying this stuff is easy, I continue. Actual progress is never easy. You heard Lisa, three years of suffering to get her eyes open, and they're still not really adjusted to her new environment. It tore her life all to hell, and she's just getting started. She didn't make pretty sand mandalas and sweep them away to remind herself of her impermanence. She didn't try to figure out what her face looked like before she was born. Maybe she didn't do anything more than lower her defenses a little at a time over the course of three years, like a slow dying. But fast or slow, that's what it is, a dying and what does all that amount to? What do you get for all that suffering and disillusionment? I pause to let them think about it. Salvation? Liberation? Nirvana? No. It just gets you back to square one. It gets you back to the point where you went vertical instead of horizontal. Where you burrowed in at the age of ten or twelve. It gets you out of the hole you've spent your life digging yourself into so you can finally start your life. You're not even talking about taking a spiritual journey at this point. We're talking about undoing the unspiritual journey. We spend our lives burrowing down into our own graves, like that's a clever place to hide from death. This is about climbing out of our graves and living our lives and discovering who and where we are and what we are a part of. And you can't do that from the bottom of a hole. You say that nothing is real, says Shanti a little later. How can nothing be real? It doesn't make sense. I don't know, I say. I have no knowledge on the subject. It's the dream state. There is nothing else to be said about it. But that's so, she searches for the word, so unsatisfying. That's a matter of perspective, I reply. It's not that it's unsatisfying. It's that you're unsatisfied. I am lucid within the dream state, and I don't find it unsatisfying at all. I have no questions. No complaints, no unresolved issues. I am perfectly satisfied. Everything is quite to my liking. I wouldn't change a thing. Aren't you even interested? In what? In the fact that there's nothing to be interested in? What can you say about a dream? Do you find it unsatisfying that your nighttime dreams lack substance and solidity? That they pop like bubbles when you wake up? No, she says. Of course not. Well, this is the same thing, I say to Shanti, but for everyone. The only difference is that you don't know it. But you could. It's there to be known, to be seen. There is no mystery. Nothing is hidden, only unseen. These metaphors and allegories and parables we use are very powerful tools of understanding. If you wish to make any progress, you should try to trust them more, test them to see how far they'll bend before they break. Use the spiritual autolysis to attack them. Some are stronger than others, of course, but understanding consensual reality as a dream state is unbreakable. Life is but a dream. Reality has no basis in reality. With eyes closed, you find it dissatisfying. With eyes open, I find it delightful, magical, absurd, interactive, challenging, mysterious, playful, and brief. You want answers, but there are no answers. Just beliefs, 
and if you want to awaken, either within or from the dream state, beliefs are not your friends. They only hold you back. Demanding answers and explanations is an egoic stall tactic. You can just stop making these egoic demands and relax into this thing you're a part of. Trust. Surrender. Release. You don't hear it, but there's a clock, and it's ticking, and you don't know how many ticks you have left. Listen for it. The game is on, whether you're playing or not. I return to addressing the group. I'm not some great rocket surgeon. I'm just a guy who got serious about figuring things out. Same with Brett. There's nothing I could tell you that you couldn't figure out for yourselves. There's nothing I see that you couldn't see for yourselves. I'm like Socrates. All I know is that I know nothing. That's like the subtext of the cogito. Together they form the alpha and omega of all knowledge. I know that I am, and I know that I know nothing else. That's an easy thing to say, but it's a hell of a thing to know. A casual sort of dialogue continues for a few minutes before my disposable cell phone vibrates in my pocket, informing me that Lisa and Melissa are on their way down to join us. I walk out onto the small pier and give the little phone a toss and watch it splash and disappear. That signal was the last thing I needed it for, and I am happy to be rid of it. As I watch the widening ripples, I am reminded of a long-ago night, much like this one, when I stood on a similar pier, looking out at black water, and threw something away. It was back at the beginning of my awakening process, and the thing I was throwing away was a family heirloom which had been passed down to me and which, it was expected, I would pass down to my own son some day. It was a watch, old and expensive, a family treasure, and throwing it away forever was just a hell of a thing to do. I haven't thought about that watch or that night in years, and I feel a rush of gratitude and camaraderie and sympathy for that full, crazed young man that I was. So, I got to have my little moment of sentimental bullshit after all. I walk back to the group. I have them all get up and move their chairs away and come stand in a semicircle around me and the fire. I place one of the chairs by the fire and stand up on it. One of the things we're here to do tonight is to say goodbye to Brett, I say. Brett wasn't just anybody. We don't want to dishonor her memory with the trite platitudes that would serve others so well, and this raises an important question. What can we say about Brett, about her life? I won't stand up here and say things like her life had meaning or that she's gone to some better place. She'd kick my ass if she heard me talking like that, and rightly so. All laugh. She played a good game. That's something we can say of her. She was honest in a way that is all but unknown in the world. And we can say that. She had the courage to face facts. That's pretty rare. They're silent and duly somber. My first idea for tonight was to bring Brett's skull for us to hold and pass around, maybe set it up on a table next to a picture of her smiling. That makes for a pretty thought-provoking tableau, the juxtaposition of the same toothy grin in life and in death. But it turns out that it's not that easy to get your hands on someone's skull. And anyway, Brett had already been cremated, 
It was suggested that we could have an urn down here with her ashes, and scatter them over the water of this lake while I said some meaningless crap about how she was born here. But I think that's pretty cheesy, and I think Brett would have agreed. So, I asked the universe what to do, and the answer was made immediately and unmistakably known to me. Does anybody know what you get when you compress a carbon-based being? Like, a lot? Some are quick to say no, and ask what you get, but it was rhetorical. Over the course of a minute, while I step down off the chair and take a drink and tend the fire, the answer gets figured out and spreads through the group. When I return to my chair and look at their faces in the dancing firelight, I see that they think they know, but they don't believe it. Who's got her? I ask, searching among them. Who's got the little box with bread in it? You can cremate a person, clean up their ashes a bit, and smoosh them into a diamond. There are companies with labs that do this. When we did this for Brett, it was not a well-known procedure. Of all of Brett's students, only a few had ever heard of it, and none had ever seen the results. Maybe in the future this will catch on, and everyone will wear their lost loved ones around their neck or on a finger. But when we did it for Brett, it was practically unheard of. It was a pretty expensive and complicated process, but the universe supported it from all angles, and Lisa and Nicole cooperated to make it happen, with the result that the large, colorless, handsomely boxed diamond was waiting for us in a hotel safe in Virginia with not a day to spare. I underwrote the project at the beginning, but much of the cost was recouped from the group and Dr. Kim, and a few other sources, and the whole thing came off without any surprises, all the way up until the end. There were no surprises from Brett's daughter. Melissa knew about this from the start. She fully approved of the plan, and was directly involved at several points along the way. As soon as Lisa and I arrived today, we brought Melissa the diamond to let her spend some private time with it. There was never any thought of surprising her with it. What was surprising was the group's reaction. When they realized that the diamond they had been admiring was actually the remains of their dead teacher, they didn't exactly break into wild applause. I don't know what I was expecting, but what I got was a whole lot of heavy silence. It took half an hour to explain the diamond process to everyone and to let the box be passed around again so everyone could study it in the light of their new knowledge about it. This time they took the diamond out of the box. They wanted to touch it, to hold it in their hands and think about what it was and what they themselves were because these are the things we have to think about when we confront death and the dead and the remains of the dead. This was the desired effect I had in mind when I first thought of using Brett's skull for the show-and-tell, and later when the diamond solution made itself known. What I hadn't realized was that the effect would be so moving it took another half an hour for them to process it enough for us to continue. Some were disturbed, some cried, some gathered into small groups to try to express their feelings amongst themselves. It was a full hour before shock wore off and people were settled and comfortable again. The diamond is a pretty lie, and the group is eager to believe they see meaning and beauty in the diamond. They see essence, a glimpse of truth, or some vague promise of immortality. They see all sorts of things, 
that aren't there, that are being projected onto the little stone by the filters through which they view it. Not to be a heartless bastard, but I looked at the diamond as only significant insofar as it was completely insignificant. Its very nothingness was what I found beautiful about it. I held it up and let it swing from its gold chain and contemplated it. This was a person who walked among us. She was here, in this place. We saw her. We listened to her. She was like us. And now this is what she is, this silly little rock. Brett, the rancher, woman, survivor, teacher, daughter, mother, grandmother, now just a gaudy trinket. Brad is not dead. There is no Brett entity to possess the status of deadness. There is simply no such thing as Brett. She's not dead. She's just nothing. In truth, she's no more or less now than she ever was, than anyone ever is. She was a face in a cloud that formed for a moment and was gone. That's all anyone or anything really is, and we can take comfort in that, not because it's comfortable, but because it's true. The next part of the evening was for Lisa and Nicole to handle. They retrieved the diamond and the box and got everyone seated and quiet. They brought Melissa to the front and said some very nice things about Brett that got everyone sufficiently weepy, and then they presented the diamond to Melissa. They did good. Melissa did good, too. She accepted the small box and studied it in silence for a long, emotional moment. Then Melissa thanked everyone and talked a little bit about her mother and how she didn't know the Brett that we all knew, but that she wished she had. Mom's favorite movie was Harold and Maud, she said, so I thought I should maybe come here tonight and accept this diamond and take it straight out onto that pier and throw it in the water, like Maud did with the ring Harold gave her, and I'd say, so I'll always know where it is, like Maud said. I thought that might be the right thing to do. But as I thought about it some more, I realized that I really don't understand it. I don't understand why Maud threw Harold's gift away like that. So if I did that now, it would be fake, like just for show. So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to try to understand my mother the way you all knew her. And if I can ever do that, then maybe I'll understand why Maud threw that ring away. And maybe then I'll come down here, even if I'm an old lady, and throw the diamond in the water and tell my mom, so I'll always know where you are, and I'll know what that means. I think it will mean that I honored her and tried to understand her and didn't just throw her away to make it look like I understood something when I didn't, or like I just wanted to get rid of her. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I hope it makes some sense to all of you. Thank you for this gift and for coming here and for knowing my mother in a way I didn't. Lisa and I walk Melissa back up to the house and say good night. We say our goodbyes and take our leave. Lisa starts back toward the path to the lake. I walk toward the rental car. What are you doing? she asks. Time to go, I say. Go? But everyone has more questions. You've got them all excited. They're all standing up and talking and waiting for you to come back. They have a lot of things they want to ask you. I stop and turn toward her. Like what? I ask her. 
What might be an example of a valid question they might ask? Why ask me? I don't know. Knowing what you do, what information are they lacking to make the journey out of denial into awareness? What answer do you or I have that they need to hear? She looks confused. I don't know, she repeats. It's time for you to stop saying that. Her look turns hard. She gets quiet when challenged, which makes my job harder, which means I have to speak harder. Our relationship is almost over, yours and mine, I tell her. A few hours on the road, and that's it. Her look softens. But we can still... Can we? You've been sitting at that desk with me all summer. Have you seen me talk on a phone or correspond with anyone by email? You've seen the mail that gets forwarded. Have you seen me answer any of it? No, but... Any sign of family, friends, people in my life? No. Do you think I was hiding that part of my life from you? No, I guess not, but I'm not a life coach or a guru or a surrogate parent. I don't have human relationships. Every man is an island, entire of itself. If my dog was a boy, I would have named her Wilson. I know where I am. But I thought... I'd be doing you a disservice by staying available to you. Same with those people down at the lake. It's a solo thing. If a drowning person grabs on to me, I do them the kindness of kicking them in the face. She seems saddened. You're an orphan, I tell her. Even if your parents were still alive, that's what you are. That's something you have to get used to. If you write me a letter in a few years, I'll be eager to read it. I hope it will say you understood what I'm telling you right now, that you went on to develop into a mature and still developing human adult, and that you're raising your children that way, too. That's what I hope it will say. What else would it say? She asks with humorless eyes. Dear Jed, I'm much better after my little breakdown. I'm practicing law again, and the kids are doing well in school, and I might be getting back together with Dennis. I've taken up golf, and I'm active in local charities. No big hair and fat ass and corpus Christi. Ha <laughs> ha! Thank you for helping me through that difficult time. Love, Lisa. She looks like I slapped her. Is that what you think? I shrug. It's up to you. Even now, after all you've been through, you have yet to open your eyes, to take your first steps, to acknowledge this new and different world you're in. You think this process is behind you, but you're still very much in it. This is your slap on the ass. Abraze los ojos, abogada. Jesus Christ, she shakes her head sadly. Such a beautiful night. It certainly is. I agree. It's the most beautiful night in the world. So what are we doing? There's only awareness and denial toward and away, progress and entrenchment. Those people down at the lake will either undergo the same transition you underwent or they'll stay down in their holes. They don't need information. They need suicidal discontent. What answer do you or I have that those people need to hear? I'm asking you now. You're in charge. What do you want to do? She holds my gaze for another long moment, then nods. Let's go, she says. 
This is my bottom line advice on the subject of spiritual awakening, whether in or from the dream state. Face the facts. Face death. Face your own mortality, your own meaninglessness. This applies to everyone, everywhere. I touched upon the subject of death awareness and damnedest, but what I thought back then was that I was writing for a sophisticated audience, people too spiritually savvy to need so simple a lesson. I've since discovered that those who seem the most spiritually sophisticated are the most deeply entrenched and the least likely to subject themselves to the rigors of the true spiritual journey. Having gone so far the wrong way, they are the least disposed to turn around and undo all their anti-progress. Now I see that death denial, the fear of no self, is at the very heart of the paralysis that grips virtually all spiritual aspirants, and everyone else as well. Death denial, in all its many forms, is the whole at the bottom of which we sit huddled and trembling, scared to death, of our own lives. Death awareness is the act of coming out of that hole and beholding the world in which we live and the creation of which we are a part. I've said many times that all people around the world and throughout history look like mere children from the perspective of one who has taken even a single step, and this is that step. To venture out of that hole to declare freedom from childish beliefs, to turn toward death, to look the unslayable arch-demons of futility and insignificance in the eye. This is where the journey begins, and no journey begins elsewhere. Everything else we do is about staying dumb and killing time and digging ourselves deeper in. What would I do if I were in that group listening to me and Lisa tonight? Impossible to say, of course, but in an idealized sense, I can say that I'd go home and draw a line. I might start by rounding up every piece of spiritual detritus and debris I'd accumulated over the years, every book and magazine, every piece of clothing and jewelry, every little statue and knick-knack and totem and fetish. And I'd make a pile and pour gas on it and watch it burn and get naked and howl at the moon and make wild warlike vows with the stars and the moon as my witness. A big dumb gesture? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what drawing a line has to be. You have to send a, a powerful signal, even if it's only to yourself. No one goes into this sane and level-headed. Or maybe I'd go the other way. Maybe I'd say that I like my life and my approach to spirituality just the way they are. I want to be happy and live a nice life. Thanks for that crazy death rant, Jed, but I want a life-enhancing spirituality, not all this whacked-out death and war business. I like my books and my meditation practice, and I don't see where it makes any sense to burn a house down if all it needs is a fresh coat of paint. After all, no matter how you play it, it's just a fucking game. Passage, immediate passage, the blood burns in my veins. Away, O oh soul, hoist instantly the anchor, cut the hawsers, haul out, shake out every sail. Have we not stood here like trees in the ground long enough? Have we not groveled here long enough, eating and drinking like mere brutes? Have we not darkened and dazed ourselves with books long enough? Sail forth, steer for the deep waters only. 
reckless, O soul, exploring, I with thee and thou with me. For we are bound where Mariner has not yet dared to go. And we will risk the ship, ourselves, and all. O oh, my brave soul, O oh, farther, farther sail, a daring joy, but safe. Are they not all the seas of God? O oh, farther, farther, farther sail. Walt Whitman Epilogue How did it get so late so soon? It's night before it's afternoon. December is here before it's June. My goodness, how the time has flown. How did it get so late so soon? Dr. Seuss Deeply relaxed, and in a death-friendly state of mind, I sit in a magic chair and glide effortlessly through the moonlight night a few feet above the surface of a quiet planet. The Kyrie of Beethoven's Missa Solemnis fills my space like warm gold as the Virginia countryside streams by. It's a chilly night, but I am warm in my magic chair. The sights and sounds create and define my awareness. There is no past, no future. Hills and fields and trees make room for a small town, a village of humans on a planet called Earth. The town is asleep, and we ease through and back out into the rolling countryside. A car appears, its headlights approaching like the headlights that approached Brett in her last seconds. If these lights cross the line, then I'm ready, and I hope Brett was too. I hope she had a last few moments like these, time to reflect on a life well lived, a role fulfilled, a game well played. I hope she had the second and a half it would have taken her to say goodbye and thank you. Especially thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the time of my life. There are two emotions that inform and animate the human animal. Fear and a gratitude-love-awe mix that might best be called agape. As fear goes out, agape comes in. More accurately, a pure white light of consciousness hits the prism of self and splits outward to become the universe as we experience it. If the prism of self is gray and murky with ignorance, choked with fear, contaminated with ego, then so becomes the universe that radiates out from it. It's that simple. As the prism becomes free of such flaws, then the whole universe changes with it. It resolves into clarity, becomes brighter, more playful and magical. Because we are the lens through which it is projected, we are participants in its shape and motion, co-creators of our own universe. That's human adulthood. Spiritual enlightenment is just the same, except you take the final step in purifying the prism of self. You remove it. The approaching car stays in its lane and passes and is gone. I have a life, and I have lived it. I have done my best. I played my part. I read my lines and picked up my cues and hit my marks. I was born a child, and I became an adult. And then I went further, as far as there is to go. 
all the way to a weird and empty place called Dunn. I have written books that say the things I wanted to know back then. That's how the books and the dialogues seem to me, like it's all been one long conversation with the pre-awakened me, the one who had to go and went and is gone. That's what this book and the first two really are. What are such books worth? Whatever they're worth to the reader, I suppose. If someone had approached me back when all this began and offered me these books, I would have paid an arm and a leg for them, literally and without hesitation. Seriously? All you want is an arm and a leg? What's the catch? Missing limbs I could have lived with. Continued life as a lie. I couldn't. It seems like a million years ago when I stood on the end of a pier and threw my ridiculously valuable watch away, just like Melissa almost did tonight with her mom's tightly compacted remains. I could have done much smarter things with that watch, but it weighed too much, so I threw it from the end of a pier. A big, stupid gesture, yes, but it was a time of big, Stupid gestures. I'm happy now for those times that I was smart enough to be so stupid. When you're actually doing it, when you're actually standing there on the end of a pier preparing to throw a family treasure away forever, and you know you're being dumb, and that the only way it isn't dumb and horribly traitorous is if the follow-through is there. If you go all the way, if you really do what you're trying to do, then blood treason and a few ounces of metal are a small price to pay. Otherwise, it's just a hollow, foolish, and unforgivable gesture. And the thing is, as you're doing it, as you're taking that watch that was given to you in trust and with meaning, and you throw it into black water. Only the fool part of the equation is visible. You can only see the dumb. But you got to go ahead and do it, because the watch is too heavy for anything else, and you know that if you don't sink it, it's damn well going to sink you. This magic chair, this nighttime planet, this music, these hands, they're not mine. I can't keep them, but I have them now. Right now, they are with me. They are mine, but only for a moment. And the lesson of the moment is that moments cannot be seized. There is no now. There is only the intersection of past and future, both of which possess the curious charm of not existing. I think of my first friend in this life. She was, I shit thee not, an elephant. We were little kids together. I knew her name and she knew mine. I could explain that, but I don't think I will. She's still alive and I know where she is. Maybe I'll go see her. Probably not. I think of a time and again, I shit thee not, I was racing a luxury sports car along Route 666 at twilight when I came over a rise big air fast and had to call on all and sundry gods to avoid crashing into an emaciated white longhorn steer standing nonchalantly across the road. I busted up the car's front end and found myself stuck all night in I shit thee not again, an Indian burial ground, on Route 666. When I looked for the unlikely animal, it was, though there was nowhere for it to go, gone. I was young, and that was a strangely dark and cold and long night. Or maybe I dreamed it. 
The watch, my elephant friend, that long night on Route 666, maybe this is my life passing before my eyes, makes me wonder about the next set of approaching headlights. Or maybe it's just that tonight gets added to that list, saying goodbye to someone so like myself, delivering my first and last eulogy, the haunting, otherworldly beauty of this drive, bringing the curtain down on a big part of my own life as well, the teaching and speaking and writing thing is done now. And then, there it is. Click. I am done. My work is done. This whole author-teacher gig is over. It started out twenty years ago when a diamond-tipped arrow caught me square between the eyes. It became one thing, then something else, then another thing, and now it's over. I have completed my life, fulfilled my purpose, done my bit. If I haven't mentioned before that enlightenment is pointless, I apologize. I meant to. Enlightenment is pointless. In the infinite, eternal, nothing of no self. There are no points. The context that writing and teaching has given my life is over. All that's left for me now is to retire to my new home and play with my new friend, Maya. A boy and his dog. The Missa Solemnus drives through my heart like a stake. The moon is high and full and casts a surreal glow on the glistening landscape. I release all thoughts and memories and settle into the moment, immersed in beauty enough to stop a war. To outlive this moment seems a sacrilege. I look over at Lisa, wondering if she knows where we are. Tears are streaming down her smiling face as she pilots us through the eternally brief night. She knows where we are. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Shakespeare